Good morning. This is a courtesy announcement that this meeting is now broadcast live on YouTube and our web portal. Good morning, James. Would you like to do a mic check? Good morning. Good morning. I hear you loud and clear. Thank you. Good morning, President Wasserman. Good morning, Nancy. How Good are you? morning. I'm doing well. Thank you. I'm filling in for Rhonda today, who is taking a much and well-deserved break. Wonderful. And then will you be clerking us as well? Your clerk today will be Jess Jamison. You said it'll be Jess? Yes. Thank yes. you very much. Good morning. Oh, there's Jess. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Supervisor Allenberg. How are you today? Good morning, Nancy. I'm good, thanks. How are you? Good, thank you. Have a good meeting. Thank you. Good morning, Deborah. Would you like to do a mic check? Good morning. How are you? I'm doing well, thank you. I hear you loud and clear. Thank you. Have a good meeting. Good morning, Supervisor Simidian. Would you like to do a mic check? Yes. I hear you loud and clear. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Wasserman at this point, we're just waiting for Supervisor Chavez and then they'll all be here. Thank you very much, and there she and is. Recording she is. in progress. Wonderful, thank you everybody for being on time. Welcome everybody to this virtual meeting. Uh, with that said, I'm gonna call this meeting to order and ask Jess for a roll call please to establish the presence of a quorum. Supervisor Lee. Good morning, Lee present. Supervisor Chavitz. Here. Supervisor Simidian. Here. Vice President Ellenberg. Here. President Wasserman. Here as well. Thank you, Jess. With that, we're going to move on to item number two, our Pledge of Allegiance. 
Supervisor Simidian is going to be leading us today. I'd ask all of you that can stand to do so. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. A little windier day than normal with rain coming. Our flag was moving around more than uh, normal. We're now gonna move on to item number three, which is the invocation. And today's invocation is brought to us by Vice President Ellenberg. Vice President. You are muted, ma'am. <laughs> there we go. Thank you very much. Uh, the invocator this morning is Susana Navarro, who's the uh, Early Start Family uh, Resource Center Manager at Parents Helping Parents, and I'll offer a very brief uh, introduction. Susana has more than 12 years of experience supporting families of children with special needs in both English and Spanish with helping with parents helping parents in San Jose. She's a special education specialist, as well as a certified assistive technology specialist and is currently managing the Early Start Resource, Family Resource Center, serving families of children with disabilities who are zero to five years old. Ms. Navarro is also a caregiver for an autistic teenager. And do we have her here? Yes, there you are. Hi, Susanna, go right ahead. Hi, good morning. Good morning to all county supervisors and county staff. Um, as Susan said, I'm Susanna Navarro currently program manager for Parents Helping Parents Early Start Family Resource Center, where I support thousands of parents of children with disabilities each year in Santa Clara County. And I'm also the mom to an amazing teen son with autism. And I'm honored to be with you this morning to share an invocation today on the first day of National Family Caregiver Month. So let's take a moment to reflect that one out of five of us in the United States, perhaps this is true for many of you attending this meeting, are actually acting as family caregivers for children or adults with disabilities. Care for siblings with a disability or for a parent or relative with an age-related condition. There's no doubt delivering care and support to those with support needs is a foundation in our community. For many of us, Caregiving comes earlier than for others. Some caregivers are born into a family with a sibling or a parent who has a disability and become caregivers for entire lives. For many, caregiving wasn't what we had imagined for our future, like myself. We imagined that starting a family would be the highlight of our lives and that our children's first years would be filled with celebrating milestones that the middle school years would be filled with teen drama, homework, sports. Instead, we find ourselves on a road untraveled, fearful of the unknown, learning about a diagnosis we were not prepared for, with a routine full of appointments and therapy for our baby, our child, or our teen. We imagined our child would grow up to join clubs and competitions like we did. Instead, we find ourselves caring for a teen struggling with mental health challenges. We find ourselves realizing that care, the caregiver years will carry into our child's adulthood. And we find ourselves realizing that our adult child with disabilities will most likely not leave home or easily find a job. And we realize early on that we need to plan for caring for them even beyond our own existence. Many of us also imagined that in our own parents' later years, they'd sit at the kitchen table with us for long chats. And instead, we find ourselves sitting beside their hospital bed week after week, or coordinating medical care as they go in or out of the hospital. Some of us are family caregivers for the briefest of times. Others, like some of the parents I work with each day, become family caregivers in their early 20s and will be family caregivers every single day of their lives until they physically are no longer able to. So I would like to invite you to reflect today on both the beauty that life is and the hard experiences it brings. Some days are certainly harder than others, 
caring for a person with a disability has helped me to see life through the lens of love and acceptance. On a daily basis, I have learned to choose peace over normalness, to choose grace. Susanna, you muted yourself. I did. <laughs> I um, will continue. <laughs> I was saying that on a daily basis, I have found that my internal strength is stronger than I ever imagined I was capable of. And the gift of being a caregiver is the gift of experiencing every day the beauty of humanity, being connected in love to others unconditionally. It has been an invitation to grow in my capacity to love, as well as to grow in my understanding that caregiving is an integral part of life. Caring for other human beings in need in our families and in our community makes this planet a better and a kinder place. So today, on this first national uh, day of um, Family Caregiving Month, <laughs> I'd like to invite us all to reflect on the diversity of our community of caregivers, also on the needs of our community of caregivers. Caregivers need much strength, respite, and understanding. We rely heavily on the work of systems of care and government as we move through our caregiving life. So let's hold up very high in our thoughts and hearts all the family caregivers in Santa Clara County. Thank you very much for your time and for all that you do. Thank you. That was beautiful and inspiring. Exactly what we, we hope for in an invocation. Thank you, Susanna. Thank you, Susanna. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Susanna, and thank you, Vice President Ellenberg. Absolutely. We now move on to item number four, which is ceremonial pre um, presentations. I'm going to start with 4A, which is adjournment in memory of William Kelly, former chief of Santa Clara City Fire Department, William Gerard Kelly, or Bill, as we all knew him, passed away on September 30th at the age of 61 from complications from stage four lymphoma. Born on December 18, 1960, Bill had a distinguished academic career in addition to his career in fire service. After graduating from Bellarmine College Preparatory in 1978, just two years after I, he attended San Jose State where he met his wife, Barbara, and earned his Bachelor of Science in Aeronautics. Bill returned to San Jose State University where he received a Master's of Science in Public Administration in 2014. In addition, he earned a certificate in crisis management from Harvard University. Bill served in the Santa Clara Fire Department for 35 years, retiring in 2019. He lived his life in dedication to leadership and public service. Most notably, he oversaw Super Bowl 50 at Levi's Stadium in 2016 and implemented new strategies for emergency operations at the stadium. After he retired from the fire department in 2019, Bill served as Rotary President of the Santa Clara Chapter from 2021 to 2022. He had many different hobbies that he enjoyed, including traveling with his wife and children and flying his Mooney airplane. Bill also homebrewed IPA beer with his sons in which they had plans to open their own brewery sometime in the distant future. While serving on SVRIA, he led efforts to establish our regional communication system and understood the need for an interoperable radio network for Super Bowl 50 and beyond. Bill served on the working committee as a fire chiefs association representative for many years. Bill was an excellent fire chief and a visionary when it came to SVRIA. He and I served together for 10 years, a phenomenal individual who always made me laugh. With his great sense of humor and comedic timing, he knew how to keep those around him laughing. Bill loved the San Francisco 49ers, which is a quality that is survived by his entire family. Bill leaves behind a wonderful and loving family Barbara, his wife of 38 years, his children, Patrick, Bill, Shannon, and Libby, 
and their new dog, Paddington. On behalf of the County of Santa Clara, I extend to Bill's family and friends our sincere condolences. And once again, I had the pleasure of serving with Bill in a variety of ways regarding emergency preparedness in Santa Clara County for a decade. Phenomenal talent, wonderful human being. And uh, when he and Dana were in the same room, he had all of us laughing, but was the most brilliant when it came to public safety. And I thank him for all that he's done for Santa Clara County. With that, we will turn to 4B, Supervisor Simidian. Thank you, uh, Mr. Wasserman and colleagues. I uh, wanted to take a minute today to ask that we adjourn in memory of Ray Piontek. Uh, if you didn't know Ray, you missed uh, a really marvelous opportunity to just spend a little time with someone that uh, one of my staff once described as goodness on wheels uh, for reasons that I'll share in a minute. Uh, but uh, Ray Piontek, who passed away last month, uh, 80 years old, lived, uh, I think, gosh, three or four really extraordinary lives all rolled into one. <clears throat> Grew up in New England, from Connecticut originally, if I remember correctly, uh, was uh, off to college at uh, BC, Boston College, uh, and then uh, enlisted in the Navy, uh, where he was uh, stationed in Japan, served in Vietnam, uh, spent years as a naval aviator flying P-3s, uh, was also um, uh, the kind of person that you would expect, rose into uh, positions of senior command, and as I say, really had a, a very long and complete career in the Navy, but then uh, moved to the Bay Area. Uh, was a transplant like so many folks and uh, became a part of our uh, uh, our emerging Silicon Valley, a business and industry guy. And uh, with, you know, all the brand names that we know, Xerox and Apple and Autodesk, uh, and then had a long and successful career there. Uh, and then, you know, uh, could have put his feet up and didn't. Uh, decided that uh, he wanted to give back, and it's just a marvelous story of serendipity. He uh, he told the story of uh, literally just looking across the street, seeing a neighbor who was tossing out what to Ray seemed like perfectly good furniture that somebody else could use. Uh, and so from that observation and insight grew the Bay Area Furniture Bank. And, uh, you know, in 2016, it was literally... Um, started in the home garage and uh, I think uh, Ray provided uh, furniture to 15 to 20 families that first year. Uh, but <clears throat> over the intervening six years, uh, he just never stopped growing it. And, um, you know, he had a marvelous uh, uh, slogan or uh, uh, which was we furnish futures because, uh, you know, if you were a veteran who was maybe returning to civilian life or, uh, you know, a, a kid or a woman who was fleeing uh, domestic violence. Uh, if you were a refugee who needed uh, some assistance or a teenager who was aging out of foster care, you know, housing was a challenge, but then you got to figure out where to furnish it. And from those modest beginnings of literally, you know, 15 to 20 uh, families that first year, uh, you know, Ray went on to deliver something like 25,000 pieces of furniture, if not more, uh, to something like uh, 7,000 adults and kids in 2,500, 3,000 families over these last half dozen years. Uh, it's just a, a remarkable record. Of, and the people needed the help. He, you know, he, uh, he would tell you, uh, you know, 80 plus percent of the folks that he was helping literally did not have a table to sit down and eat at, um, you know, uh, more than two thirds would tell you that they were sleeping on the floor. And that's what Ray uh, said was not acceptable. And if there was furniture out there that still had a, a second uh, life, uh, he was determined to 
find it, put it to use, uh, and and make it um, available to folks who uh, really did need the help. So as I say, he was, um, you know, a New England product, a, a Silicon Valley transplant, a guy who had a marvelous career in the Navy and then in uh, the business world and then as a uh, a nonprofit uh, founder, organizer, leader, uh, doing good works right up until his uh, final days. Uh, he, uh, with all of that, I think would have told you he was first and foremost a family guy. And uh, so, I, you know, I want to pass along condolences uh, by virtue of our adjourned memory today uh, to Irene, his wife, to his daughter, uh, grandkids, nieces, and nephews. Uh, that was, uh, other than the furniture bank, that was the thing he always wanted to talk about uh, in my uh, experience with him. I was so pleased that um, our paths crossed, that uh, my office and I could be a little bit of help. The county could help. I know Steve Preminger in the county executive's office was a resource as well. So um, uh, adjourn in memory, good person doing good works. Uh, and someone who made uh, every conversation a little warmer by virtue of his presence. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, colleagues. Thank you, Supervisor. Supervisor Lee. Thank you, uh, Supervisor Smidian, for journeying in honor of Ray Piontek, a fellow Navy man um, who find life after, there's life after the Navy. The Sunnyvale-based Bay Area Furniture Bank was really a pa passion project for Ray. I had the opportunity to visit with the Bay Area Furniture Bank last year, and you could tell that the furniture bank was a venture that Ray deeply cared about. Perfectly good furniture being recycled can really help transform people's lives who could barely find a place to live for nothing to sleep in or to eat on. He has such immense pride for the organization's mission. And one of Furniture Bank's core tenets was to never deliver a bed without a bed frame, as the mattress on the floor was not dignified. Thank you, Ray, for your commitment to serving com families and communities in need through the Furniture Bank and your service to our Navy and our country. Your legacy and generosity will live on through his work. Rest in peace. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. Excellent additions. We now turn to item five, accommodations and proclamations. Then I turn to Vice President Ellenberg. Thank you. Uh, I am honored to recognize the more than 30,000 dedicated, hardworking, in-home supportive services caregivers through the Declaration of November as In-Home Supportive Services, IHSS Caregiver Month. IHSS caregivers make it possible for more than 29,000 Santa Clara County elderly residents and those with low incomes and disabilities to remain in their homes. It really takes a special individual to work as an in-home care provider. IHSS caregivers exhibit great sensitivity, honesty, patience, trust, commitment, dedication, and compassion. They grappled with the twin challenges in managing their own families, as well as those for whom they worked during the drawn out COVID pandemic. Like the rest of us, they had to figure out self-care while meeting the high needs of others. I don't imagine everyone could do this work and those who choose this path are truly deserving of our respect and appreciation. I also want to acknowledge and congratulate the County of Santa Clara Social Services Agency, IHSS Public Authority, and the IHSS Public Authority Advisory Board for their ongoing commitment, contributions, and support for our IHSS caregivers. It takes far more than a village to provide care for all who need it, and I thank all the participants and stakeholders in this system. Uh, accepting this proclamation today will be Terry Posley representing the public and Edith Gong from the Public Authority. Do we see either one of them? I see Edith. There we go. Good morning. Thank you very much, Supervisor Ellenberg, for presenting the proclamation. Again, I'm Edith Gong, Director of Public Authority. On behalf of the IHSS caregivers in Santa Clara County, we graciously accept the proclamation naming November In-Home Supportive Services Caregiver Month. We consider these IHSS caregivers as heroes who tirelessly support and care for their family members or those who work for recipients unrelated to them and see caregiving as their profession. We're really excited 
to present the proclamation at our in-person caregiver appreciation event on November 17th. This will be our first one since 2018. Again, once, uh, once again, thank you to the entire Board of Supervisors for recognizing these hardworking caregivers and for all that you do for in-home supportive services. Thank you. Thank you, Edith, and thank you again, Vice President Ellenberg. With that, we'll move on to item number six. Item number six is public comment. You register electronically and the clerk will call upon you. We'll have a timer based on how many speakers we have. This is the opportunity for individuals to speak about anything not on today's agenda. So once again, this is the opportunity to spend, speak about anything not on today's agenda. Um, if by chance you do speak about something on today's agenda, we'll let you know and that you won't be able then to speak on that item when it comes up later. So with that, Jess, let's give another minute here for anyone who wishes to speak under public comment to register electronically, and then we will get started. And again, this is item number six, if you're following us from home or office. We are at 10. Seems to be holding. Okay, let's give each of our speakers uh, two minutes. As we have less than 15 speakers, it'll be two minutes each up to 15. Thank you. Thank you. Our first speaker is Cameron. I've unmuted you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Cameron, you will have to click to turn your microphone on. Cameron, we'll come back. Our next speaker is Paul Soto. I've unmuted you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. Timer will start when you begin speaking. Uh, good morning, Board of Supervisors and uh, citizens of uh, County of Santa Clara. My name is Paul Soto, and I'm from the Horseshoe. Um, 75 times, really, to the grand jury, I don't know. Very interesting statistic, uh, Supervisor Chavez. Very interesting. Secondly, I'd like to talk about your minute orders. Your minute orders are begging, begging for accurate information. When I look at your minute orders, okay, it says at pub in the public comment section, it says two individuals spoke. Uh-uh, that's not acceptable. That is not acceptable. That is not an accurate public record because we call in and we identify who we are, what we represent, and what our contention is with the county government. So what I would like reflected in those minute orders, because that is the only accurate depiction of what it is that happened. That's why you have minute orders. Okay, so I want to start seeing now. I don't care what you guys got to do. Pass your resolutions, do whatever you got to do within your language. But what I want to see as a citizen of this county is I want to start seeing names, where they are from, and what they said. I know you're not going to do a verbatim but you still need to talk about the topics in which the public stated on these documents because it's absent and that's conspicuously absent. And I know why it's absent because you don't want people typing in to search engines and finding out where people are saying what. That's why it's being done. We see you, we know what you're doing within the context of these documents. It's not okay, it's not acceptable anymore. And I'm personally not gonna tolerate it because that is where the crimes are being committed. It's being committed within the context of the documents. That's where these crimes against humanity are committed within the documents. By the time somebody has a sign and they're standing outside protesting, it's too late because it's in these meetings where the crimes against humanity are committed. Our next speaker is Blair Beekman. I've unmuted you, please go ahead. Hi, Claire Beekman. I didn't think I would be next. Uh, thank you. Thanks a lot for the words of Paul Soto. He opened up, I think, an incredibly important subject uh, for ourselves as the feature of uh, how we practice as uh, local city and county governments in uh, Santa Clara County. Um, you know, with the Surveillance and Tech Ordinance of 2014, I thought it brought in an amazing concept that we can really start to better consider 
what are simply our better uh, practices of open community democracy? And what are the small little things we can do each day to improve that process? And Paul is just simply asking, how can we better improve our community democratic process? And he's offering awesome ideas. Uh, I, I offer the same thing often myself. How can meeting minutes, uh, you know, enlarge itself to one or two sentences or three sentences that can very easily and simply describe better what uh, community persons are talking about at, 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 at an agenda time. It, it's, a, it's a good art to learn how to do that we should be practicing. And from that, it can actually become a more progressive ideas in two or three sentences. Um, I wanted to bring up the concept today of why can't closed session agenda items offer one or two sentences to describe to the public what exactly you, you talked about at the closed session time. Uh, good luck on how to work on these things. It's incredibly important and in how do we build the future of community democracy. And with 20 seconds remaining, I just wanted to quickly comment that I have to go early today. So to speak on item 30, good luck on body camera issues and how um, you know, everyday public can be allowed uh, you know, footage of body camera things if there's uh, an issue they have with, with, with the, uh, body cameras. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ian. I've unmuted you, please go ahead. Uh, good morning, guys. Um, uh, I'm the, one of the PSOs at the hospital, one of the stewards of the SEIU speaking on behalf of the PSOs. I know some of you are aware that the PSOs voted 80% to 20% to reject the county proposal for the SO to take over the PSOs department. And I know some of you are aware of the ongoing problems that PSOs are having regarding staffing and uh, inconsistent uh, decisions made by the people in, our, in charge of us. I believe the vote represents the PSOs poor morale brought about by the lack of respect shown to PSOs with with this proposal, asking PSOs to apply and test for what is essentially the exactly the same job. Uh, it's also indicative in the lack of trust in SO management, their broken promises, lack of care, and unprofessional, inconsistent treatment of PSOs. We ask that you reject the county proposal in its current form, and with the outcome of the upcoming sheriff's election, task the next sheriff with taking over the vision of centralizing security services in the county and restoring the trust and credibility in the process and in the SO and in their, in their role of managing either SPSOs or the remaining PSOs. Thank you. Our next speaker is David. I've unmuted you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two morning, minutes to uh, speak. Good morning, uh, Board of Supervisors. My name is David Dia. I'm a clinical nurse at Santa Clara Valley Medical Center, and I'm speaking on agenda number 72, which is on the agenda, so I won't speak later. I just wanted to uh, share appreciations for uh, you guys willing to uh, sign off on a 10% raise uh, for clinical nurses, you know, myself and all the other clinical nurses at the hospital. Uh, however, I did just want to bring up the fact that um, there are a lot of classifications that are not included, as it's been mentioned already in uh, the previous meeting, uh, you know, the certified registered nurse anesthetist, nurse practitioners, assistant nurse managers, staff developers, and uh, many more. Um, so I'm just hoping uh, that the Board of Supervisors could uh, recommend the county to expedite any kind of things they need to do to uh, make sure that they get the appropriate raises as soon as possible, because it's been delayed for so long already, even for the clinical nurses. Uh, I just think it's really unfair that they're just not doing it all at once. Uh, I get if there's more to do, uh, but I just hope that um, the county uh, could just expedite things and the Board of Supervisors could uh, encourage that to happen. So hopefully something could be done by the end of this month or something. Uh, that's all. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Delilah. I've unmuted you. Please go ahead. Hi. Um, bringing back the high-risk workers was one step in the right direction because workers should never have been put out on leave, but we still have a ways to go. And the discrimination against the unvaccinated workers. We shouldn't have to wear a different mask and we shouldn't have to test. We should follow the same guidance as the vaccinated do. Other counties surrounding Santa Clara County and companies within Santa Clara County aren't discriminating and treating their unvaccinated staff differently. You are on the wrong side of history. God forbid your children or, or grandchildren should want the right to choose what goes in their body. Is this how you would want them to be treated? 
We should be progressing in society, not repeating the ugliness from the past, the ugliness of discrimination and segregation. I heard people comment on how they've had multiple vaccines and boosters and nothing happened to them. Well, they should feel very blessed because not everyone was as lucky. It's ignorant to think that just because you had multiple vaccines and nothing happened to you, that someone else won't have any complications. I would like to know, why do you choose to treat the unvaccinated differently? Do you believe that we walk around carrying disease, that we are contagious, that we are a walking plague? I would like to have it on record, your reason for discriminating against us. Words have energy and power with the ability to help, to heal, to hurt, to harm, to humiliate, and to humble. The propaganda that has been spread about the unvaccinated has caused a lot of harm and division. We have empirical evidence that everything that is being said about the unvaccinated is not true. You can, you can never take away our real life experiences. In one of your previous meetings, you mentioned how the public is losing trust in the sheriff's department due to everything going on. While the community is losing trust in you, and you too, for all the hypocrisy and contradictions regarding the masks and the mandates. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Leah. Please go ahead. Hi, good morning. Can you hear me? Um, yeah. I, I am an assistant nurse manager. First, I would like to um, say for the deceased individuals that you mentioned earlier, um, may they rest in peace and I um, condolence to their family. So unfortunately, I missed the last meeting. Um, Last time I didn't get to attend because I was on the floor providing patient care, wound care, and I was a break relief. RNPA sent an email saying that um, AMs will only be getting 5%. My question is why? I am a clinical nurse. All AMs are clinical nurse and do more. So I believe that we deserve the 10% and not the 5%. Um, I do trust that you will make the right, the fair decision that everyone that are not part of the 10% will get it. Thank you and have a good day. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jose. I've unmuted you. Please go ahead. Jose Najaro, you'll have to click to turn your microphone on. We'll come back. Our next speaker is Sharon Luna. Please go ahead. Good morning, President Wasserman and Board of Supervisors. First, I'd like to say Thank you very much to Supervisor Cindy Chavez for um, referring uh, Casey Holcomb to me in regard to uh, domestic violence, and I really appreciated her call. Um, we had a very robust conversation, and I explained to her how the sensitivity of Board of Supervisors when they're making comments um, that you don't know um, who is on the call and what words would trigger. Um, so it was a very good call and I wanted to say thank you for that referral. She did call and it was um, a good conversation. Um, next, I would like to um, state as a new member of the San Martin uh, Planning Advisory Committee, um, I was very disappointed to find out that a letter that was written by SIMPAC to the Board of Supervisors uh, in June 22nd, 2020 um, to change their bylaws has not been received um, or reached to the attorneys or the Board of Supervisors. Um, nor do uh, individuals from the county know where, know where this letter is. The committee will need to wait another month and I find that to be um, unacceptable and to be told by a planning commissioner that the Board of Supervisors have a lot on their plate and who knows when it will get to it is not the correct approach. Please request that the letter that SIMPAC wrote be located and reviewed in a timely manner so that we, we can get on with business and show support for the San Martin Committee and have the Board of Supervisors as a conduit uh, for our residents. Thank you. Our next speaker is Alan Kamara. I've unmuted you. Please go ahead. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. This is Alan Kamara. Um, I'm one of the nurses in the county and um, the president of RMPA. Um, I want to thank you all. My condolences to the deceased that were mentioned in this meeting today as well. Um, yesterday, we received email from the county 
um, proposing that the rest of some of the psych nurses, all of the psych nurses and the assistant nurse managers will be getting 5%. And to Leah's comment, just to give a context of why Leah, one of the assistant nurse manager that just spoke up mentioned, um, that 5%, we haven't had the opportunity to meet with the county. That email came late afternoon yesterday, but out of transparency, we sent it out to all our membership so they are aware of what's going on. Um, we want to thank the Board of Supervisors to make sure I didn't, um, Agenda 72 can go forward. And we thank you for the 10% for the clinical nurses. However, to Leah's point and David's point, we hope that you will consider asking the county to make sure every membership in the bargaining units gets that 10% as well. Um, we'll look forward to hearing from the county. Um, I know Dr. Smith mentioned that they are doing all the classification studies. I hope it can be, um, those studies will be expedited. Um, I just hope we do not create a disparity amongst our bargaining unit um, for a county that champion diversity, equity, and inclusion. This is not something that we want to do. I sincerely appreciate you. Thank you all. And we look forward to the outcome of this uh, 72. Thank you. We'll go back to Jose Naharo. Jose, please click. There you go. Yes, hi. Thank you. Thank you for your time and the opportunity to speak today. Uh, I'm a, P, I'm a PSO steward at Valley Medical, and I, I wanted to uh, reiterate what my uh, companion stated as far as um, uh, the 80% uh, who voted against the proposal. And uh, we feel that we, we actually implore that the Board of Supervisors um, uh, look through this again and, and check out the, um, how this uh, is not treated fairly. Uh, how the PSOs are not treated fairly and given the um, respect and um, and we're giving the respect that they're uh, due. Uh, I also want to just uh, appreciate and thank you for the time and please, please reconsider what this uh, proposal has is not good for the current PSOs and their abilities that they can give to this county. And thank you for your time. And that concludes our requests. Thank you, Jess. I appreciate that. We now move on to item seven, which is approval of the consent calendar and changes to the Board of Supervisors agenda. Jess, if you'll pre please read the posted agenda as it now stands. We have a request from Supervisor Chavez to continue item number 10 to November 15th, 2022. Item number 10 is a public hearing relating to implementation of Senate Bill 9. There's a request from President Wasserman to add item number 13 to the consent calendar. Item number 13 is to approve referral to direct administration to set aside $3 million from the Stanford Affordable Housing Fund to support two qualifying projects in San Mateo County, including 1.5 million for an affordable multifamily housing development in the city of East Palo Alto and 1.5 million for an affordable homeownership development with the city of Menlo Park development the city of Menlo Park is pursuing or an alternative qualifying project selected in consultation with San Mateo County staff and agreed to by administration should either of these projects fall through and return to the board as needed with any actions necessary to allocate funds to the identified project. There's a request from President Wasserman and Supervisor Lee to add item number 14 to the consent calendar. Item number 14 is to receive a report relating to naming Alamitos Creek Bridge for Kathleen Kitty Monahan. There's a request from Vice President Ellenberg to consider item numbers 15, 16, 17, and 18 concurrently. Item number 15 is to receive a report relating to the implementation of the 2016 Measure A Affordable Housing Bond. Item number 16 is to approve delegation of authority to the county executive or designee relating to one or more loans with Jamboree Housing Corporation or its affiliate in an amount not to exceed 4200000 for the acquisition and conversion of the Pavilion Inn into 21 supportive housing units to be located at 1280 North 4th Street in San Jose. 
Item number 17 is to consider recommendations relating to real property located at 1380 and 1400 South Main Street, Milpitas. Item number 18 is to consider recommendations relating to real property located at 101 South Jackson Avenue, San Jose. There's a request from Vice President Ellenberg to add item number 20 to the consent calendar. Item number 20 is to receive report relating to the youth homelessness demonstration program. There's a request from Supervisor Chavez to hold item number one to November 15th, 2022. Item number 21 is to receive report relating to progress of the food system work plan and funding options for food assistance by community-based organizations. We have a request from Supervisor Chavez to delete item number 27. Item number 27 is to consider recommendations relating to the attacks on protesters and treatment of women in Iran. We have a request from Vice President Ellenberg and Supervisor Lee to add item number 28 to the consent calendar. Item number 28 is to consider recommendations relating to the South County gun buyback event. We have a request from Supervisor Simidian to hold the portions of item number 30 that pertain to tasers to no earlier than February 2023 and hold the remaining portions of item number 30 to November 15th, 2022. Item number 30 is to consider recommendations relating to the body worn cameras and technology agreement. We have a request from administration to hold item number 32 to December 6th, 2022. Item number 32 is to receive report relating to the implementation of a board of supervisors constituent relationship management system and associated timelines, staffing needs, costs, and funding sources. We have a request from Vice President Ellenberg and Supervisor Lee to remove item number 41 from the consent calendar. Item number 41 is to approve agreement with the individual selected as successor to the county executive upon the vacancy of the position of county executive. I also have an oral summary to changes of compensation or benefits for certain local agency executives. Pursuant to government code section 54953, the following is an oral summary of the proposed salary adjustments that are required to be disclosed. Salary Ordinance NS-20.22.04 was approved on first reading on October 18th, 2022, but will not be finally approved until it is approved for a second reading, which is agendized to occur at today's meeting under item number 78. NS-20.22.04 increases the salary of the Chief Medical Examiner Coroner by 10%. Item number 41 is an approval of an agreement with the successor appointee to the county executive upon the vacancy of the position of county executive. The county executive's compensation is largely governed by the county's executive leadership salary ordinance. In addition to what is provided in the salary ordinance, the agreement under item number 41 provides that the appointment as the county executive is at will, the salary of the county executive shall initially be set at 10% above the salary of the chief operating officer. The cap on accrued vacation shall be increased from 864 hours to 2,592 hours without change to the rate of accrual. The appointee shall be entitled to continue their participation in the county's 401A supplemental benefit plan. And the requirement in section 10B of the executive salary, salary leadership ordinance to retire directly from the county shall not be applicable to the appointee for retiree medical insurance. That concludes all of my oral summaries. You're muted, sir. Huh. Maybe in my last meeting that won't happen. We shall see. Vice President Ellenberg. Thank you, President Wasserman. I want to clarify that I, I requested a removal of 41 from the consent calendar and specifically to have it heard with item nine this morning, please. So I want to make sure that's positioned with nine and, and not waiting until we get to 41 later in the calendar. Here, 41 uh, with nine. Correct. Request, and 41 is simply the contract terms of the appointment. Correct. Okay. Thank so you. Uh, among, I have some yes. more, please. 
uh, among our commendations today is an acknowledgement of the 1,000 days of COVID response. And I want to just take a, a moment to note the significance of this item and the massive toll COVID has had on our community in so many ways, as well as the tremendous effort our county staff undertook to respond to the pandemic. I am grateful to the work of our staff during this challenging period. And I hope that we continue to focus on recovery for our community and our own employees uh, and to mitigate the many impacts we've seen, not only on the health of residents, again, including our employees, but also on housing insecurity and job loss and educational impacts and mental health challenges. So a thousand days in, thank you. Thank you to the 20,000 Santa Clara County employees. Uh, with regard to item 21, I, I know that it's being uh, deferred. I support Supervisor uh, Chavez's direction, but I would like to ask that staff augment this report uh, to bring information to that meeting that's responsive to the June 28th referral, including a target allocation of funds and a disbursement schedule to make funds available to CBOs to help us move away from the one-off inventory items and referrals to a strategic funding approach to our food insecurity investments. With regard to item number 49, uh, given the public comment filed late yesterday, uh, Mr. Jason Dorsey from SEIU that, that he and Labor Relations have set up a plan to meet some items uh, of concern. I'd like to move that contracts A, C, D, E, F, and G be held for at least six weeks to give those negotiations an opportunity to continue. And excuse, find, me, excuse me, Vice President, was that everything but B is in Baker? Let me just check my alphabet. Yes, it is. Everything but B. Thank you. Uh, and finally, with regard to item 50, just want to um, thank staff for the report. It, it's really encouraging that not only have we created a digital presence in the community that the community is frequently using, but that we're continuing to approve, improve on its navigation and uh, accessibility. And speaking of which, I'd like to ask that before the launch in 2023, we look into ways in which we can make our digital presence language accessible. Um, the city of San Jose's website does that, and we and we might look there for an example of um, a, at least a current practice, if, if not a best practice. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vice President Ellenberg. Uh, Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. Um, I want to start by saying that on item 21 and 49, and 50, which Supervisor Ellenberg just spoke on, that I, I want to reinforce and concur with each of her requests. And in addition on item 50, I'm very interested in making sure that um, the comments and questions are being routed properly at the departmental level when someone hits a contact us button for cleaning up the, the portal. And we, we do receive um, emails occasionally where where folks don't get responses. So I just want to make sure that we're getting feedback on that. Um, and then for item 22, this is a report on custody health services related to lead screening. I wanted to say to Dr. Day and her staff, thank you for the report. And that I'd like to request a progress update at the second board meeting in March of 2023. And I would also like to have the staff respond to the second part of the motion that I put forward on the 27th. Um, at our first meeting in December. Um, I think I think those are the biggies. And then on items um, on item 10, colleagues, I just wanted to make sure that we had a chance to dive into it. So that's why I was asking for its a, a deferral, not for any other reason, but mostly just to make sure we had an opportunity to to speak at length about that item. And I think for me, colleagues. Oh, and then one last thing on, on item 27. Item 27 was a report back on, on a resolution condemning the violence against women and children on the attacks at, you know, in the pro, on, and the attacks on the protesters in Iran. I had asked that staff um, work with the advocates directly, and that was not done. And so um, because of some concern from the community, we're actually deleting it today and coming back in two weeks. And I do just want to make sure that the staff collaborates with the community advocates. And if they could reach out to my office, the folks who um, 
who we worked with on the resolution would be happy to to support those efforts. And then um, on item 49, I also concur with the request that Supervisor Allenberg made. Thank you, Supervisor. And regarding the Iranian women, that was to hold it, correct? For no, it, we have to delete the item because there are some mistakes in the record. Um, and be hold, there, held. Yeah, and I would just say, colleagues, one of the challenges we have with our system is that when there is a mistake, that item cannot be deleted which is what's forcing us to wait two weeks to have this conversation again. Got it. Thank you very much for the clarification. Supervisor Smitty. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to uh, ask that I be recorded as an abstention on that portion of 78, item 78 on the consent calendar, uh, an abstention on that portion that deals with the medical examiner and coroner's position which is consistent with my uh, action on an earlier vote. So again, if the board and the clerk will record me as the abstain on medical examiner coroner, item 78, please. Thank you. Do we note it, Supervisor Chavez, your hand is still raised? I apologize. Thank you, Chair. No worries. And Supervisor Simeon? Okay. Just with Supervisor's hands down, I see one hand raised from the public. Would you please call on that person to speak for two minutes? I will. Our first speaker is Paul Soto. I've unmuted you. You'll have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Paul Soto, if you're there, if you'll click to accept the unmute. We will come back. Our next speaker is Jason Dorsey. You'll have two minutes to speak. Please accept the unmute. Good morning. Uh, I just wanted to speak briefly on item number 49. There was actually two items I know was kind of confusing that don't need to be held. That's B and H. Those are both don't need to be held. So thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Paul Soto. I've unmuted you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. Paul Sutter, your microphone is still muted. And it does not seem like Paul is responsive right now. All right. And that concludes our request. Thank you. Supervisor Smidian. Uh, thank you. Uh, forgive me. I'm managing my technology, Mr. Uh, Chair. Uh, I neglected uh, to say that while I uh, I'm happy, of course, that I'm 14 uh, regarding the uh, naming of the uh, Kitty Monaghan Bridge is uh, on consent. I did just want to ask if we could incorporate direction to staff to come back with uh, the resolution uh, sometime uh, before the end of this calendar year, since we expect the bridge will be completed in January. Thank you, duly noted. And was that a motion to approve the rest of the consent items as stated? Yeah, I guess it was. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Second. All right. And a second by Vice President Ellenberg. And I think Supervisor Smidian is done speaking. So I'll ask Jess for a roll call vote. I just ask Supervisor Chavez, you made comments on 22. Was that also to add it to consent? Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, so a vote on the motion, Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Smidian? Aye. Vice President Ellenberg? Yes. President Wasserman? Yes, as well. Thank you very much. We now move on to item eight, which is to receive report from our county executive, Dr. Jeff Smith. Dr. Smith. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the board. Um, two issues to talk about today. One is that uh, we have uh, completed a tentative agreement with the uh, Physicians Union VPG. Um, it was completed after um, three days of intense negotiations that ended on Friday. We are cleaning up a few uh, language issues, but um, I think we will have a successful vote from the membership of the union. Um, they have to give a 10 day notice um, for their members to inspect the agreement. 
And then I hope that that will be done in time for us to get the contract back in front of the board at the next meeting in uh, November, which would then mean that there would be a second reading on December 6th and the um, change in payroll would happen on the 11th, the period of the 11th. Um, I can go over the details if the board would like, but uh, um, the board knows all of them. So I'll refrain from that. Right. <clears throat> The other issue I'd like to talk about is I think everybody knows by now that I'm going to be retiring in July. So I'm not leaving anytime soon, but the announcement gave me the opportunity to look back a little bit and think a little bit about the last 13 years. So I wanna first thank the Board of Supervisors for their support, this board and the previous boards. I've served now under 10 members of the board of supervisors they've all been um, brilliant and committed and um, courageous and helped with all of the changes that occurred in the county uh, during that time period um, i will have served under 11 uh, by the end of july and quite possibly 12 um so i want to thank this board and all the previous boards for all of their um, vision and present a thoughtfulness um nothing happens in this county without um, a lot of people involved and the 25 26 000 people that work for us are brilliant they are committed to public service. They aren't here to make piles of money. I keep telling them if they wanna make piles of money, there's Google down the street, but they're here because they care about people and care about the community. And they provide the services that hold the fabric of society together. Those things that we oftentimes don't think about. We have a very creative um, group of employees and it's really been a pleasure to work for them. Um, and I wanna thank them deeply for everything that they've done. Um, looking back, it's been an interesting 13 years. I started in 2009, which was when the county was feeling the worst effects of the 2008 recession because it was delayed a little bit. We had major deficits. Um, the board was concerned that um, there was problems with fiscal responsibility at the hospital that was causing um, the um, subsidy from the general fund to go up, which was causing county problems throughout the departments. I was asked to work on that. Um, so. When I first got here, I realized that all employees, not just the hospital employees, had endured 10 years of cuts and uncertainty, and that had had a dramatic effect on the organization, a trauma that really caused mistrust and uh, suspicion. So what we needed to do initially was to really try to change the culture, give the employees the opportunity to have a choice in their work to effectively change their work to come up with new ideas and that's why we started the center for leadership and transformation we're focused on creating a learning organization akin to the organizations that have been talked about by famous uh, author peter singe um, in addition to that we had to work at the same time with improving the cost discipline at the hospital and we were successful in doing that, reducing the, um, su the subsidy from the general fund from about 200 million down to 80 million. Um, that obviously took some years, didn't happen overnight. But um, I was happy to see that change. And that we also at the same time had to implement the um, ACA, which uh, changed our entire way of doing business in the health system. 
Um, in 2011, we um, were still recovering from the downturn. And in order to avoid layoffs, we went to our union partners and asked them to make concessions for a year. Uh, we were able to get that done because we have fabulous unions who understood that it was better to avoid layoffs. We um, were able to use that 75 million, well, actually it was about 100 million for the entire county um, in order to stave off um, the economic downturn. And then we uh, were able to give that money back to employees. Um, so it basically became a loan. And I'm very proud of the unions for doing that. It goes to show what a great team they are to work with. Um, we were able to, um, to some consternation, um, participate in the dismantling of redevelopment, which helped us financially dramatically. It will be billions of dollars over the many years um, that it's effective, which is 10 to 20 years of money that is redirected from redevelopment agencies to care for uh, people and to provide the services that we need to provide. That will allow us to expand our behavioral health system, to expand uh, substance abuse, and to provide better care and better services for social services and uh, the hospital. That was a big, big deal. At the same time, we were getting changes pushed down from the state level to our the way that we do business. And we were able to have social services, probation, and um, behavioral health working very closely together to deal with that by moving services into the community, getting rid of uh, group homes, eliminating some of the um, internal services that were not necessary, decreasing the census of the um, juvenile hall from about 300 in 2009 to now um, in the 60 range, a big deal for kids in our um, custody. We also have been able to reduce the um, number of individual kids that we're removing from families because of a change in CPS um, structure and processes and policies. So instead of traumatizing families by taking away their kids or keeping them in the family and providing them additional wraparound services to make sure that they will succeed. Um, then we were able um, to buy two hospitals uh, that used to be owned by the Daughters of Charity uh, O'Connor and St. Louise, as well as the outpatient uh, services at DePaul. And we were able to do that um, after a vigorous and courageous move by the board to um, push the, the issue in order to provide the best care to our community. That was a very important decision to make because soon after that, we had COVID and as we all know, we're still in the middle of COVID, but um, we had a model response to COVID um, doing much better than the rest of uh, the nation and much of the Bay Area and the state. And I wanna thank everybody who responded as DSWs and all of the non-DSWs that worked vigorously and continue to work vigorously to respond and save lives. We saved at least a couple of thousand county lives, which was a big deal, and thousands and thousands of lives around the nation because of the leadership of Dr. Sarah Cody, who was a brilliant person during the COVID uh, process. So lots of things have happened. Um, none of it was done individually by me. All of it was done by great leadership from the board and great participation and execute, execution from the, by the uh, uh, employees of the county. So it's time for me to leave. 
I don't want to leave, but I'll be 69 in June. Um, as many of you know, I've developed uh, Parkinsonism. It doesn't affect my work, but it does remind me that I need to spend more time with my family. So I will be around until July. I will help with the transition vigorously. Um, and I will longingly think of you after I'm gone. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Smith. I appreciate all information. Um, I'm not gonna be here when you leave. So I'm gonna take this opportunity uh, just to say a couple of words. You were speaking about our, our mutual employees, about their brilliance and how committed they are. Well, those are two adjectives that I definitely think of when I think about you. I came to the county the year after you did, um, and except for the very, very first part, have been serving with you, with our employees for the benefit of the people of Santa Clara County for the last 12 years. And I wanna tell you how much I admire your ability to lead, your brilliance, your commitment, the 99.99% of the public has no idea of what the county situation was like when you got here, nor when you and other department heads and administration were spending nights and weekends for two years in our emergency center, managing and directing um, all the services that county personnel were providing for the COVID pandemic. And I just wanna thank you as one supervisor, currently the president of the board of supervisors and a short timer, if you will, as I'll be gone at the end of the year while you're still on for another six months. So from, from me, I wanna say thank you, Jeff. I wanna say thank you, Dr. Smith. I wanna say, say thank you, Mr. CEO, for your leadership, leadership, your commitment, your brilliance, your sacrifice from being by being away from your family, not only for so many hours physically at 70 West Heading and elsewhere throughout our county, but also mentally. Mentally on your drive to and fro when you're physically with your family for birthdays or anniversaries or Christmases or whatever. I know you're still thinking about the county. I know that because of the emails I see, the texts I receive, the phone calls. You are on 24 seven and have been for 13 years. And on behalf of our board of supervisors, I thank you. And I'm sure you'll hear lots of more great things about you at the end of June. Thank you, sir. All right, indeed, indeed. With that, we're gonna move on to item number nine. And uh, as far as item nine goes, I'm going to, uh, this is report from county council. I'm gonna turn it uh, over to county council at this time. Thank you, President Wasserman. There were no reportable actions from the closed session meeting of October 31st, 2022, and I will turn it back to you. Thank you, Mr. Williams. And as president of the Board of Supervisors, I will report out that at the October 17th, 2022 closed session, by unanimous vote with all members present, the Board of Supervisors appointed you, sir, James R. Williams, to be our next county executive, effective upon the vacancy of the office of the county executive by Dr. Smith. With that said, I now turn things over to you Vice President Ellenberg. Thank you, President Wasserman. This is a big moment for our county. Um, and as we prepare to say goodbye to Dr. Smith, an accomplished CEO who led our county uh, very competently for the last 13 years, the board has had an opportunity to appoint his successor to take the reins and to continue the work. And we have unanimously done so. But before I comment on our choice, I want to be clear that our responsibility as a board is first and foremost to the nearly 2 million residents who live in this county. Selecting a CEO who will be, who will be charged with the implementation of an $11 billion budget 
and 23,000 employees is one of the three core functions of the Board of Supervisors. And because this executive position is a board appointment and not an elected office, the CEO must be responsive and accountable to the Board of Supervisors. This, this in fact, is perhaps the most distinguishing feature of the position. The CEO's role is to operationalize the priorities and values that the board articulates. The Board of Supervisors, in turn, as an elected body, is responsible and accountable to the community. We are responsible for setting policies that serve the residents of the county and to do so in a manner that leads with equity. The board sets direction, tone, and policy for this organization, and we do that in public. We make all personnel decisions regarding any of the five board appointed positions in closed session in accordance with the Ralph M. Brown Act. The board is the face of the county uh, as opposed to any of our appointees. And I, and I have heard and truly appreciate the enthusiasm of so many county stakeholders who have reached out to weigh in on this appointment. And I hear that so many of you want to meet with our appointee prior to finalizing uh, his contract. And again, um, I just want to emphasize that the priorities of the CEO are those of the board. So to the extent that you want to ensure that there is a clear mandate and an understanding of the issues that have to be addressed to move our county forward, that's the work of the board. It is our role to ensure that the CEO follows board direction, which is influenced by our engagement with a wide variety of stakeholders, including all of you who have wrote or called or texted in the last few days. It's also our responsibility to hold the county executive accountable for any failure to follow board direction. And if anyone should ever feel that that's the case, it is the board that you should alert so that we can address those issues. With all of that said, procedurally, I am so proud to be part of an organization that cultivates leadership and is well positioned to promote from within. A child of immigrants from India and Iran and raised by a single mother, James Williams is an individual who reflects our values and our community. He will be the first person of color to serve as the executive for Santa Clara County. James has dedicated his career to public service the last 12 years to our county. He is wholly committed to racial equity as his portfolio of work attests. Under James' leadership at the, count, at the Office of County Council, Santa Clara County has been at the forefront of social justice and impact litigation. We were the first county to stand up to the Trump's administration's uh, immigration bans and public charge law. We've been nationwide leaders in defending DACA, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. Under James's leadership, County Cop County Council opposed racial discrimination and entanglement in federal immigration enforcement. His office completed the trial of the first case in the nation brought by government officials to hold opioid manufacturers responsible for their role in creating the, nation, the nationwide opioid crisis. James's office is actively engaged right now to ensure mitigation of lead pollution at and around Reed Hillview Airport. He's advising on a first in the nation ban on the sale of leaded fuel. His office was successful on a national level to petition the EPA to evaluate whether leaded fuel used by airplanes is a threat to public health and welfare, which is a first step towards preparation of a federal regulation to curb the use of leaded aviation fuel. This is just a small sampling of the issues in which James has had a leadership role during his tenure as county council. There is perhaps no individual in our county who has a better grasp of the myriad issues that must be addressed to protect and serve our residents and his track record of fighting for racial equity, social justice, and an end to all forms of discrimination is abundantly clear. James understands our county, our community, and the inner workings of our government systems. He is not political and is a public servant in the truest sense of the word. The appointment of James Williams also ensures that urgent initiatives and projects that are already underway are not stalled and that community benefits are not delayed. I look forward to his tenure as a county executive who will follow and implement the will of the board and would make a motion at this time to approve the contract. I'm happy to second that. Thank you. Thank you.
Um, before I turn to Mr. Williams, I'm going to turn first to Supervisor Lee. Thank you, President Wasserman. Um, I just wanted to speak to the public that I want to assure that the board did not take this decision lightly as hiring the county executive is one of our chief responsibilities. I want to first thank to say thanks to the 30 plus organization that has signed on to the letter expressing the interest in this process and continuing to work with us on our racial justice work and others who have contacted my office about this issue. And I do agree with you that there should have been more open openness about this process. We should have received public input to make the process more transparent and we will do better. And now that we have an opening at the county council's office, we will definitely seek input from the community before the next appointment. I want to be clear that my concerns about the process is in no way a reflection of how I feel about the candidate who is ultimately selected to be our next county executive. The county is fortunate to have a very deep bench of talented staff and that we had the opportunity to promote an outstanding internal candidate without the expense of a costly executive search. Time and time again, James has demonstrated his commitment to serving this county from providing leadership and stewarding public communication during the early days of the pandemic to suing the Trump administration for litany of misinformed policies to leading the county's successful litigation strategy on redevelopment of solutions. He has served hundreds of all days rotating shifts to head the EOC during the COVID pandemic. Prior to that, he's also served our deputy county executive and this deep institutional knowledge and passion for the county are really important to keep our county moving forward. I look forward to seeing his transition to this leadership role and bring new energy to the challenges we face in mental health, homelessness, and strengthening the public safety net. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Smithian. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. You, Mr. Chair, you were, uh, I could tell, very purposeful about uh, articulating what uh, this item, item 41, which I believe we are now hearing and we have motion on, um, you were very purposeful, I could tell, in articulating what this um, item did and did not consist of. But I know from some of the communications I've received in my office that there's some confusion about that out in the community. And I wonder if, you know, uh, I, I guess I would ask uh, Dr. Smith, just because it seems a little awkward to ask Mr. Williams uh, to distinguish between um action that was appropriately taken in closed session uh and action that is appropriately taken in open session uh and uh, to make sure that it's it's out there in the public realm because i i, I do think there's been some e either confusion or misunderstanding uh about that and certainly before we uh take a vote uh we should make sure that that's clear and presumably we're going to hear from the public in a minute as well yes sir Yes, those are all correct. Okay, could turn, we could we ask? I'll turn yes to Dr. Smith now. If you could please uh, address what Supervisor Smithian just brought up about the distinction between what's enclosed, what's in open. Uh, yes, members of the board, um, the appointment um, of the county executive or any of the board appointees is done in closed session as well as yearly evaluations, any discipline or termination, because it is a personal issue, personnel issue. Um, so the appointment of um, James to the position was done in October. Um, the contract that you have before you um, merely um, deals with the reimbursement and other issues related to that. It's not the appointment. Um, the um, process of reviewing applicants in closed session is consistent with what's done in the past. When I was appointed, um, I only interviewed with the Board of Supervisors. Um, so. The appointment's done and the contract is before you and in that sense they're different. Thank you. Supervisor Smitty. No, I think that's helpful. I look forward to hearing from members of the public, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Jess, if you could please allow members of the public to speak up to two minutes each. Thank you. We'll put up a two minute timer. Our first speaker is Jason Dorsey. I've unmuted you. 
Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Thank you. As one of the SEIU uh, 521 vice presidents, more times than I can remember, I've seen every member of this board become frustrated when they learn that what actually goes on in the county's operations is not being done in the way that they want it done. That's a reflection on leadership style that has treated all stakeholders and sometimes even this board as obstacles rather than partners. I believe that this board wants to change that. I would urge you to use this process to make clear both what your needs, our needs, to be addressed and how to, the, the new CEO should function. It would be very well, it very well could be the same person that you've chosen. That's not my point. My point is that we need to think about what the new CEO would do and how they would do it. The process for naming this CEO should be an opportunity to assure that whoever is chosen is coming with the understanding, the plan, and the commitment that support the needed, support needed truly move to move this county forward. Rushing to name someone today with no public discussion squanders that opportunity, and I think that this board can do better. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Janet Diaz Perez. Please go ahead. Yes, if you could just hold, and Janet, if you just hold for one second. Supervisor Smidian, did you have an additional comment you wish to make? My apologies, just slow on the draw, sir. No, no worries. Go ahead, Jess. Janet, please go ahead and unmute. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. As a longtime county employee and president of SEIU Local 521, I know that our county operations face many serious challenges. For example, we have serious staffing issues throughout HHS, county comm, behavioral health, and social services, just to name a few. This means that every day, patients, residents, and employees are negatively impacted. These challenges will only be met with leadership that acknowledges they are real, understands the root causes that placed us in this situation, has a real plan to engage and address the, with stakeholders and has the support of this board, community and county employees. The process for naming a new CEO should be an opportunity to assure that whoever is chosen is coming in with the understanding, the plan, the commitment and the support needed to truly move our county forward. Rushing to name someone today with no public discussion squanders that opportunity. I think the board can do better. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Alan Kamara. Please go ahead. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. Again, this is Alan Kamara. Um, first, I wanna congratulate Dr. Smith on his retirement and wish him best. Um, and we hope you can spend time with your family and thank you for our collaboration. Um, I wanna preference my statement on behalf of our membership that this statement has nothing to do with Mr. Williams, nor are we trying to interfere with the process of the Board of Supervisors. We believe that you're all, you all elected into this position with the privilege to do exactly what you are doing. But just think about the process that you all went through just to be elected. And you all represent only one district in the county. Every one of you have one district that you represented. Uh, represent. um, Dr. Mr. Williams will be representing the entire county. It is the single most important hire of the county. I think with all the collective bargaining units in the county, we just feel it would have been reasonable to engage a partnership with us to make sure this process is more transparent and that everybody will be a public comment and discussion, allow community organizers to be part of this process. Um, we just hope that um, you all can reconsider saying you will reach out to the labor organizations in this county because any single appointment will affect the way we do business, it will affect our patient care, we will affect our membership that will stop. So we will appreciate and um, that you will do better next time. Thank you. 
Our next speaker is Bob Nunez. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, as the president for the NAACP and co-chair of a lot of us around table, I, I understand processes, uh, but I have to say that we really believe that you fell well short as the Board of Supervisors um, indicating to us that um, you have the right to make this selection. We understand that, but not asking us to sit down and, and talk to us about what we see as the needs and the priorities and, and our desires for that person in that position tells us you don't care. And I appreciate uh, Supervisor Lee saying that he liked to, he recognizes that and is willing to sit down and talk to us uh, for this next position we appreciate. Um, I, for one, don't know uh, the town of Council Williams, and I can't speak to that, but we started yesterday after we started talking about this position as to what really happened. And it was that uh, we think they're gonna talk about hiring someone to suddenly, they've hired someone and we're gonna set their salary. I think that, um, Dr. Smith started and included all of us, this community together in decisions, heard us out at least. And I would have hoped that the Board of Supervisors would have followed that same model. So I, for one, really am gonna miss Dr. Smith. And I would have hoped the Board of Supervisors would have learned by his example of what to do to fill his position. Yes, it's your role and your responsibility to fill it, but you could have asked us for our input first. Thank you very much. Next speaker is Antonio Cueva. Please go ahead. Greeting Board of Supervisors. Uh, my name is Antonio Cueva. I'm the Vice President of the Santa Clara County Correctional Peace Officers Association. Uh, first, I'd like to say congratulations to Ms. Dr. Smith. Uh, enjoy your retirement. Enjoy your, your time with your family. Uh, this is in no disrespect to Mr. Williams. Um, we just feel that the county should have conducted a public process for community members to engage in the hiring process and express their priorities in terms of qualifications of the next county executive. Um, thank you very much for your time and have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mary Gloner. Please go ahead. Good morning, thank you for the opportunity. I wanna share the proudest moment I had as a resident, as a community health professional dedicated to health parity and, and being a servant to our diverse communities when um, in 2020, um, this board, uh, the Board of Supervisors adopted a resolution that declared racism as a public health crisis. Um, I, I, this was the legacy that I was proud to be part of. And, and since then we've done, and the board has done wonderful work um, leading, whether um, elevating some institutional positions and roles, um, identifying ways to divert uh, from incarceration um, even now recently using a, a race equity tool. Um, but I, I, I feel, and we all know this, that with the lack of transparency, um, it really undermines all that work. And especially many of us in the community who's been working tirelessly to build, bridge relationships with um, communities who have historically distrusted government. To say we have allies and champions. And I wanna remind you, of this resolution, which you adopted. It was very bold and was very clear in our aspect about adopting, um, uh, engaging a community, how you appoint positions and so forth. So I look forward to our, our new county executive to uh, champion and ensure these um, areas are institutionalized. I look forward to our, our board of supervisor to be a champion and be accountable that these are not performative actions, but embrace and institutionalize in the work that we do. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is SDCN2. I've unmuted you. Please go ahead. Hi, I'm Kira Kazanza, CEO of Silicon Valley Council of Nonprofits. Um, first, I just want to take a second to thank Jeff Smith for his service. Um, SVCN and, and many of the nonprofits that we um, count as members wow. have very much appreciated his partnership with nonprofits, particularly during the pandemic. Um, and his very strong commitment to advancing racial justice in particular. So I wanted to take half a minute of my time for that. Second, I wanna speak on behalf of 33 nonprofit organizations that yesterday called for a public process around the hiring of a county executive. 
um, after we learned that this process was underway. Um, this request has nothing to do with Mr. Williams' qualifications or his commitment to the county and our community. Um, it's really more around um, transparency and, and, the, and our new way of doing business in local government and what I think our hopes and aspirations are with that level of co-creation with community. There are many precedents in governmental entities around seeking input in the hiring of critically important positions like this one, um, such as um, what was asked for and then delivered with the fairly recent hiring of the San Jose police chief. So since this um, appointment's already been made, we hope we can talk about doing better in the future. And we also hope that Mr. Williams um, will reach out to nonprofits and you know, even more importantly, the communities that we serve to hear more about our needs and to talk about commitments that can be made to <clears throat> it, um, protect these communities, to serve these communities and to advance racial justice in our community. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Marcus Barber. I've unmuted you, please go ahead. Marcus, your microphone is on. Please go ahead. Marcus, your microphone is on. We're not hearing any audio from you. I'm gonna come back around. Our next speaker is Walter Wilson. You'll have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Walter, good morning, uh, President Wasserman, Board of uh, Supervisors and staff. Um, I am extremely disappointed in the lack of public process involved with the selection of the new county executive. This promoting from inside potentially robs the public and the county of the opportunity to seek and interview potentially more qualified individuals sought countrywide. While your selected replacement for this process as the chief county counsel has worked for the county since 2016, the Board of Supervisors knows him well. However, few of any of these organizations that signed on to this letter um, has had the opportunity to work with or even know Mr. Williams. So to ask us, the public and community, simply trust your decision on this selection process with zero input from the community is not the process of inclusion that this board has been committed to. We believe that the county should conduct a national search to fulfill the county exec position um, to find the best and the brightest, of course. Should the best candidate still turn out to be an internal candidate, then so be it. But more importantly, the community should have the opportunity to participate in this process. Process matters, transparency matters, and we matter. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Elisa Koch Ginsborg. I've unmuted you, please go ahead. Thank you. Good morning, supervisors. Um, I just want to reiterate what others have said, that this is, comment is not a reflection on Mr. Williams, but the manner of this appointment of the next county executive is a missed opportunity. Many organizations choose to undertake a process of public engagement to listen to diverse communities about their priorities to inform major hiring decisions. To not do so sends a message to stakeholders and those who see themselves as partners that their opinion and experiences are not of value in a very important decision. This makes healthy, productive, collaborative relationships all the more difficult. I hope that Mr. Williams will take the time to engage in listening sessions and to hear from the many different diverse groups about their priorities as he takes leadership of this county. Thank you. And that concludes our request to speak. Thank you, Jess, and thank you, speakers. Um, we have a motion on the floor right now from Vice President Ellenberg, seconded by myself. I'd like to call for the question and then hear from Mr. Williams. Oh, so, excuse me, Supervisor Chavez, I see your hand raised. Thank you. Um, and thank you, colleagues, and um, for those who came to speak. And I want to start by um, just making an observation and in saying that what I'm about to say is um, somewhat uh, painful. And, and it's painful because whenever you have disagreements with people you deeply, deeply respect, it, you always have to ask yourself why and whether or not what you're saying is right or wrong. My first observation is that we as a, a society and as a community have come a long way since when Dr. Smith was first appointed. And what I mean by that is by going through 
uh, COVID together by um, experiencing uh, George Floyd responding with the Health Equity Task Force, OCLEM, we, that we've taken actions to be more, much more inclusive in terms of the community than perhaps we had done before as an agency. I, and I, I want to juxtapose that with the situation that we're in right now, which is that I absolutely agree with um, the point you raised, Supervisor Ellenberg, about the responsibility that that we have as a board to make this decision. I think that's right. The decision belongs with the board. I don't think it tarnishes our decision to get input from the community. And I think that what what the table we've set um, has been with the idea that we're gonna expand our processes to be more inclusive. And to James, um, I think that I'm, I'm gonna have this conversation absent you for just a moment and make some observations about you and then, and then uh, share my vote with my colleagues. There is no doubt in my mind that um, James Williams is, is an extraordinary leader. He is ethical, he is thoughtful, he is creative. He works extremely hard. He's very honest and he does what he thinks is best for the county as a whole over and over and over again. My belief is that had we gone through a thorough process and searched the world over, we would have ended up with James um, Williams. So I, that, to me, that's not really the issue before us. And I think the issue here is that that the person who's in this position will likely be in it for a long time, that it's really one of the most important actions that we will take as a board, and that, that we are missing an opportunity to continue to engage the community. Um, we had, when this um, came to us, I, I had reservations. I wanted to make sure that, um, James, you didn't misunderstand my and the community doesn't misunderstand my commitment to you. Um, I will not be voting for the action today before the board because I want the community to understand that we heard you, that we can do better, and that I do think we have an obligation to be as open as we can be, even in decisions that are primarily those before the board. I think that we are different now than we were um, when Dr. Smith came here. And I talked a little bit about all the reasons and all the issues facing us. It is my expectation that James will be on a listening tour with our nonprofits and our labor partners. It would never have occurred to me that he would have just walked in without doing all of that good work. And I know we're all gonna give him a list of who we want him to be with. If I had my druthers today, what I would be asking my colleagues, I know there's a motion and a second on the, on the floor and I've heard most of you speak, so I know where the vote is going. What I would have asked my colleagues to do is defer this action for two weeks and let James have those conversations because I have no doubt that James would win over hearts and minds in our community. Um, but given that I see where this vote is going and that that is not um, likely to pass, I am just going to make this request that, I mean, I, I don't, James, I'm even gonna make the request. I know you're gonna do all that work. Um, but just to say to my um, to the nonprofits, I appreciate that and our labor partners that it's a scary thing to come forward when you know that someone's going to be appointed and be worried about um, whether or not that puts you in bad stead with the board or with um, with Mr. Williams. And I want to assure you that that's not the case, that you are you are among people who really do deeply care about what you think and what you feel. And I do believe the board, um, is making a decision that they, every one of us, that we, that is best for the county. Um, but my no vote is really in uh, reflecting that I hear you, that absolutely we need to do better. And that even those decisions that are most critical to us, including the budget, require us to do a much better job of listening to the community and, res and demonstrating that we respect our partnership uh, by changing the way we do business in every way that we do it. Uh, so colleagues, I will be a no vote, but James, I want you to know that I have no doubt at all um, that you will do a great job and that you'll learn and continue to get better year after year after year. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you, Supervisor Chavez. 
All right, Jess, um, I'm calling for the question. Roll call vote, please. Supervisor Lee? Aye. Supervisor Chavez? No. Supervisor Sumidian? Aye. Vice President Ellenberg? Aye. President Wasserman? Aye. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, with that, Mr. Williams, I'm turning to you. Thank you, President Wasserman. Thank you, members of the board. I want to first just thank the board for your confidence and support in me as I take on this new role. It's been an extraordinary privilege to serve the board and the county as the county council, and I'm excited and really looking forward to doing so in a different way as the county executive. We have an incredible team of talented and dedicated public servants, and I look forward to working with them and the board to bring the board's priorities to fruition for the benefit of our entire community. I'm often asked in interviews when we're hiring people uh, into the county council's office or even otherwise, uh, why uh, I choose to work here at the county. And my answer is always the same. I love working at the county because I care so deeply about its mission and its people to serve the community and providing core safety net services to work on issues of local and national significance in terms of equity and social justice. These are important and exciting challenges that matter so much to the lives and well-being of so many families. I'm also very excited to meet with the many people and organizations that are so critical to how we deliver vital county services over this transition period. And I recognize that it's obviously the many, many thousands of dedicated county employees, including our labor partners, uh, that make the work of this organization happen, and also our many CBOs that are a core part of our broader safety net. And so I look forward to having those meetings and conversations, to getting to know many more people than I've had occasion to uh, in my more legally focused role as county council. Uh, and uh, I'm very excited to be stepping into this role on behalf of the board and the county organization and to serve the broader community uh, in this new way. So thank you so much uh, and um, look forward to uh, many, many more partnerships, collaboration and conversations. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Your contract is approved. That was item number nine. We move on to item 10. But Jess, I believe that was held to November 15th. So we would move on to item number 11, but that's a time certain of one o'clock, the uh, COVID update. So now we're gonna move on to item 12, uh, which was a referral, I believe, Supervisors Ellenberg and Lee. One of you needs to- Sure, yes. Uh, there you go. I, I'm happy to do it. This referral, um, I hope, is, is very straightforward to everyone. It directs our intergovernmental relations team to affirm our commitment to both adult and child mental health through support of federal advocacy lever, lev, letters and to ask staff to come back with focused policy priorities at the state and federal level. To be fully successful locally in responding to the behavioral health crisis, we of course need policies and resources from federal and state partners. And I hope that a proactive and coordinated approach to advocacy by members of this board and our county IGR team guided by experts in our departments, including behavioral health, Valley Medical, custody health can be leveraged in the next legislative cycle. I wanna thank Supervisor Lee for his continued partnership with me on behavioral health issues, uh, which I know this entire board continues to prioritize and elevate in various ways. And that we'll discuss more of course in items later in today's agenda. So with that, I would make a motion to approve this referral and turn to Supervisor Lee for a hoped for second. Thank you. We have a motion, Supervisor Lee, do you wish to speak? And then Supervisor Chavez has, do you wish to second? And then Supervisor Chavez- Absolutely, I would like to second and speak if I may, President Wasserman. You go right ahead and then we'll go Supervisor Chavez. Yes, thank you. I would like to thank Supervisor, Supervisor Ellenberg for highlighting another important aspect of our work to address mental health and substance abuse right here in Santa Clara County. As our county continues to develop plan and work on projects to improve our behavior health system of care, we really need to make sure we have county administrations actively advocating at the state and federal levels to support our local behavior health efforts. Our county staff and providers are working tirelessly 
to set the mental health substance abuse issues that our county residents deal with, and they are doing really God's work. So I'm hoping that our joint referral will better position our county to receive the help we need from our state and federal levels of government. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Chavez. Yes, thank you. You know, um, I think this is a really important uh, framework, and I want to thank Susan and, um, and Otto for bringing it forward, because absolutely this issue around how we're getting how this gets sustainable is so, so critical. One question that I have um, is that at a national level, does, does NACO work with the national um, uh, labor movement health partners? And I ask that because a lot of our success relative to reimbursements has really come through that collaboration with the primary um, unions that are playing leadership roles in this work. Do you know the answer to that? So I, I don't know offhand, but um, the NACO, current NACO president is uh, Supervisor James Williams from Sonoma, and I'm happy to text him right now and see if I can quickly get you an answer. And what I was going to ask um, Supervisor Allenberg and um, Supervisor Lee, if you wouldn't mind, if we could just add a D that adds that that labor partnership to, because I think what you're really trying to do is make sure we're kind of on all on all cylinders um, fighting for reimbursements and changing the way we're reimbursing. Um, I would just add that we have to engage our labor partners as well, just because I think they've had success both in the state and federal level. Absolutely. Yes. All right. Great. Glad Thank, you. Thank you. We have those. We have one member of the public, Jess, if you could please recognize that person for two minutes. Two minutes. Thank you. Yep. Our first speaker is Blair Beekman. I've unmuted you. You'll have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Hi, Claire Beekman here. Uh, I've been busy this morning. Um, it's been a pretty heavy day for yourselves. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to kind of be around the Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors public process. Uh, thank you a lot for this item. Uh, you know, good luck. Uh, we're we're going to be uh, addressing, I think, in the next five years, uh, we're, we're, gonna, we're entering a new way to address mental health issues, uh, substance abuse issues. And uh, a real good luck to ourselves how we consider the ideas of care and education, because uh, I know that, uh, you know, fentanyl use may actually be like headed for like even higher uh, rates of rising up and stuff in the next few years. And we really have to stress the importance of education, I think. And uh, so good luck how that can take place. And, Justin, I, I really hope that we we have a real soft approach in, in what we're going to be working on in the next decade, and uh, it, we need it. And and I and I know you guys feel that and understand that, and it, and there's hits and misses and how to work that way, and what we'll be addressing, and, and good luck how we will be doing that because it's really important to do that. <laughs> And uh, it will be hopefully a good learning process for all of us. And, and, and to get you know, the everyday community involved with, with their own healing, uh, good luck how to uh, consider those ideas and work towards those ideas and make it a, a, an engaging process uh, for everyday community to want to address their mental health concerns and so they don't feel trapped and, the, and their substance abuse issues so they don't feel trapped. And that's uh, it's a skill to learn. Good luck how we can be learning such things uh, with this sort of programming. Thank you. Thank you, Blair. That concludes our request. Thank you, Jess. We have a motion on the floor by Vice President Ellenberg, a second by Supervisor Lee. There was a friendly amendment to Supervisor Chavez approved by the motion maker and the seconder. Before I call for the vote, Supervisor Chavez, you have your hand raised. Oh, I apologize. Thank you. No worries. Jess, vote please. Supervisor Lee? Aye. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Samidian? Aye. Vice President Ellenberg? Yes. President Wasserman? Yes. Thank you, Jess. Board members, that was item number 12. 13 was approved in consent, as was item 14 in consent. And also in consent, it was asked that 15, 16, 17, and 18 we heard together, we're going to start with 15, which is a uh, report for Consuelo Hernandez, our director of the Office of Supportive Housing. It's a report on the use of Measure A funds. Consuelo, I'm, or I see Natalie. 
Good morning, President Wasserman and members of the board. As a few of you know, I um, am still a little under the weather, uh, so pardon me that I'm not on video, um, but very excited, as some of you might remember, five years ago, we presented to the, the board the first round of Measure A projects. And today, um, I'm uh, very thrilled to introduce Natalie Monk, our Housing and Community Development Division Director, uh, to present to you round 10. Natalie? Natalie. Thank you, Consuelo. This is the administration's 19th report on the implementation of the 2016 Measure A housing bond. We are now halfway through our 10 year bond and we'd like to highlight some key accomplishments. If the board I'm, gonna, I'm gonna interrupt you just one second, Natalie. Again, we're hearing 15, 16, 17 and 18 together. Anybody wishing to speak on these items, you can register electronically. Please go ahead, Natalie. Thank you. If the board approves the two multifamily rental housing developments, the board will have approved $643 million towards 47 housing developments across nine cities, which represents 4,363 new apartments, 484 renovated apartments, and 205 ACK rehab units, which is over 5,000 units in total. This includes the recent approval of 330 Distal Circle in Los Altos and recognizing the acquisition and conversion of the Crestview Hotel into permanent housing. Of these, over 2,200 are set aside for homeless individuals and families. The board has approved $25 million towards the Empower Home Buyers Program, which has helped 46 households purchase their first home. We've negotiated five MOUs with cities and other partners to accelerate housing development. And we also wanted to take the opportunity to recognize our informal coordination with the cities of Morgan Hill, Santa Clara, and San Jose. While we don't have a formal MOU with these cities, we continue to work closely on the development of more housing with them. When all developments are in operation, we'll have new permanent housing for approximately 14,500 people, including approximately 5,000 formerly unhoused individuals and family members. Right on. Since 2015, the supportive housing system has helped house 20,000 people primarily through tenant-based rental assistance and through minimal interventions like one-time financial assistance. As a result of scaling the production of supportive housing, the administration anticipates seeing an increase in the number of people housed annually through site-based housing units. For example, there are four developments that have started lease-up activities for 185 supportive housing units estimated to serve 240 previously unhoused people. Figure one summarizes the impact of supportive housing production relative to the growth of supportive housing programs that rely on tenant-based rental assistance and existing housing stock. We have to expand both efforts concurrently because there's simply not enough affordable housing units in the marketplace to support the need. Uh, you'll hear more about these challenges during the Heading Home update as part of your agenda today. Uh, today, we're asking for the board's approval to fund three proposed developments that would yield 242 new units of permanent, affordable, and supportive housing and 14 new for sale townhomes. The mill on Main is being developed by the core companies. This 220 unit transit oriented development has 24 units set aside as rapid rehousing and 20 units set aside for individuals with intellectual and or developmental disabilities and their families. Pavilion Inn is being developed by Jamboree Housing. The housing authority and Jamboree have been awarded approximately $14.3 million in home key funds from the state. The county is funding 21 permanent supportive housing units for transition aged youth within this project. And the third project is the county's first new construction home ownership development, which we would like to highlight today. Okay, uh, so Jackson Avenue Townhomes is the first affordable home ownership project to apply through our NOPA. The project is being developed by Habitat for Humanity and has 14 for sale homes. Five of these will be sold to very low income buyers, seven to low income buyers, and two to moderate income buyers. 
As background, the board approved updated NOFA guidelines on November 16th of 2021. These updates included adding type six, a new eligible project type for the production of new affordable for sale homes. The project type was added because homeownership is associated with many benefits, including housing security, educational achievement, and the ability to build wealth. The county is committed to addressing the widening wealth gap in our community. However, there are a number of barriers to purchasing a home, which are challenging for all buyers and commonly become insurmountable for lower income households. Very low income buyers typically cannot compete with market rate home buyers and barriers include the high cost of housing and our limited housing stock, significant down payment and credit requirements to obtain financing, and a highly competitive market where buyers must waive significant contingencies, offer quick closes, and compete against all cash offers in order to be con considered seriously. This homeownership model allows lower income households to become homeowners and build equity while keeping the homes affordable to subsequent buyers and increasing the county's housing stock. Through previous actions, the board has approved 39 new construction developments, totaling 4,143 new units, six previously approved ACK rehab developments for 667 units. And with today's action, the two proposed multifamily rental developments will bring our total to 5,052 units of affordable and supportive housing, bringing our total housing bond allocation to approximately 640 million. On average, the county's contribution is approximately $125,000 per unit, and for every dollar in housing bond funds, over $4 in over funds are, and other funds are being leveraged. To date, the county has helped 46 households achieve home ownership for the first time through Empower Home Buyers. We've helped developers purchase 15 sites for affordable and supportive housing, and we've funded 47 projects in nine cities which is 85% of our goal. Finally, this slide has a quote from Frank Miller who lives at the Calabasas Community Apartments Development. At the grand opening, he told us, it's never too late to find your home, a place where you're always meant to be. And that's what our housing bond is helping people do. Uh, we also just wanna take a moment to thank all of our development partners, supportive service providers, staff from the nine cities and county staff from the clerk of the board to county council and our office of supportive housing team who make all of this possible. None of us can solve these issues on our own and the progress that we've made over the past five years is really a testament of what we can accomplish when we work together. That concludes our report. Happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Natalie. I'm looking for hands raised. I don't see any at this time. Oop, I see one by Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. I, I'm going to thank the staff for this just really comprehensive report. Can we go to um, slide three? And thank you for numbering the slides. Yes. <laughs> Mike and I just passed pet peeve there. Okay. On on slide um, on slide three, this this chart represents the um, the development, and let me ask you, is this our measure A and non-measure A, all the work the county's been doing since 2015? I can take the question, Supervisor Chavez. Yes, um, the 2,700 number is our measure A and no place like home funding. It does not include our the $40 million the, the board approved for IDD housing, nor does it include 231 Grant Avenue. You know, one of the um, one thing that I would just like to request, I think this would be important for the county to have a, a fulsome picture since we since we began the um, the housing first model um, to be able to look at general fund dollars as well, because based on what you just said, Consuelo, this would not um, have renaissance place in it either. Is that correct? This does actually include um, renaissance place supervisor Chavez um, in 2015 is when that project um, first started as the supportive housing development and it opened in 2020. So we do include um, the actions that happened through the unhoused task force in 2015, which allocated uh, general funds, I think the total amount was about 16.4 million that was allocated to renaissance. 
Um, I think what would be helpful is that that that's that then means that we are showing um, general fund investments in some capacity. And what I would just suggest is that in one place, there would be value in us looking at all of our investments and what the product type was um, that includes measure A, non-measure A, you know, the, the and, and I think that's a good point about what we got from the state. And the reason is that, um, and to do it on the timeline, and the reason is that we need to better understand both as a county, um, but also countywide, I, I mean this as a county entity, but also countywide, what the actual impact is to the new products coming online or the renovated products relative to all the other work that the that the um, the homeless uh, community uh, is working on relative to how fast we're getting people housed and where we're getting them placed. I think that would be a lot of value. And then the other thing I would just add, colleagues, is that on another slide, um, and, and let's maybe we can go to Jackson Avenue. The, I'm sorry, the, this would be page um, five. Um, on this product, I'm, is this first time home buyer money, the other 25 million being used? It is part of the 100 million that was set aside for workforce housing. Ah, okay. So the board has not allocated the remaining 25 million um, that was set aside for, um, not set aside for, but it was um, included for the first time home buyer program. We have not programmed that. We are working on returning to the board later this year with a recommendation of how to re how to use that money. Thank you. And colleagues, the reason I'm asking that question is that um, I, I think it's totally appropriate for the 100 million to be used uh, in the most flexible way to get uh, people housed. I will say that what I would want to make sure of with the Jackson Avenue is that we're treating that um, this opportunity as a way, and, and maybe um, Consuelo or Natalie, if you could just share how this functions. If that, if the, if the, if this stays permanently um, ready for another uh, lower income buyer to buy in as they get some you know, create some wealth for themselves to be able to move on and buy something additional. Is that how this will work? Yes, there's resale restrictions as well, Supervisor Chavez. Got it. So um, I think if if it's possible, um, I, I, I when the when the last 25 come back, I think it would be important to take a look at this model relative to any other um, opportunities that you bring back. And in particular, one that I'm interested in determining is whether or not the subsidies just need to be higher for the, the, the home purchases because of the cost of housing. And, and for me, the whatever it makes it faster for people to be able to get into permanent I'm sorry, into a for sale product is going to be as important as, you know, make obviously making sure that they can afford it and that there's an ability again for people to get a rate of return, but for the county also to be able to refill the bucket for first time home buyers. So, you know, as an example, colleagues, like if we're spending 17% of the, the, you know, the down payment and we're asking people to do 3%, does that potentially mean that we need to have a higher rate from us and still keep them at 3% so that we can get more people into housing just because the housing market's prices are so um, volatile. I mean, they're going up, but they're still volatile. That would be something I'd be very interested in when this comes back to the board. Is that Supervisor Chavez? Did you have further comments? I just wanted to ask the staff if, that's, if that is what will be coming back. Thank you, Supervisor Chavez. The portion of the update to the board related to Empower and First Time Home Buyer Program, we're projected to come back to the board in early 2023. Ah, uh, okay. And that, that's perfect. And then one last point, colleagues, is that the um the number of people that fall into the 120% of AMI, you know, each of these categories would be important to know through the process that the housing trust has, how how many 
people are we getting of what income type that are interested in first, the first time home buyer program? Because I think that would help us also determine the, the bandwidth of that program. And then lastly, the other reason I was asking about our general fund dollars is that if, if the county is keep staying with the um, 120%, for example, of AMI, irrespective of the source of the funds, I would want to understand that or whether or not the, the um, staff would be recommending exceeding 120% of AMI for particular types of housing. And in particular, colleagues, what I'm concerned about is that uh, some time ago when we started to do the initial outreach on the first time home buyer program, we had uh, uh, couples that were both teachers, maybe a professor and a teacher, just slightly outside of that 120 range because we also pay people very differently than other parts of the country because of the housing costs. It's kind of a, an ongoing problem. So I just wanted to understand what the staff would be thinking about at, when that other body of work comes back in terms of who's asking, who's in line, and then who are we missing? Thank you, colleagues. Thank you. By the way, Oops, congratulations. Yes. I'm sorry, Mike. I should have started by saying to the staff, what an amazing body of work that you've accomplished. Wow. And um, just you know, look forward to the rest of the reports. Yes, that sheet, page two or three, the, the summary of all that's happened and happening is just phenomenal. Very, very proud to be associated with that. Thank you very much. And Consuelo, I hope you feel better soon. Item 15 was to receive a report. It's items 16, 17, and 18 that we're hearing all together that are action items regarding approving delegation. Um, we can turn now to 16. The speakers who we have right now, Jess, have the opportunity to speak once uh, on these items, 15, 16, 17, and 18. Since they've registered already, I think I should recognize them and give them the opportunity if they wish to speak. And again, it would be on items 15, 16, 17, and 18. For two minutes? Yes, ma'am. Our first speaker is Blair Beekman. I've unmuted you. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. These are on the housing items, correct? Yes. Oh, great. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, quickly offer that uh, as with the previous item about approving uh, new funding for uh, mental health and, and, and drug treatment programs and such, uh, for this sort of item, as you move forward into, its, uh, into housing ideas and, and philosophies, don't be afraid to uh, notice that as you're starting programs and projects and ideas that uh, you can make adjustments and changes to, to those things and to learn how in making uh, quick adjustments. I think that's an important skill that hopefully in the next uh, few years we can better learn how to do and uh, making those quick adjustments uh, can add a lot to the process and finding and knowing that we're maybe going the wrong way and adjusting from that. Thanks a lot for your time. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Sparky Harlan. Please go ahead. Hey, Sparky. Hi, Sparky Harlan, CEO, Bill Wilson Center. I'm here to speak on the Pavilion Inn. As we know these days, Bill Wilson Center started with this project with the city of San Jose. In order to make these deals happen, it takes a lot of uh, actors involved, and this one is very complicated. I thank the Housing Authority, City of San Jose, OSH, and the providers, but one thing that often is the unintended consequences is when we have too many providers providing services on site. And we've seen this with Peacock Commons. Bill Wilson Center provides services to two thirds of the residents and the behavior health department serves eight. Those clients never can find their Mental Health Services Act uh, caseworkers, they always come to us. And it's really difficult at times to say, sorry, that's not us, call this number. Often those uh, units are vacant and they're permanent housing, whereas ours are always full. So I just say that when I look at the permanent supportive housing service provider, I would make sure we start looking at trying to get one provider at these locations so everybody feels like they can know who to go to instead of multiple providers because they don't know to go to the county to go to mental health to go to bill wilson center abode and so it'd be easier just to have one 
provider on site, but this will happen. This is for youth aging out of foster care for Bill Wilson Center's units. It will come on site after I retire, like Jeff Smith. I'm retiring actually earlier in March, um, but I just urge you to look at trying to consolidate providers at these locations in the future. Thank you. Thanks, Sparky. Congratulations on your retirement too. Our next speaker is Paul Soto. Please go ahead. Paul Soto, you'll need to turn your microphone on. There you go. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. I'm gonna give you a, a very clear statistic to, to keep in mind. From 2016 to this past quarter, this recent quarter, market rate housing goals have been met in the city of San Jose, 95 to 115% of the time, year over year, quarter after quarter, from 2016 till now. In that same time period, the threshold of 25% of housing goals, year after year, quarter after quarter, from 2016 till now, for ELI, VLI, and everybody else has never broken 25%. Now, I don't care about your flowery language. I don't care about your rhetoric because your rhetoric is meaningless, okay? Supervisor Chavez is sitting there and just spending, yeah, 100 mil here, 50 mil there, like it's her money. This ain't your money, uh, Supervisor Chavez, okay? And you're already given an indication of what you would be doing if you were mayor of the city. Okay, and so I'm gonna make absolutely certain everything that I can do in my power to make absolutely certain that that never happens, that it never happens, that you never get anywhere near that mayor's seat because of the kind of behavior that you have displayed here within the, com the compromises of the BTA, housing, and your relationship with South Bay Labor Council and you hiring Ben Fields as your executive director. Okay, I remember Ben Fields. So, as there, these issues relate to housing, the decisions that are made are being corrupted because what you're actually doing is you're not, you're not creating a means by which people can generate wealth. What you are doing is trying to put a Band-Aid over the generational impacts of redlining and that, how that has affected specifically the Chicano community. There are generations of Chicanos here in this city that still need reparations and I'm demanding them on behalf of that community. Our next speaker is Rocio Molina. Please go ahead. Hi, this is Rocio. I am from Catalyze as be the community engagement manager. And first off, definitely want to congratulate Natalie and team at the Office of Support of Housing the great work that they've done with Measure A. We have worked in community with this who inform the public and the community about the wonderful impacts of the funding. And we've received a lot of feedback about community awareness about, you know, the very complex development process. Um, and so one thing that we will be doing in 2023 is do more educational events and, and to prepare the public to engage on this conversation by in them about what is AMI, what are various aspects of supportive housing, what are various aspects of affordable housing, and fully for them to have engaged founders and decision makers. Um, we definitely want to see all of this wonderful development and investment happening in the county, and we want to make sure that the community is prepared to accept and absorb that impact. And so that means, you know, spreading the word in a really digestible way for the public. And so we look forward to continuing to work with the Office of Supportive Housing, the supervisors, and the new executive to continue to build educational and engagement programs in the development process so that we as a community can hopefully alleviate some of these pains and, and address some of these concerns in a really informed way. Thank you so much for all of your work, everyone. Thank you. Next speaker is Sharon Luna. Please go ahead. Hello, everyone. I just have a question, and I think Supervisor uh, Chavez touched on it a little bit. But um, as a taxpayer, I, I would like to know, um, does the county uh, pro is providing taxpayer dollars to support this program? And I'm curious if loans are taken out, um, who gets paid back? Does the county get um, 
a return on their investment or does it go back to um, the nonprofits? Um, who is held accountable? Um, I guess I'm curious as far as who owns the home until the loan is paid back um, to keep these wonderful programs going. Um, I'm not sure um, how this um, is handled, but we have so many nonprofit um, dealing with the housing and it's getting a little confusing as far as how the taxpayer dollars are being accounted for um, with uh, some of the housing groups that are trying to um, alleviate this housing crisis. But again, how is the county being accountable to ensure that, that th those tax dollars are kept to rejuvenate um, some of these housing projects? And is there a return on investment for the county? Thank you. Thank you for your question. Next. That concludes our speakers. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. I don't see any hands raised. Um, Natalie, we did have a question answered. Is it something that you can answer simply? Super, um, Board President Wasserman, perhaps I can jump in um, if the question is related to our returns. Yes. Just to give you an example of the for Empower Home Buyers, of the 46 homes that have been purchased, on average, um, those households have received a little over $116,000 for their down payment. We have received repayment um, of $338,000, which includes an equity share to the county of $41,000, which allows us to issue two new loans, if you will, um, to almost three new loans to eligible home buyers. So mm -hmm. we do have um, and recycle the funding, and it's very similar on the multifamily housing side. Um, we have residual receipt loans that are issued. Um, and I would also say to the public uh, who is interested in learning more about how we've been using the housing bond funds, the Oversight Committee has a wonderful website um, that they manage. It's hosted out of our office website, um, but they own the page and they show exactly where the money is. Um, being used and yes, thank you. Thank you, that is a great website, I agree. Thank you very much. Board members, this was item 15, which is to receive a report. We're hearing 16, 17 and 18 together. Um, I'm gonna to toss a motion out there to approve 16, 17 and 18. I'll second. Approval of the various delegations. I think all this is excellent work. Thank you, Supervisor Lee for your second. Uh, Supervisor Chavez. Yeah, thank you. I um, I think that I just want to confirm because you said that a little quick. This is 15, 16, 17, and 18, correct? Yes, it is. Okay, then I do have a question on, on um, 18. Thank you. We have a motion. We have a second. So I'll turn to you, Supervisor Chavez, for your question. This was the item we were, we were just speaking about, but I wanted to make sure that I understood the numbers in, the, in this report, and that is that the the per door cost for this final product is 800, a little $833,000 um, per door. And then there was another number that looked at um, bedroom door and that was a, six, a 655 number around that, around that cost. Um, for each project, um, I know we're, we're looking at total cost and total bedroom cost as well. Um, is that, is that, something that we can ask the staff to break down a little bit because what I would like to see on our website is what we're spending for the um, the permanent housing, how long we anticipate it to house folks and what we think the average utilization will be and do the same with the interim or the tiny homes or the the more, I don't know what you call it, but the 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 our shelter strategy as well. And the reason is that I do think um, in part, honestly, because of the election, there's a lot of confusion about what we're investing in, what's the best use of money and what we can invest in. And at some point, I think we just need to respond to that and make sure that the public uh, knows the answer to those questions. As Sharon just asked, there should be an easy way for us to send people to a, a page that can explain all of that. But I think these numbers are particularly important. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. All righty, Consuelo, you heard that suggestion? Yes, thank you, Board President Wasserman. Thank you very much. Supervisor Chavez, your hand still raised? Oh, I apologize, thank you. No worries. Jess, uh, roll call vote, please, to approve 15, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18. I believe not 14, not 15 through 18. Excuse me, you're right, 15 through 18, four items. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Lee? Aye. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. Vice President Ellenberg? Yes. President Wasserman? Yes, as well. And so happy to see those things done. All right. It is 10 minutes of 12. I'm looking for a couple more items. Let's see. We'll move on to item 19 is the quarterly report from the Office of Supportive Housing relating to the Heading Home campaign. Board members, are you in favor of hearing item 19 and then breaking for lunch? Vice President Ellenberg, your hand is raised. I, I am happy to do that. Also wanted to see if they wanted to do a presentation or if um, we'd like to go right to questions. It's an exciting report. Thank you. And it was a great PowerPoint that was provided to us. I appreciate that. Hillary? Thank you, Board President Wasserman um, and Supervisor Vice President Ellenberg. Um, while we do have a presentation prepared, we're happy to defer to you. Um, we can deliver the presentation or just jump into questions. Let me look to my colleagues to you if, if anyone Thank wants you. to present. Let me look to my colleagues and see if anyone wants to do that. Supervisor Chavez. I actually think we should do the presentation. I think this is actually one of the problems we have with this. It's so complicated and we're doing so many different programs that the public doesn't know. So I would like a brief presentation. Totally fine. Thank but. you. Let me um, first, uh, sorry, Hillary, I'll, I'll hand it over to you in one second, I promise. Um, as the board is aware, um, we launched the Heading Home campaign last October um, in response to a board referral from Supervisor Ellenberg, um, which asked us a, a pretty honest question, you know, how do families navigate um, the system, um, particularly families that are homeless, who have young children, and particularly those that are un unhoused and pregnant. Um, so we've been working through the campaign with our partners. I'm really happy to share this report with you. Also wanted to introduce Hillary Armstrong on our team, who is our new program manager managing our housing initiatives. Um, and so now I'll hand it over so that she can give you a presentation to show Thank our process. You. Thank you, Consuelo. And Hillary, if you'll pause just a minute, two, two housekeeping items I need. Supervisor Chavez and Ellenberg, your hands are raised. Did you have additional comments? I'm no? happy to wait until the end of the presentation. Okay, thank you. And um, I'm notifying the clerk's office just this way that after this item is open, we will break for lunch just to give you early notice. Thank you. Go ahead, please, Hillary. Good morning, Board President Wasserman and members of the Board of Supervisors. Thank you for having us today for this third quarterly update and annual report on the first year of our Heading Home campaign. We launched this campaign one year ago with the goal of ending family homelessness by 2025. And this is in alignment with the many goals and strategies set forth in the 2020 to 2025 community plan to end homelessness. Here on this side, we're highlighting the four core strategies that we are leveraging in these first years of the Heading Home campaign, which include the emergency housing vouchers through the Santa Clara County Housing Authority, expanding our rapid rehousing programs, expanding expanding and strengthening our homelessness prevention services and increasing affordable and supportive housing development for families and our core partners among many are obviously the county of santa clara and the office of supportive housing destination home the housing authority of santa clara county and the city of san jose we also work with numerous nonprofit partners and private funders to achieve the goals of this campaign we wanted to share some of our first year highlights. And one of the you know, amazing things that our team has been able to accomplish is when we first launched this campaign, we had more than 500 unhoused families with children who were waiting on what we call the community queue, which is they've been assessed for housing services. They are unhoused and in need of housing. 
Um, and so there were 500 families waiting to be matched with a housing program. And today, all of the eligible families on the community queue have been enrolled and matched with a housing program. And that includes um, 478 families with children who obtained permanent housing over the first year of the campaign, which includes 937 children, so nearly 1,000 children. We also have 375 additional families with children who've been issued emergency housing vouchers and are searching for their housing. And as Natalie pointed out in the Measure A presentation, this is certainly not without its challenges. And as we talk about next steps for the campaign, we can tell you a little bit more about what we're thinking. But just as we highlighted in the report, the vacancy rates in Santa Clara County are extremely low and in particular for larger units. And I think the board is well aware of some of the challenges that voucher holders have sometimes searching for housing. So this is certainly an area of focus. We've also been able to increase nightly temporary shelter capacity by an additional 140 units. And one of the things that I think is most significant for families is that we've been able to reduce the waiting time from assessment for permanent housing referral um, to actually getting that referral, like that voucher in hand, from 45 days to 11 days. Um, and this is certainly due to this infusion of resources. And so going forward, um, you know, our ability to maintain that will depend on kind of what's available. I'll go to the next slide. We also wanted to highlight some of the new and affordable supportive housing for families that is coming online over the next two years. Um, and so you're seeing pictured on your screen the Quetzal Gardens um, a, a complex in San Jose, which has 28 supportive housing units for families and 43 affordable housing units for families. And we have a number of other, um, other complexes opening over the next year and a half um, in various parts of our county um, that will have these uh, supportable and affordable housing units for families. And so we're at about 471 of these new units um, toward our goal of 1,000 units before 2025. We next wanted to walk you through our dashboard, um, and this dashboard is attached also separately to the report um, with kind of some explanation. Um, this first side of the dashboard just highlights overall progress on housing families with children over the first year of the campaign, and also our homelessness prevention services, which were provided to 1,176 families with children in the last year. The next slide highlights the number of families who were placed into permanent housing month by month and also shows the board and the public the range of assessment. So when folks come in needing housing, um, they go through, I think, what some of you know as the um, coordinated assessment process. And so about 40% of those folks need permanent supportive housing, about 55% need rapid rehousing, and about 7% need just you know, some some help getting um, like uh, rental assistance or case management to get back on their feet. And this graph here that we um, wanted to highlight for you really shows how that wait time has reduced for folks. This is just for the public and the board to be aware of kind of where families throughout our system are enrolled. And so this is not tied specifically to the time period of this campaign, but it's a snapshot moment in time of where families are. And as the board requested, we wanted to provide the demographics for the families who were housed through the first year of the Heading Home campaign. And so this uh, first, this slide shows um, the demographics for those 478 families who, who have gotten into their permanent housing. And a couple of things to highlight here are that 80% um, of those families nearly have a female head of household and about 62% are Latinx. So we wanted to let the board know what we're thinking about next steps along with all of our partners for the campaign. And I think one of the most pressing things um, is this continued enrollment of the eligible families into the emergency housing voucher program before the December 31st deadline. These were the thousand vouchers that um, the Santa Clara County Housing Authority received. And so uh, we are well on the way with um, as of last week, 761 applications submitted and our team is working day and night to submit these applications. So we anticipate meeting that deadline. 
The next, and I think really critical for the public and anyone listening today is just really working to increase and strengthen our support of property owners and landlords to ensure successful housing searches for these families. You know, having these precious resources of vouchers and just ensuring that our families are able to get into permanent um, and healthy living situations with this resource. Um, and finally, we want to um, alert the board as we raised in the report that we um, are just seeing from our partners a lot of need out there, particularly in kind of the homeless prevention part of the spectrum where folks are just have severe rent burdens. And so we're really trying to um, you know, assess the needs and shore up our homelessness prevention system, especially with the expiration of some of the um, pandemic um, era, the um, rental assistance and uh, eviction protections. And so um, that's a huge area of need and you can expect to be hearing more from us. So with that, I think we're ready for any questions. Thank you, Hillary. I appreciate that. And again, kudos to you on your PowerPoint slides. I see the same couple of supervisors have their hand raised. If it's okay with you, we have two members of the public. Allow them to speak first. And with that said, please allow them to speak for two minutes each. Our first speaker is Paul Soto. You'll have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Um, your efforts, I, I'd really like to see these programs succeed, but here's the reason why they will not succeed in meeting your goals of alleviating and ameliorating. We don't have a housing crisis. What we have is poverty creation. That's what we're, that's what we're living under. It's Manifest Destiny 2.0 which means you're gonna wipe out certain populations here that are no longer less necessary. They're superfluous, meaning that the, the, the offspring of the campesinos from Sasi Puedes, all their offspring, you're trying to get rid of them because you know that you didn't educate them. Why? Because you made certain that their parents were tracked towards vocational schools and not colleges. So that created a generational deficit of wealth. That's what you're dealing with right now. That's why these people are struggling. Okay, that's number one. Number two is that unless you put a cap on this market rate housing, you will, you will always be on the treadmill, constantly on the treadmill. Here's a solution to that. What I propose to this county is that you put a 50% cap on all market rate housing. I don't care about Gary Dillabo. I don't care about Urban Catalyst. And I certainly don't care about Eric Hayden or Sobrato, none of them, because they don't care about me. They don't care about us. They don't care about the Chicano community. So what I'd like to see is 50% cap until all ELI, VLI housing has met 75% year after year goals. Then once that has been met three years consecutive, then you can lift the cap on the market rate housing and it can go back up to 95 to 115%. But unless you do that, unless somebody has the political will and the courage and the courage to do something like that, to even suggest something like that. We are never going to get out of this. What's gonna happen is the people in the lower populations and the lower incomes, they're gonna be gentrified out of this area. Next speaker is Blair Beekman, please go ahead. Thank you for the word to the previous speaker, Paul. Uh, I'm in agreement, uh, a lot of agreement. And I, and I, I always try to add that uh, we have mixed income ideas that the MTC wants to, uh, you know, give to the community only in the year 2029. <laughs> and it's my feeling that why don't we start working on mixed income ideas now and really get ourselves comfortable with the concepts of mixed income and make it an open conversation that I feel by 2025 or so, you know, it can really, really help address uh, how ELI and VLI can be in the same building in the same neighborhood as you know moderate income and low income and that's an interesting concept that i hope we really want to just start more openly talking about and not putting it off until 2025 or 26. let's start doing that now so we can be ready by 2025 and 26. um with that said uh very much of a thank you for this item i think to me it is just the example of how to use uh, our, our good COVID funding that we receive from the state level and what they can continuously give us year after year now um, 
this is ways to set up and organize systems to really address homelessness and really put a an end to it in a certain degree. And the idea that, you know, uh, uh, people who used to be housed for only six months to a year and then would leave the system because, you know, subsidy funding would run out. That funding can now go on for, you know, two to five years. And that could really help stabilize a person or a family. Good luck how you're approaching this subject and how it can connect with more marginalized people who, who it's more difficult to learn how they can receive help uh, and services. Uh, good luck, real good luck with this item. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sharon Luna. Please go ahead. Good afternoon. Lots of information um, has been given and I truly appreciate it. Um, what I am uh, or like to suggest is when you were talking about landlord engagement, and um, I am from a biracial Hispanic family who worked, uh, my husband worked out in the uh, was a farm worker, received his education, uh, strived very hard. Um, we saved our money and we did purchase a second home and we do rent it in uh, San Jose. Um, we are very well aware of our uh, efforts to support those that cannot afford the rents uh, in San Jose. And what the pandemic showed us is that where the county is saying, um, you know, help those about the eviction process and there's nothing there for the landlord that is trying to do their best to keep afloat um, because there is mortgages to pay, there are um, other bills to pay. And we have to work to where it's not just the renter. It's also those uh, landlords that um, are trying to do well. Um, I rent my home below what the um, going market is. And, you know, to struggle to pay that payment um, when uh, my renter could not uh, pay was very difficult. And so, you know, I, I look at it twofold that there has to be, when you talk about landlord engagement, it can't just be a one-way street. It has to be a two-way street and protect those landlords that are trying to do right. Thank you. And that concludes our requests. Thank you, Jess. I'm now gonna go back to Vice President Ellenberg, then Supervisor Chavez, and this is a receiver report item, and then we will break for lunch. Thank you so much. Um, and just listening to the last caller, um, I feel uh, prompted to share a, a personal experience story, and then and then I'll go to my questions, uh, which is that um, landlords right now are being supported and incentivized. I have a a a, a, a tenant who is housed with an emergency with an EHV, um, and working with Abode Services, the tenant has a caseworker and I as a renter have an abode person who is essentially my advocate abode provides and I realize there are lots of other organizations that that are doing this I'm so I'm, I'm literally just outlining a, a personal experience not um, that this is the only way to do it but abode is offering uh, in partnership with housing authority financial um, incentives, bonus payments for landlords um, to do this. They'll cover up to two months of a security deposit. They, in fact, will start paying the rent um, as soon as the tenant moves in, even if the voucher takes several months uh, to come in. So you, so the landlord is not losing rent uh, up front. And, and just, of course, if the, if the housing voucher pays retroactively, you, you, the, the landlord gives that money back. But the, the point is is well taken that we we do need to incentivize landlords and since we're doing it we need to make those incentives very clear and very public so that landlords are aware of them and have these reassurances that they're going to get guaranteed rent every single month and that there is a nonprofit organization that will fill that gap for them so that they're not losing um uh, they're not losing rent waiting waiting for the voucher to kick in. And again, the, the security deposit funding and, and others. So 
I um, will work offline with, with our housing folks, I see Hillary nodding, to think about what else we need to do to really publicize this um, to landlords, um, because it really is, it really is an easier lift, I think, than, and financially stable lift um, that people might not be, be totally aware of. So that's that. Um, let me uh, come back to my, my prepared comments, which were really to start with a, a thank you. Thank you first to Supervisor Chavez, uh, who uh, initiated the Heading Home campaign with me, of course, to Consuelo and the Office of Supportive Housing Staff and VHHP staff and SSA and the County Housing Authority and Destination Home, along with a host of other uh, CBOs, as well as the city of San Jose. And I name all of these parties because it is precisely because we have a community plan to end homelessness that we are able to be as successful as we are. This is incredibly hard work and, and our community partners are doing this so well. And homelessness is endlessly politicized and, and really despite the storm of criticism and finger pointing and, and accusations of ineffectiveness, all of the entities that I mentioned keep pushing forward and getting people housed without very much fanfare. Uh, I know that we have been more successful than nearly any other county in the state in terms of response to homelessness. And, and again, it really is a credit to the tremendous partnerships uh, we have across the county and the laser focus that we're maintaining on continuing to do what we know will achieve sustainable results. So just much, much gratitude to everyone actually uh, doing the work. Um, I have a couple of follow-up questions and a possible recommendation. Uh, first, with respect to working with um, county departments, I see that you've connected with the HHP and social services. Uh, I'm wondering if we've connected with the uh, NICU at VMC and with First Five. Thank you, Vice President Ellenberg. I don't believe we have directly, um, but we can definitely add that to our next round of stakeholder engagement. Thanks, Consuelo. I, I had the opportunity to tour the NICU recently, um, and it really is not uncommon for for um, to find babies in in those units who um, whose parents are unstably or or unhoused, and, and I think that that may be a good place where we can we can be of of great service very early on. Um, so uh, so I would um, like to offer that direction to connect with with NICU um, on potentially connecting those families with with heading home resources. Um, and we, I have heard, in fact, from, from staff there that they are concerned about some of the babies that are preparing, um, that are ready to be discharged, but don't have stable housing to go to. And second, I'm interested, um, oh, I started with the second, was to, to talk about um, uh, how else we might um, advertise or, or, or uplift the incentives that are available to landlords. And again, I'm, I'm happy to... Uh, partner in, in any way that I can. I can't speak for my colleagues, but colleagues, but I suspect all of us would be eager to push this out in our own districts and communities. Um, thinking just finally about the Apartment Association or other realtor advocacy groups, are we working with them? We have um, Supervisor Ellenberg through um, the Housing Authority, but okay. I know that the team is working on a new push um, for landlord engagement um, and through Hillary, um, you know, we can send over materials that the team is working on um, to all of the board offices. And absolutely, this is our one call to action for anybody that's listening and everybody watching us right now. Um, and we will send out that information, I think in the coming week, right, Hillary? Hillary's nodding. Thank yes, you thank so you. much. Thank you, I appreciate it all. Was was that it, Vice President? Yes, thank you. Supervisor Chavez. Yes, thank you. Um, and thanks for the amazing work. And Susan, uh, you know, again, cheers to you for always thinking about kids and families. What is the name of the program? And Susan, you may actually remember this, of, of the, um, the folks that are doing outreach for us 
with new moms at all of the hospitals. And I think Healthier Kids Foundation is leading or initially led the effort where we're making sure they have a pediatrician and right. all of that. I do not remember the name well, offhand. If it's not first five, I thought maybe it was kind of a subset there, but I'll, we can find out. I think that it's out. healthier kids. And so Hillary, I would just recommend that we, we do know that this work is happening already in the hospitals. And I also would think that the social workers in every single hospital should know about the program, because one of the points that I think we're all trying to get to if we're going to hit that 2025 number is what the early warning system looks like. And one of the things I'd be really interested in having come back to the board is a really robust um, framework for that out that early warning system, because, you know, I, I think about um, the hospitals, the other interesting place that we through first five have a, a much deeper partnership with now is um, and, and actually through the County Office of Education is with um, home care providers and, and, and child care providers in general. And all those child care providers are connected, not all of them, but many of them are connected to the resource and referral um, program at the County Office of Education. And then we have and I know we're already probably working with our own social services agency, but I think if we can figure out a way to talk to preschools and then TK and, and the like that we're going to have a much better opportunity to do the early warning. Because one thing that I would be really interested in understanding as I was looking at this report, I was thinking about the, um, the opportunity for, uh, you know, the one-time investments that we sometimes need to make to keep people housed. And I, I think that needs its own line, you know, on the on the prevention side and then the expenditures for the prevention side so that we can do a better job of both of giving up resources, but also understanding at a state level and federal level what we should be advocating for relative to those kinds of resources. And then um, and then the last thing I was thinking about is that, you know, now, because the schools have the benefit of getting increased revenue when they have a child that is um, in higher need and maybe homeless, that I know we're probably already working with them because they've been able to identify them. But what I've wondered is how the schools do what their process is for identification for, for these kids. And it brought me to another thought, which is we have schooling services in, in these schools. And I wonder if we're already talking to schooling services about the early warning system as well. Because they're really talking to families like all over the county and, and in pretty personal ways, I would imagine. And we do supervisor Chavez primarily through our homelessness prevention system. So, so Consuelo, the, the um, schooling services is part of that system. Yes, um, Jessica Orozco, who's our program manager, coordinates very closely with that team and often does presentations. Um, you know, the, the body of work that we're planning in this next quarter is really around prevention. Um, uh, you know, through various different actions, the board has also asked um, uh, through the behavioral health department to look at families that are in their you know, dealing with a family member that might have their first episode of psychosis and how does the prevention system help that? So really the work that Hillary will be doing is coordinating with all of those county departments over the next three months to figure out, you know, what is our plan for next year? We, we believe the focus needs to be on prevention. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, um, I think that's super, that's super helpful. <laughs> I mean, Susan, I saw the baby gateway. Yes. You know, <laughs> Um, so I think I think that's right, um, and I'm looking forward to it. And what I would just say is, if we could, when it comes back to us with the with the program partners, the, the other question I would be asking is the the actual training or intervention they get, and how do they know where to call? Because I, I just I still don't understand all of our networks, and would really like to make sure that we have like that one number, that one place. And and for example, we already have the child abuse neglect hotline. Is that a place that um, you know, that we're also working with because that program now has the, Hillary, you may remember this because I think you actually helped us with some of the original work on this, but for the outreach work we were doing for the families that are not deemed to need an investigation but could need nonprofit support help. I, the African-American Community Ser Services Agency, I think is leading the, 
the um, exploratory work in that area right now, it would be worth having a conversation with them about how this all gets um, knitted together. Because we've already got that hotline in place and I, I don't know how connected they are with you all. So thank you, those were my recommendations. Thank you, appreciate that. Supervisor Chavez, Supervisor Ellenberg. I don't believe we even need a vote on this. We've got some direction given. And unless there's any objection, we've heard from the public, that will conclude item number 19 today. We are gonna take a recess uh, from now. We'll resume at one o'clock. And just, just to make sure my notes uh, match your notes, when we come back, we will start with item number 11, which is the COVID report. Then we will jump to number 23. Do you agree? I do. Thank you very much. Everybody have a good lunch. We will start at one o'clock sharp. Thank you. Thank you. Recording stopped.
do, 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 Recording in progress. I see the vice president. I see Supervisor Lee, Supervisor Chavez, and Supervisor Simidian. Looks like a full house, Jess. And in a matter of seconds, 10 to be exact. That is what I have. Wonderful. Jess, it's one o'clock. All board members are present. Would you please take roll to confirm that? Thank you. Supervisor Lee? Aye. Supervisor Chavez? Here. Supervisor Simidian? Here. Vice President Ellenberg? I'm here. President Wasserman? Here as well. Thank you very much, Jess. And as we mentioned before, we're going to now go back to item number 11, which was to be heard no earlier than 1 p.m. And it is now 1 p.m. and 30 seconds. So we'll turn to Dr. Cody, I imagine, to kick things off. Good afternoon, President Wasserman and members of the board. Uh, this is Dr. Sarah Cody. And today I'm going to depart from my usual just a little bit. It's going to be a bit more of a viral potpourri. I'll give you an update, not just on uh, COVID-19, but flu and respiratory syncytial virus and mpox as well. So we'll start off with COVID um, with the usual look at the epidemic curve since the beginning of the pandemic. We'll get that up in just one moment. Um, so uh, back one slide, you can see, um, well, you can see in green uh, while we're waiting for the other slide, that those are, there we go, the cases with the seven day moving average since the beginning of the pandemic. And we're there way on the far right. Um, and it looks to the casual observer like we're in pretty good shape because we're between waves and it's gone lower. But in the next slide, um, we have the cases that are reported to us uh, with the wastewater trend superimposed. Um, these are the wastewater trends in our San Jose sewer shed, which covers over 75% of our county population, as well as the case counts uh, from the people living within that sewer shed. Um, and you can see, of course, our various waves, and you can see how during the Omicron wave, the reported case counts and the wastewater levels um, correlate very well, but then they depart in the the subsequent waves. And we don't know, of course, what's just around the corner, um, but we think that the you know grandchildren of Omicron are probably around the corner. Um, these are the children of BA5. There's a few variants that are emerging now. We've detected a handful in our county, uh, but they've not uh, not yet taken off. Uh, next slide. This is how those case counts um, translate to hospitalizations. Uh, this, of course, are the trends over time of people hospitalized with COVID. And currently, just to give you an idea, about 20 to 25 percent of those with COVID are hospitalized uh, for COVID. They have the the they're um, sick enough to be hospitalized for the infection. And in the next slide, you can see how this translates to mortality in our county. Um, so far to date, uh, over 2,500 residents of the county have died of COVID during the pandemic. Now our deaths are fairly uh, flat uh, and stable, uh, but of course, um, unfortunately, not yet absent. The next slide, uh, I just wanted to put the COVID deaths uh, into perspective for you and share a comparison of the worst months in our county in the last 10 years um, for both flu and for COVID. So in this first table, you can see the worst month for flu in the last 10 years was January 2018. And the worst month for COVID was January 2021 as far as deaths. And then if you look to the far right, that last column, 
are the age adjusted death rates. And that's a way to compare uh, apples and apples if the populations are a little bit different. And you can see that the age adjusted death rate for 100,000 is many fold greater for COVID than it is for flu. And the same holds true even in the month with our second highest um, death counts uh, for flu and COVID. Next slide. So how are we doing with bivalent boosters? Uh, this shows how we're doing um, broken out by age group, comparing our county, Santa Clara County, in the dark blue and the state in the light blue. And you can see that uh, a couple things. One is the percent who are eligible and receive their booster um, rises with age. Uh, that's good since we're especially concerned about people 50 and up. Um, higher percentage of them have gotten boosted. Um, and you can also see that while our numbers um, are certainly lower than we'd like, um, we are doing better than the state as a whole. So a total of just under 16% of eligibles in Santa Clara County received their bivalent booster. And that compares to a bit over 11 for the state and a bit over seven um, for the nation. Next slide. So now I'm just going to turn to just share a few slides on MPOX. I think this is the last update I'll give you on MPOX. That's because um, uh, I will share with you that cases have slowed to just a handful a week, and we've now folded the response uh, fully into our sexual health and harm reduction program. So they're responding to MPOX the way they respond to syphilis, um, gonorrhea, HIV, and other sexually transmitted infections. So a little over 28,000 in the US so far, a little over 5,400 um, in the California and exactly 200 confirmed and probable cases um, as of October 27th in, uh, in our county. And the next slide shows you the epidemic curve where you can see that um, after a lot of activity in July um, and a bit going into August, things have really leveled off and we're just seeing a handful uh, of cases at a time at each week. So that's the last you'll hear of MPOX. Um, uh, I'll, of course, at future times, happy to answer questions, but we won't be sharing slides uh, any longer. So finally, I wanted to share a little bit about um, RSV or respiratory syncytial virus and flu or influenza uh, because both are on the rise. And I just wanted you to be aware. Um, we're not exactly sure how this may interact with COVID uh, in the weeks and months to come. So the first slide is really the best and only data we have locally to help us understand what's going on here. Um, we're now able to track a respiratory syncytial virus in our wastewater. And we can see across all four sewer sheds uh, that the levels in the wastewater have been rising since late summer uh, and are still on their way up. This is the very first year that we've had um, data from wastewater. So we can't really compare to how it looked in previous years. And just to um, emphasize the importance of respiratory syncytial virus, it can make little kids, especially those less than two, uh, really sick um, and land them in the hospital. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why we worry about it. It can make adults sick too, uh, but generally not as sick. So the next slide um, shows some statewide trends. Uh, the slide is a little bit busy, so just ignore all those squiggly lines. And I want to draw your attention to the far left. Um, so these are data from labs to look at specimens that come into particular labs and are tested for RSV to just sort of track what percentage of those tested test positive. And way over there um, on the left, those top two yellow dots, those are the pediatric uh, specimens from pediatric cases. And you can just see that they are well above the other solid lines for other years. So lots more um, uh, RSV for this time of year, uh, according to this um, statewide system. And the same is true for adults. Adults are in the uh, broken lines and they're in the red dots. So it's elevated for this time of year. Um, we're getting a really early start with RSV. Dr. Cody, if, if I may, before you proceed, um, I, I asked this before and I wanna ask it again. On that bottom row, this particular chart covers from 2019 
to 22, uh, four years worth of information. On that bottom row, could you please, please have the year inserted somewhere? So for instance, if I'm looking at the word March, at the very bottom where it says week, and then above that where it says April, I don't know what year I'm in. Ah, thank, thank you for that question. So the, the, these are so that you can compare year to year. So for example, if you look at March, you can see that the light blue lines at the bottom are the data from 2020 to 2021. Um, pediatric is in the broken uh, blue line and adults are in the solid blue line. So you can see not much happening there in March uh, of um, 2021. And then you could compare that to the dark blue line, which is 2019, 2020. In March of 2019, 2020, quite a lot of activity in the pediatric yep. um, and some in the adult. Yeah, okay. so it's just a way I'll, to I'll just, year to year. I'll just throw this out and then please continue. On your little, your legend um, in the top right at three o'clock on your chart, under clinical sentinel laboratories. It shows the first line, a purple line, and it says pediatric 2019 to 2020. So I'm looking on the chart, I'm looking for the purple line. I see what I believe is the purple line. And I see it starting over on the left, somewhere around two or 3%, going up as high as 25%, and then going down to the right very low. And from the clinical sentinel laboratories, I'm told that's the pediatric line, for 2019 and 2020. And on the bottom is 12 months, October through September. So I don't understand how that pediatric line, just to pick one, is for two years when there's only 12 months shown down below. Yeah, I think it's, sorry, that's confusing. I think it's, it's to represent one year of time, but because uh, the season generally starts in the fall, it sort of starts with when the season starts. So it's a year, but not a January through December, rather an October through September. So the months span one year and then fold into the next. Gotcha. And for some of the yeah. things, it's 2019 to 2020, some it's 21 to 22, some it's 22 to 23. Okay. That's right. Thank yeah. you. Sorry, sorry, it's confusing. All I really wanted you to see is that the yellow and red dots are higher than the green blue and purple lines. That's the take home. <laughs> All right. Okay, great. And, and then the final slide is um, a snapshot of our flu dashboard. I wanted you all to know that we now have a flu dashboard. Um, the data are not as rich as they are for our COVID, um, but nevertheless, you can see trends. So the little blue line is um, this flu season, 2022-23, and you can see that it's above the other line. So we seem to be getting a bit of an early start of the flu season. Now, these data are emergency department visits for influenza-like illness. So what percentage of all those visits were for influenza-like illness? And it is a way to sort of track trends in flu activity and you can see we're a little above where we normally are for this time uh, this year, uh, but it's it's uh, not very high just yet. So happy to answer any questions you may have about uh, any of the viruses. Thank you, doctor. Um, I'll kick off. We have no members of the public there. The question I'll ask of you, oh, I see Supervisor Chavez, go ahead first. No, wait. Goes last. Go ahead, you might ask my question. Um, I, I made note that I have five COVID shots now, two shingles and one flu. And uh, so I've, I've got everything I think that's out there on the menu right now. Dr. Cody, where do things stand with the state as far as easing the restrictions that will enable us to feel much better about holding in-person board meetings? Well, I, I think what might be most helpful and, and, and information that, that you have is to look at the wastewater just to understand what the level of virus circulating in the community and what might the risk to um, people gathering what you know what's the level of risk when you when you gather. Um, so that's that that's what I would look at. And, and I just would note that 
I think we're the only county that I know of um, that has comprehensive wastewater data that's also longitudinal. So you can kind of see what's been going on since the beginning. Um, and the reason I show it to you um, every time I have the opportunity is because I, I think it's so helpful uh, for thinking about questions uh, like the one you just posed. Thank you. I know, I know churches gather in mass without masks and our board meetings are more spread out. Is the state's recommendation still strongly recommend? Uh, uh, I believe the state still uh, strongly recommends um, okay. masking indoors, and then it's also required in certain high-risk settings such as healthcare. Okay, yes, I'm, I'm aware of that. I just didn't, yeah. I was kind of hoping they weren't still at strongly recommends. All right, thank you. Supervisor Chavez and Supervisor Lee. Thank you. Um, I, Dr. Cody, thank you for the report and thank you for incorporating um, the flu since that's going to have such a big impact on the on our healthcare system and our hospitals. Um, can you go back and just talk for a moment about what you see relative to children and um, and the the respiratory illnesses that they're finding and and our own like and what we should be doing relative to that in our own community? Sure. So I've shown you data for um, COVID respiratory syncytial virus and influenza. Those are by no means the only respiratory viruses um, that are circulating now and that will increase this winter. Um, but they're the ones for which we have data that I can share. I think that uh, a couple things to think about as we enter the winter respiratory virus season, a lot of it has to do sort of the interaction between the virus and the host, and we're the hosts. Um, and so as much as our behavior uh, it, it may change as we gather indoors, um, gather larger number of, of people, um, mask less, we would expect in general that we would see an increase. For um, respiratory syncytial virus, the sort of key prevention, it's a little bit different than, um, than well, it's the same as others and, and different than others, but the key prevention measures are uh, a lot of hand washing, um, covering coughs and sneezes, staying away from people who are sick. If you're sick, staying home. I mean, that's, that's, that sort of cuts across so many, so many viruses. So it's, it's a pretty, pretty basic prevention message. Unfortunately, um, there's not a vaccine for respiratory syncytial virus. So we're really dependent on those other uh, sort of behavior change. Um, to help, uh, to help ki keep kids um, as healthy as possible. And um, Dr. Cody, on an on a on a different kind of different note, but as we were working with the schools relative to COVID so closely, will that relationship be maintained for for the flu as well? Well, um, you know, as you know, through the pandemic, we we strengthened a lot of relationships. And one of those I think was with the school. So we have a much more, um, a, a broader and more formal relationship with the schools. I hope we, we've always had a relationship with the schools because when kids are sick with anything that's reportable or any outbreaks, they always report it to public health. So in general, the public health nurses and school nurses know each other quite well. Um, but I think that that relationship uh, has has broadened um, because so many parts of the department work with them. So um, yes, I think that we would work with the schools, um, probably more on the the basic prevention um, strategies. How do you make sure that kids that are sick um, can be supported staying home? That there's no incentive to come to school while ill, those kind of things are, are, are quite important and can help with a bunch of different um, infections. And um, yeah, I would, I would just be really interested in understanding how to keep those, those information pipelines going. Cause I, I think you're, you make a, a, a lot of good points and we have this great relationship with them. It, it seems like we should be expanding on it now. Um, and let, let me just switch gears for a moment and ask this question. I know that some time ago, Supervisor Samidian was asking about our engagement around and research around long COVID and the impacts of COVID on the community. Um, and I, I think Dr. Cody, you told us that perhaps Stanford was doing something in that area. 
uh, two things. One, is Stanford doing something in that area? And two, and this may not necessarily be a question for you, but more for Dr. Smith, um, is this something that we're going to be asking the hospital side of the aisle in partnership with the, the public health side of our, um, our team here to, to do more research on and to be a little more engaged in? Yeah. So I, I think there's a two, two parts uh, to your question, and then I'll turn it over to, uh, to Dr. Smith. Um, one is about whether there are places where people with long COVID can go for care just for their long COVID, like, you know, long COVID specialties. And I know that um, some health systems have set that up. Some health systems have gone with a model where they um, incorporated into uh, primary care um, or, or a subspecialty. I believe Stanford is one of the healthcare systems that has um, a, a, a clinic dedicated for long COVID, I'm not sure. The other question is about how do we better understand long COVID and how do we get our arms around it, both what's the scope and magnitude of the problem, what can we project forward, um, how severe is it, how long does it last, what kind of support people need. And there's a lot of different groups um, that, are, that are doing research on long COVID. Um, uh, I think there's a couple, uh, certainly a couple studies uh, at UCSF um, and many other places around the country that are getting really helpful information. So while strangely, we still don't have a really solid definition to be able to, um, you know, count cases, which is sort of one of the basic activities that we do, um, we have a, uh, better information from these studies. And um, I think it's pretty clear. I think one of the things that worries me most about uh, how we still have a lot of COVID circulating is I just worry that the pandemic is going to have a very long tail uh, because there are a lot of people in our community who have long COVID, um, who some have at mild cases and, and some are quite severe and they're not able uh, to work or, or get back to the regular activities of, of their life. So we are, um, uh, while we don't have a, a robust surveillance system here in Santa Clara County, we're getting better and better information from colleagues in other jurisdictions to be able to apply that and understand uh, the burden here. I think that, um, you know, one concern I have and is that, I have two concerns actually. One is that given the diversity of our population, we may or may not be able to rely on the research done by others. And so I, I am really asking our staff to take a look at what role we should or could play in this area. And then the second that I'm, I'm equally as worried about is whether or not having COVID, uh, long COVID or having had COVID at all is a pre-indicator and creates higher risk for other illnesses. And if so, how we're getting prepared for that as a healthcare system. And, you know, I don't want to speculate what those are. I've been reading lots of articles that do speculate. Um, but I, I am worried that um, our population is so unique that, and that we have three healthcare institutions and a number of clinics that not taking advantage of that could be very uh, troubling or problematic for us in the long run. Or not taking, I mean, mean, meaning not playing that leadership role could have um, implications for us in the long run as a healthcare system. And, um, and not knowing what the next, you know, even the next waves are going to look like. I mean, even, how, even the impact of the flu, who gets it, and how severe it is, is something that I don't think we fully understand. So, anyway, colleagues, I'm, I'm raising the alarm again. I thought Supervisor Samidian raised a good point, and I'm, and I am very concerned about it. So thank you, and thanks for the good information. Thank you, Supervisor Chavez. Supervisor Lee. Thank you, President Wasserman. <clears throat> so first of all, uh, thanks so much for the uh, uh, informative presentations. Always, Dr. Cody, it was always very educational. Um, as your diagram actually has shown that you know, January being the worst month year after year uh, regarding <clears throat> COVID and other ailments, uh, it seems like we are pointing towards some type of a combo of the three right you got the flu you got the coronavirus uh uh actually get grandchildren right of, of corona and then you have rsv which clearly is showing um a rise uh from our um 
uh, uh, wastewater uh, uh, data. Um, I guess the qu concern I have is, are we ready to address the expected surge of patients that will be seeking treatment uh, given these numbers? So you you are correct. We have three, uh, at least three different viruses uh, that may cause illness severe enough to land folks in the hospital. Um, what we're hearing from our, I mean, I think most hospitals are managing uh, the patient loads that they have. Um, I understand, uh, I think Packard is um, pretty impacted already um, by kids with RSV. And, and part of that is because they are a tertiary and quaternary care center. So they're seeing patients from a very wide um, area, of mm -hmm. course, not just here in Santa Clara County. Mm -hmm. um, what I hear from hospitals is that they're ready and that they're prepared, but I also always want to just emphasize there are very simple prevention measures that we can all take um, to reduce the, the um, spread of many viruses, um, and, and that will help the hospitals. And they're really basic things like washing your hands, staying home when you're sick, and wearing a mask. So I continue to strongly recommend all those things. Okay, <clears throat> I lost you for a few seconds, so <clears throat> I'm not sure it's my connection. Um, for the moment, let me go turn off my camera and see if that could improve the uh, sound quality. Can you still hear me okay? Uh, yes, I can hear you. Okay, good. <laughs> yes. Uh, all right, so my question um, is also, <clears throat> uh, uh, on in terms of the hospitalized, uh, uh, hop, the population uh, currently being hospitalized for COVID, um, do we keep track of how many of those are vac unvaccinated versus uh, folks who are immunocompromised or those uh, who have not had a booster for a while. Do we do we keep track of those type of numbers or do you have any type of uh, observation you could share? So what I, I can tell you is that of those who are hospitalized with COVID, about 20, 25% are for COVID. And then I think your question would be of those who are hospitalized for COVID, uh, what's the breakdown in terms of vaccinated and unvaccinated? Um, the honest answer is, I don't know at the moment. We we were tracking all of those variables very, very closely because we were reviewing every single case. Um, and we stopped doing that because it was um, a lot of resources, both for the hospitals and for public health. And we weren't acting on, uh, acting on the information. Um, and so we uh, aren't, collecting the same amount of detail. But um, the general trends that I recall seeing are that in general, people who are hospitalized tend to be older. Um, they tend to be people who have other chronic medical conditions that put them at risk. And in our county, because just a, you know almost everybody uh, has received some, you know, some number of vaccinations, um, then the majority of people in the hospital um, also have had vaccinations, although they have other risk factors uh, such as age or comorbidities. I mean, some are vaccinated and some are not, but um, uh, you know, age, age is a very powerful risk factor for severe illness with COVID and, and many other things. Right, because as we know that <clears throat> these days, the people are frankly very fatigued of wearing masks uh, and we know that people are getting back to a normal life, which is a good thing, right? But the same yes. thing, uh, without the masking and then the bivalent booster, uh, even though our numbers of it in the state of California, we're looking at only about 30 odd percent, right, of those. So basically, we had a, over 90 percent vaccination rate in terms of the first couple of shots. But when it comes to bivalent, we're down to about close to a third of it, right? So uh, I, I'm just just concerned. What else can we do? at this point to keep promoting the bivalent uh, uh, boosters uh, as we talked about last time. Right, so I can share a little bit of the work we've done to promote the uh, bivalent boosters. Some of it is very high touch work with particular communities where we have um, campaigns um, uh, through various different media channels and various different languages um, to reach people based on what we've learned about what their um, 
what their hesitancy might be or why they may not have the urgency that we feel for the bivalent booster. I think that's helped a little bit uh, in that our rates are higher than they are, you know, compared to the to the state. But this is a challenge. I think we're working against um, pandemic fatigue. I mm -hmm. think some people actually, despite our best efforts, still may not have heard about the bivalent booster. Some confusion about whether the bivalent booster is uh, um, one of many boosters, and it's not, it's the only booster that's available, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but, but as I, we've said throughout the pandemic, um, you know, the unfortunate reality is that uh, we, there are still some actions that we need to take, right? We need to stay up to date on our vaccines, um, uh, try to stay in areas that are better ventilated. Um, if it's not well ventilated, wear a mask, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and of course, people are very fatigued from taking these actions. And of course, it's important that people resume their normal lives. Um, uh, but the viruses are continuing to do what the viruses do. And given the fact that we do keep pretty good track of the record of who is getting the vaccination, I don't know if this is possible, Dr. Cody, to find out which age group uh, seems to be the one that is lowest in terms of getting the bivalent boosters. And maybe through some of those data, we could collect that to then try, <clears throat> try to refocus our efforts in terms of outreach to the certain age group. We think that would be something that's possible. Yes. So um, as a, one of the slides does show the bivalent booster uptake by age group. Um, and the older the age group, the higher the uptake. And, and that's actually really good news um, because as far as present, preventing hospitalization and death, we're of course most concerned about people over 50 um, yeah. and that's where the uptake is highest. Um, but all ages can benefit um, and the youngest have the lowest uptake. So, you yeah. know, one strategy is, is um, we're encouraging uh, people to make it a family event, um, bring along a family member, bring along a neighbor. You know, if you're going to get boosted, take someone with you. Right. And remember, we were giving out, uh, there were incidents of giving out boba tea. Um, mm -hmm. That's what teenagers really like, the sugary stuff. Uh, we have issues on that for, for other reasons, but no problems, but at least to get them to get their, uh, get the shots, remember? Uh, or I remember there was one time we were at the, uh, uh, 49er Stadium, right, to get folks to get out there uh, as another reason. So I just hope that we might need to come up with some type of, I wouldn't say gimmick, but incentive to get people excited. Like maybe, I don't know, we, at one point, I remember people were getting money, right? I think some some uh, some uh, county were giving like you know, 50 bucks. I don't know, maybe, you know, these days with a $1.2 billion jackpot on the lotto, maybe lotto tickets, <laughs> $1 a piece. For them to come get the, the I don't know, I'm just throwing out ideas, right? Just get people to come in and get your bivalent booster, right? So I just just throw all those ideas out. So try to be creative and uh, uh, on, on, on on the outreach, I think would be would be, uh, would be helpful. Uh, my last question is actually going back to the issue that you used that we don't need to talk about, which is good, right? That MPOX is clearly uh, coming under control, which is really exciting. Uh, however, it's not going away. I mean, it's still there. Uh, the question I have is, we've had a regime of not allowing, you know, certain individuals, like allowing only certain individuals, right, of high risk uh, in order to get the MPOX vaccine. Now that the, 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 the risk seems to be a little bit lower, I would assume that we no longer, do we still have a shortage of vaccines or, or on the vaccines at this point? Or would you say because of that, less people are as excited getting it? Uh, no, we have plenty of vaccine supply um, okay. and uh, far more vaccine supply than we have demand. And the demand for both first and second doses um, has really tapered off. I didn't share those data today, right. um, but they kind of look a little bit like the epidemic curve of cases. Uh, right. So the question I have now is, um, can we now broaden our population group? to allow more people or just allow everybody to go and get that MPOC vaccine if they want to? Is that possible? Well, we have broadened eligibility, but we've not broadened it to the whole population. Um, and, and, and really that the primary reason is we want to vaccinate people who we think will be at risk of coming into contact with MPOX, and there's not a reason to vaccinate people who aren't at risk. So um, MPOX continues to to primarily circulate in a in a pretty tight network, um, 
and that's the the social network where we're um, you know most anxious that they get vaccinated, and we're not really that worried uh, about the, the the population at large. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I mean, if you, we do have uh, a lot of vaccine vaccines available, and people are not <clears throat> are not uh, yep. uh, are not coming through. I guess a is is a matter of getting the word out, right, to get the folks at risk to do it. But at the same time, I would just uh, suggest maybe uh, uh, folks who are uh, sexually active, let's say, for example, might be ones that like you know, younger adults would be ones that we might want to promote. And actually, I've heard even. Older adults uh, are having very high SAD rates uh, uh, as well. So I don't, I really don't know how to focus it. But I just want to say, if we have a lot of vaccines available and not people are not really taking advantage of it, I think prevention is always better than cure. So uh, I just want to make sure that uh, that is made more available than than certainly don't want the vaccines to get expired, right? So that was my concern. Um, and I think that's all the questions I have. Thank you very much, Dr. Hodi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and I'll just end with this. Um, doctor, it seems like COVID's pretty much under control, but it seems like the flu season's coming, so overall the risk is still a big concern for you. I appreciate that. Is your office or, um, we used to send out mobile units to senior citizen facilities. Um, my mom lives in Merrill Gardens in Campbell, and I know at one time they came out and gave everybody an injection. It was a couple of years ago. Are we still utilizing that program? Yes, we we did used to send public health nurses uh, to do flu clinics at senior centers, and we've not done that in a num in a number of years. And then, particularly after the pandemic, uh, those resources have been um, diverted uh, in in other ways. So, for example, we still have a mobile response team that goes uh, and provides MPOX vaccinations in, um, uh, in encampments uh, and uh, you know, to, to serve other, other people who are have, having a hard time uh, getting vaccine. I, I do believe that our public health pharmacy um, continues to work with senior centers to ensure that they have vaccine supply. Um, I am less clear on who's doing the administering Okay, um, thank you. The re reason yeah. I brought it up, and I, I will end with this now, is you brought up three different times, the older somebody is, the more at risk they are. And I know that has been true for the last two and a half years. So if we have a vaccine, be it flu or COVID, that you think they should be having, I would love to see that program implemented again, where we went, all the residents got notice. Of course, it's voluntary. And the number of people I know at her facility that got vaccinated from that mobile unit was about 98%. So I, it was it was tremendous. Um, so I just want to throw out there that program worked. And if there's a couple of shots that elder citizens especially should have now, I'd like us to go to them because I don't see them coming to us. Thank you very much, doctor. Thank you. Uh, with that, we will move on to item number 23, which was held from the August 30th, 22 meeting. It was item number 37. We're simply going to receive a report from the custody. Oops, I'm reading the wrong one. Held from August 23, item number 37. We receive a report from the County of Santa Clara Health System Administration relating to mental health parity. And as I turn to item number 23 in my binder, I'm looking for Amy Carta on my screen, and there she is. Yes, and good afternoon, uh, Mr. President. Uh, uh, Renee Santiago, Director for the County Santa Clara Health System. Uh, with me is Amy Carta, Director of Government Relations and Public Relations. Uh, we have, since your board referral, uh, we have done uh, several reports and working very closely with our Health and Hospital Committee, uh, our Chair Simidian and Vice Chair Lee, to really get deep into the question of parity. Uh, the first item, uh, which is agenda item number 23, is a report in terms of the outreach and education, some of the work that we've been doing in stakeholder engagement. It also gives you some of the legislative background in terms of what's parity, which for the general public, it's equal treatment of both mental health and substance uh, abuse and disorder conditions similar to medical and UC medical necessity criteria so that people don't 
have to suffer needlessly in terms of uh, their conditions. So item 23 uh, essentially gives you that report. Item 24 on the agenda uh, will give you a proposed uh, pilot that builds on our experience in partnership with our community clinics. Uh, Ms. Laura Rosas, CEO for Valley Health Plan, will present that pilot uh, on our behalf. And item 25 is a particular item that uh, was asked by your board to look into what we as an employer are doing to comply with some of the recent legislation that's been passed in the state of California, SB 855 and SB 221, related to our own health insurers offering timely service and access to our own employees. So without further ado, I turn it over to Amy for the first item, item 23. Thank you, Renee. Hi, Amy. Hello, good afternoon, supervisors. Yeah. And through your conversations and referrals, it's really clear that your board understands the importance of and the need for mental health parity. And this creates a very strong foundation for us to build on. The written report details a series of bills on parity requirements. It summarizes the patchwork of federal and state actions around parity, all of which are rooted on insurance. Combined, the federal and state parity laws have foundational impacts for those Californians with insurance coverage and a mental health diagnosis. And yet the patchwork means parity is not universal. As you know, there are many efforts underway in Santa Clara County to improve services and expand capacity to address behavioral health needs. In considering options, attention needs to be paid to aligning and not duplicating efforts. To identify opportunities to improve parity, a multi-stakeholder work group was formed. We have representatives from Bay Area Legal Aid, the Behavioral Health Board, the Behavioral Health Contractors Association, El Camino, Kaiser, Momentum for Health, and NAMI. Consistent themes have emerged from our meetings, pointing to the importance of policy as well as education, especially on how to access care and services, understanding rights to access care, changes in recent law, and the process to access medically necessary services, as well as resources to help assist the community. Through the work group's conversations, it's become clear there are many barriers to achieving full parity and that options for improving mental health parity fall into two main categories, education and policy. The report outlines initial next steps. The first was a recommendation for Mental Health Services Act funding. One-time funding was recommended in the draft spending plan, which your board will consider in December. This will support an outreach and education campaign to enhance understanding about parity. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, we are currently engaged in developing a presentation on parity to develop this understanding. And given the board's focus on this issue, we will pilot it as soon as possible. Additional strategies and resources such as a checklist or chip, chip, tip sheet will follow. And we really appreciate your interest on this important issue and are developing a plan for outreach and education, including presentations or forums in each supervisorial district. In addition, we're focusing on on policy and advocacy at the state and federal levels. We want to close the parity gaps and work as a community to address behavioral health needs. We are identifying opportunities in this space and will move forward quickly. Regular reports will be provided to the Health and Hospital Committee. And with that, I'll pause and see if there are any questions. Mike, you're on mute. We'll try that again. Thank you very much, Amy. Supervisor Smidian. Thank you, uh, Ms. Carta and team. Let me just ask a couple of uh, questions to make sure I've got a clear understanding of uh, where we're headed. I I read this as what happens in December uh, with respect to the two hundred thousand dollars. What is the tangible thing that we are you hope we will be doing in December? The, um, the Board of Supervisors will be considering the three-year uh, Mental Health Services Act draft spending plan at its December meeting, which includes a series of recommendations for uh, funding, one of which is uh, one-time funding for an outreach and education campaign related to parity. And that's the $200,000 item, yes? Correct. And is that a decision that gets made 
independent of or outside of our regular budget process. And um, I'm just uh, trying to make sure when we get there that we don't have a, wait a minute, you got to go through one more process moment. I will, I will pause because I believe that the, um, the funding for the Mental Health Services Act will then go as part of the mid-year um, process. But I am not a hundred percent. I'm not a hundred percent sure that is the exact process. But that's let me my turn to Dr. Smith then, if I may, through the chair or to Mr. Okay. Santiago. But I, you know, I'm uh, as I know you know from our conversations in health and hospital. I'm I'm anxious to move this along as expeditiously as we responsibly can. And so, two hundred thousand dollars in December sounds like we're starting to do something. But uh, does that then require us to? uh go through another hoop or two before the dollars are available no we um yes. we have uh 200k um in the current allocation that can be utilized and if we need to come back and ask for some more we will but at this point i think it's covered okay so if we make a decision understanding that that de deliberation is still a month plus away um if we make a decision in december to go we can go without worrying further about the funding at least yes yes thank you and then miss carta or others uh i see and i'm looking at the staff report page eight uh in january um i i gather that's when having been authorized to spend a little bit of money in December, you all would uh, develop and actually try to pilot a, uh, a, a presentation for community on parity and parity rights. Do I have that right? Yes, we are working with stakeholders at this point and are focused on quickly moving items forward. That will include the development of the um, presentation on parity, and we will pilot that as um, soon as it's ready to um, move forward. Okay, and the um, do I understand correctly then, seeing that the next paragraph talks about February of 2023, that there's a it says a plan for outreach and education will be developed, including presentations in each supervisorial district's presentations could begin in February. Presumably that's be possible that would be possible if you had gotten your pilot up and running in January, learned a little something from the pilot effort, tweaked it, and then we're ready to go countywide in each district by February. Is that the thinking? Yes. And then it says, in addition to the outreach and education effort. And here's a term I hadn't seen before, so uh, learn something new with every report. A crosswalk of parity laws will be completed in November. First question is, are we speaking November of 22 or 23? November of 2022, this month. Okay. This month. And then um, I gather a crosswalk is a way of essentially taking a half dozen different parity laws at the state and national level, overlaying them on top of each other and figuring out what coverage exists and what coverage doesn't. I know that's a gross oversimplification, I'm sure, but am I close? <laughs> yes, we are looking um, to have that crosswalk help us identify where there are gaps and parities and then where we would have the opportunity to close those gaps. Okay. And um, I, I found the history uh, helpful, uh, useful. Uh, in terms of a little bit of a timeline and you know essentially what i've got is three federal uh, three pieces of federal legislation three pieces of state legislation taken together that's a half dozen different efforts to address parity and now the question is you know how well does all that work do the pieces fit together and are there gaps as you identify uh, uh the issue uh, through the quote crosswalk process um so uh what happens uh and you know implicit in some of the information you've given us is that you know this is not a small challenge that it starts with people understanding their rights uh and uh then hopefully having some ability to assert them notwithstanding the limitations of state and federal law 
So if we go out and we do some presentations in February, any thoughts about what comes next since, uh, you know, it's a county of 2 million people and $200,000 is not an inconsequential amount of money, but certainly not that much money for a countywide awareness uh, program on a subject of this complexity. Supervisor, we're also looking at developing resources that will assist people in understanding the process to access care and coming up with checklists or tip sheets that will help them through that process so that we can help uh, people to um, access the care that they need. As we are going through the, um, the presentations and um, community forum process, we will also um, begin to learn more about what the particular um, barriers are that will help us identify additional resources um, or uh, resources that might be of use for the community, and we would develop those. Okay. Um, let me ask two questions. One's for county council, just to give them a heads up here in a minute. But the first one, I think, is to you and your team, and that is, if we have a, a consumer, a mental health consumer out there in the community, and they think they understand the law fully, which would be quite a, uh, an accomplishment, uh, and they're on the phone with their insurer, and their insurer says, nope, not going to help you, and the consumer thinks, hey, I'm entitled to this, who do they call? Where do I go for help if I'm that person? Anyone? Health Consumer Alliance um, is funded by the Department of Managed Healthcare and does have a website and a telephone number that individuals throughout the state can call. Right, and uh, Supervisor, just to, to supplement that uh, response, as you know, under uh, Senate Bill 221, there's some very specific timely access standards uh, that are imposed by the state of California the regulatory agency is the Department of Managed Healthcare, uh, which is regulating all the commercial insurance plans here in the state. And of course, that would be a, an additional uh, resource uh, that we'll be offering to, to uh, uh, any concerned consumer. Well, thank you, Mr. Sandiego. Let me ask, though, um, the fact of the matter is those access standards aren't really being met, are they? My understanding, not at this time. I mean, that's that's the big issue, the big gap uh, that everybody's uh, quite honestly struggling with. Yeah, and so I, again, I'm just trying to, I'm, I'm try, I, I, and I, you know, let me just say, I'm appreciative of the direction we're headed in, and you got to start somewhere. And you know, I could trot out every cliche I can imagine, like the longest journey begins with a single step. Okay, but I'm just worried that after the first step of educating folks. They're going to pick up the phone or go online and discover that there's nobody there to help them actually get the services to which they are lawfully entitled, if they are lawfully entitled. So I'm trying to figure out who do we who do who do we tell people you can talk to so and so and they'll help you. Is there anyone who fits that description or not really? Well, we have a coalition, uh, and and again, uh, if if people want to pursue a legal strategy, we have the legal advocates as part of the stakeholder group. If they want to talk directly to their local health system, we have uh, uh, local health systems involved and engaged, and hopefully they're also we be part of the the presentations uh, in each of the geographic areas. And then, of course, uh, we we have our own uh, capacity, as indicated by a formerly adopted uh, a, a piece, where you asked us to come back with policy and advocacy recommendations in terms of what are the things that we need to do to make sure that we we bridge any potential gaps in our community. Well, I'm going to go ahead to help uh, the chair here and say uh, on item 23, this mental health parity report, I'll move receipt of the report, but with direction to staff to report back through committee and or the full board on strategies to actually get people the help they need if they are legally entitled to them. And I understand from the staff report, which was very clear, there are gonna be gaps, there are gonna be holes, there are gonna be loopholes, I got it. But if you know someone is talking to their insurer and their insurer says, nope, not gonna do it, then what do you do? What's the remedy? You know, Because having the law in the books without a real remedy doesn't help anybody as we all know. 
which then leads me to turn to County Council's office. And I see Dr. Smith's hand is up, so I want to get to him as well, if I may, through yep. the chair. Yep. But my question is, um, you know, we've got an impact litigation team. I believe, uh, Mr. Williams, that uh, the County Council's office now has authority under Section 17200 of the Business and Professions Code to bring suit on consumer affairs matters. Does any of that position the county to address these issues if the if that was the will of the board? I know we're already working on uh, a memo kind of looking at these questions, uh, including you know what regulatory regulatory authority there is and who has what authority and kind of what are the various remedies. So that that should be forthcoming uh, to the board as a as a confidential analysis. Well, thank thank you, and I mean that you know quite seriously. Thank you. But let me, colleagues, let me share with you why I'm pressing on this point and why I'm asking so doggedly, and I I want to do it by way of a compliment to a former colleague. Um, I, you know, I, I smiled when I saw that all the way back in 1996, uh, we had legislation addressing this issue. And uh, here we are now more than 25 years later. And in the late 90s, I served on this board with then Supervisor Jim Bell. And I think many of you know that Supervisor Bell was a dogged advocate for parity in this arena. So I want to I want to give him a shout out because a, a lot of my early understanding of this issue was prompted by his advocacy. That being said, 25 years later, and you know where we sit is with a patchwork quilt of um, legislative remedies which may or may not be remedies absent some ability to enforce them. So I, I will look forward to that off agenda memo, Mr. Williams and Mr. Chair, if I may, I'd like to pause for a minute. I, I'm Absolutely. sure you want to object to that and uh, see if Dr. Smith wants to get a word in edgewise uh, through the chair. Yes, please, Dr. Smith. Yes, thank you. Um, I think your question is a great question about what someone does if they're an insurance company or they're HMO refuses to provide services. Um, legally and uh, theoretically, the Department of Managed Health Care Services is responsible for enforcing the law um, regarding managed health care plans, HMOs, and the <clears throat> insurance commissioner is responsible for enforcing the law regarding insurance companies that are not HMOs. However, that being said, um, I do not think that either one has a specific um, process in place for mental health parity. And I think uh, what uh, Amy and Renee were talking about is also the process within each insurance company or HMO. They all have responsibility according to the law to have a complaint process within their agency too. So um, I think what you're asking about is not adequately fleshed out. Um, so we'll be happy to give you a more thorough response back um, in the future. All right, well, if I can again, Mr. Chair, ask uh, motion is to receive the report with direction to report back as I indicated, uh, either uh, at HHC and or at the full board on these enforcement mechanisms and tools to make this uh, as meaningful as it can be given the limitations of the legislation. Glad to see that motion. Thank, Thank you. you. Let's and, and that's, um, I think that's what I've got for now on this item, uh, except to say thanks again to staff. And uh, well, I, I, I will just add this, I apologize, Mr. Chair, but you know, to Dr. Smith's point, If we don't push on the system, the system won't respond. You know, there's a there, we all know there's a financial uh, imperative that many of these organizations feel, uh, and the way they maximize return on shareholder investment is by saying no. And our job is to make sure that we do everything we can as a county 
to make them say yes and to help our constituents and clients and patients get a yes when they are legally entitled to a yes under state and federal law. And that's that's uh, if, if we don't if we don't push, um, people are going to be happy to say no. And so, you know, we're only five percent of the state uh, population, but two million people is not inconsequential. So I, I'd like us to bring whatever energy and resources we can to pushing the system, uh, however incrementally, uh, to be more responsive. Because twenty five years is a long time to wait. And still not have parity. All right. That's it. We, we have a motion to push, a second by Vice President Ellenberg. We have no speakers. Roll call vote, please. Supervisor Lee? Aye. Supervisor Chavez? Yeah. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. Are we, Vice President? I apologize. Are we only voting on? Um... Supervisor Simidian, your intent was only 23 at this time? Yes, because I wanted a separate motion okay. on each item. Just okay. wanted to clarify. Happy to be an I vote then. Thank you. Thank you, President Wasserman. I as well. That passes unanimously on to 24. As I understand from Renee, that will be Laura. Thank you so much, Mr. President. Yep. Uh, so I'm here today to talk about an expansion for the PCAP program. Um, as you all remember, earlier this year, we expanded the primary care access program for eligibility up to 400%. Um, and also to expand um, access, introduce a quality program, number of other changes to make that program um, more responsive to the community needs. Um, we've accomplished many of those goals. We've um, started a quality program. We've consolidated our operations over at BHP. Um, and so I'm responding today to a board referral 111160 from May of this year asking um, for the creation of a pilot to subsidize outpatient mental health and substance use uh, services to the uninsured population um, and really try to address the issue of the missing middle, those who um, have more resources than would allow them to um, be eligible for other programs and yet have a, a, a real need for behavioral health uh, because they are uninsured. Thank you. So, um, what we are suggesting and, and proposing is to leverage the existing infrastructure uh, to support um, the, the PCAP program and, and to create this, this expansion to address this missing middle. Um, the existing infrastructure has a claims-based program, programmatic support. Um, the community clinics are already under contract for this program as well as other providers. Over the last, um, I would say two years, BHP has expanded its provider network with a real focus on the behavioral health providers, both in the substance use treatment space as well as mental health. And um, we have these established workflows as well across the MC, BHP, and the clinics and other stakeholders. In addition, um, the public is familiar with the PCAP program. We've got existing marketing materials and communication pathways, and we were successfully able to increase that eligibility up to 400% earlier this year. So um, we're proposing a full continuum of mental health care, including severe mental illness and outpatient substance use treatment from the low to middle income. Um, this would also include pharmaceuticals through the VMC pharmacy and the Better Health Pharmacy. And we currently have a number of providers already um, that could be part of our contract expansion or are currently under contract already, including um, 80 providers at the community health clinics, about 64 over at Santa Clara Valley Healthcare, um, 800 in our network for Covered California and IFP, and then another 900 in our commercial network and 800 in Medi-Cal. So we have the providers. Um, there is still, there is, of course, as you all know, uh, tremendous um, need across not just Santa Clara County, but across the country. Um, the pandemic really has created a, an acute need for these services. And so even though we have the provider network expanded beyond the clinics, we still know there's going to be issues around access, but we'll work really hard to continue to expand that. Uh, so we're suggesting uh, an increase of up to 650% of federal poverty limit to reach a higher income threshold, and also to pair it with the health access program, the healthcare access program over at VMC, so that it would be the same eligibility 
And um, this would improve alignment so that we wouldn't have these people over at VMC who potentially have been admitted for substance use or have comorbidities, and then they can't be seen over at PCAP because their income is too high. We wanted to prevent that problem. So, um, we're, so that is what we are proposing, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Smidian, and then Supervisor Chavez. For, first, thank you. Second, uh, just a, a process question uh, for uh, Ms. Rosas or uh, anyone else, maybe Dr. Smith, maybe uh, even Mr. Williams, um, where the recommended action in the document simply indicates receive report relating to options. On the other hand, we are trying to actually approve, or at least I am trying to actually approve uh, the uh, recommendation that um, uh, I believe Ms. Rosas is bringing us and brought to us at uh, the Health and Hospital Committee, which is to, in fact, provide the mental health services for the so-called missing middle in healthcare, and to do that by using the existing PCAP framework and to allow those services to go to folks who are up to, I believe, 650 percent of the federal poverty limit. Ms. Rosas, have I stated that correctly? That is correct. We'll take a phased approach on this. As you know, it will involve contracting, communication, working with our BMC partners. Um, so it won't happen, you know, in a matter of weeks, but we will take a, a phased approach. And right. um, I defer to Dr. Smith on anything that would need to happen in terms of legislative files to address that. Through the chair. Yep. Yeah. Yes, we would. Uh, envision from the board's action today that we move ahead and as uh, Laura pointed out you know there's lots of infrastructure to straighten out and make sure it's working get the contracts modified and the like um, if we need to uh, deal with finances we'll deal with that in mid-year although it's a relatively small amount of money so um, if the board gives us the go ahead today, we'll get started as fast as we can. Well, then what I'd like to do through the chair, and if Mr. Williams needs to help me tidy up my language, I'm certainly open to that, is move approval of the recommended action, which is to receive the report and and provide direction to implement, uh, to create and implement a pilot program to subsidize uh, outpatient mental health care at nonprofit clinics for middle income county residents. Uh, and, and I'm taking that language directly from the uh, ledge file. So I, I think that's the right language. Yes, Dr. Smith, Mr. Williams? I think that's fine. Thank you. So that was your motion? It was, and I'm looking for a second, obviously. Me too. Okay, I'll second. Thank you. Are you finished, sir? Well, I'm going to move on to Supervisor Chavez. I, I am. I may Supervisor have other Lee. comments or questions uh, after hearing from colleagues because I know not everyone had a chance to follow this in our health and hospital committee meeting. I would expect nothing less. Supervisor Chavez. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, and I, I just had some kind of basic questions. What What is 650% of above the poverty line? And by the way, I understand in Santa Clara County that it means yeah. almost nothing because people here spend so much on housing. Exactly. Um, it's 180,000 per household. So if you think about uh, two people earning 90,000. Got it. Right. And then my second question is, um, how indeed do we increase access in a real way, even if we add more people to the, because uh, what we're essentially doing is we're broadening the number of people who will have access to a a, um, a set of resources that are already extraordinarily limited. So what I'm trying to understand is what's the, what's the plan? And I, I saw in here that we're gonna do more contracts, but I guess realistically what I'm trying to understand is how much room is there in the system to add more, more people? It is tight, but there are providers we haven't contracted with yet. Um, and so some of that comes down to rates, some of that comes down to other factors. But we also are proposing the addition of telehealth in PCAP for, and that is one way to, and there are many more telehealth firms out there and more coming. It's a big area for the startup area. So there's, um, that's another way to try to expand that network adequacy. 
And and when you say expand, you mean for all of PCAP, not just for right. But right, exactly for all of PCAP. Um, but for behavioral health, uh, telehealth, especially for mental health services, has a lot of value for patients. Um, they are actually able to establish, for example, with MD Live, they're actually able to establish um, a, a relationship with the same provider. So they'll continue to see that provider for a number of visits and not have to then talk to somebody new if they go into a crisis. So um, we're, that's where we're proposing another telehealth provider in addition to MD Live that we're actually in the process of working on that. Um, and that's one way to expand the network. But a lot of it is just continuing to contract as well. So Laura, but I, I, I want to make sure I understand this because I had not understood that our limitation for our current patients who are who are waiting to, right? We have a lot of patients who are in quite a lot of need, our current patients, that we do have access to mental health uh, service timeline challenges for our current patients. And so what I'm really trying to understand is the the access, you know, how, how do you, what, if there's a magic way to expand the pool of services, the one question really very seriously is why we haven't done it yet, because this is not a new conversation at all for us, especially as it relates to behavioral health. And, and second, if, if our, if, even if we weren't going to make this expansion, which by the way, I'm supportive of. So this, my, my query isn't about the expansion. If people need services, they need services. So that's not the issue. But the real issue for me is how in a meaningful way in a, in a one year, two year, three year time period, are we actually going to be able to grow access to services? And if, if and, and then the other real sincere question is, since this isn't the first time we've had this discussion about expanding services, we haven't done it yet for some reason, and I'm, I'm not sure what that is. We also have Dr. Smith's hand raised. Doctor? Yeah, I, I wanted to try to um, <clears throat> address that question. What we're talking about here with the expansion of PCAP is um, outpatient, mild and moderate services. What we've been talking about with regard to the mental health crisis is for the most part, severely mentally ill individuals. Uh, <clears throat> so not only is the type of service different, but the funding mechanisms are different. Um, and so it's not, it's not gonna be easy, but it's doable because we can contract with providers who are able to do <clears throat> mild and moderate care, uh, but are unwilling to do severely mentally ill care. So Dr. Smith, I, I think that we've had a challenge along the continuum of services. I, I don't think it's, and I understand the point you're raising and I absolutely understand that we're talking about the, what you're referring to is kind of the deeper end of the pool, but I think we've had problems along the continuum. And I, I say that because we get a lot of feedback from folks who are trying to access services for their, their children or teenagers or young adults that are not yet in that the de description you, you have. But, um, and, and Laura, my, my question, Laura, are you a doctor? No, I'm not. Okay. I didn't want to miss, <laughs> uh, I didn't want to mess you up on a title. Um, but Laura, I'm, I'm, I'm not asking this to be, um, to be accusatory. It's really just a generally, I'm, I'm just genuinely trying to understand the the resources available. Yeah, these are great, are one, are really good questions. And, and you point to like a, a really critical need. There are not enough providers for behavioral health, not in our county, not anywhere. Um, and that, as I said, and as I think we've all experienced, that need has only grown more acute over the last um, few couple of years. It really comes down to contracting and trying to, to uh, identify providers that we don't currently have the network. We've actually done a really good job, I think, over the last year or two in expanding our provider network, especially in behavioral health. And we've now that we have a case management team, which we brought in-house since we've got 25 case managers who really try to connect patients to care. And I think the experience is, is better now than it was, but we still have an acute need. And we continue to find ways and to be creative and bring in more providers into our network. 
And that really comes down to contracting. We've really built a contracting team. Some of, we've definitely expanded our network and we're hoping that we can help here with uh, the uninsured at this higher level to try to also connect them to care. But we work on this every day and it is, um, it is absolutely a real need and, and you point to a, a real challenge. I will also say colleagues for full disclosure. I'm a supervisor Chavez. When oh. you turned away, your microphone didn't pick oh, you up. Sorry, what I was saying is that I I use VHP. Just full full disclosure, <laughs> I'm a client, so that's partly Me too. What, <laughs> yeah, so partly the the mm -hmm. and and you know we do get a lot of feedback mm -hmm. from um, others, mm -hmm. and it's one of the challenges I have felt with growing VHP as a as a as a provider um, has been this limit in access. Um, th thank you for that. The Thank you. That's really all my questions, Laura. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Going down the road, Supervisor Lee. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much. Actually, uh, my comments is fairly uh, short. There's really not much of a questions. Uh, I just want to say, uh, first of all, uh, thank you for the presentation, Laura. And uh, uh, this is really one of those groundbreaking uh, recommendations. And we talk about that at HXC. Uh, previously, and and certainly, I really do believe that this is something that will make our county so much better uh, by serving not only the most underprivileged residents, but also residents in the missing middle who need behavioral health services that cannot afford it. And I'm certainly really excited about this expansion for the coverage through the VHP, and look forward to monitoring our progress in the future. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vice President Ellenberg. Thank you. And Laura, thank you very much for the, the report. I hear the increased reliance on contractors, which I, I don't have an issue with other than the fact that the Behavioral Health Contractors Association has let us know that they are also experiencing uh, a severe work short, workforce shortage and really central to the impact of our work on access and parity, whether it's for county employees privately insured individuals, Medi-Cal beneficiaries, um, or really even the general public through 988 or mobile crisis teams is that workforce. So as we continue to talk about the specific areas for improvement in our behavioral health system, I want to make sure that um, you know whoever is reporting and talking about this work, that they're also um, really looking at root causes and investing in long-term capacity building. I think we really need um, to focus on this issue um, as well. And speaking generally in the monthly behavioral uh, health system uh, reports, but particularly when we talk about expanding access, we need the providers, whether it's our own employees or contracted employees, to actually provide the provide that access. Yeah, if I could just make a, po a point of clarification, I'm not talking about contracted employees. I'm talking about uh, providers who are in our community that are private providers that we're now going to expand by including them into this program. So they would be new in some sense that we don't have normally under contract currently because we have our own contracted network as an HMO. Thank you for that clarification. I suspect the point is still yeah. Correct, and I would be surprised if they're not also having uh, workforce shortages, but that's mm -hmm. that's really helpful, Laura. Thank you for making that distinction for me. Thank you, Vice President. We have no other hands raised, nobody from the public. Uh, we had a motion by Simidian, second by Wasserman, as I recall. Is that correct, sir? Yes, and... I think I can make my colleagues smile, which is I have uh, a great deal I would like to say uh, in response, and I'm not going to say it because I'm going to take yes for an answer and get and there out. There you of go. Way. There you go. All right. Thank you. Roll call vote, please. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Smidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. President Wasserman. Aye. Thank you. We now move on to 25, and I'm guessing it's going to be John Mills. John, you are muted. You don't show muted, but we cannot hear you. Nothing yet, sir.
Do we have a backup for Mr. Mills? Well, otherwise I'm gonna move on to 26 and we'll come back to 25. Is that all right? John, is that okay with you? Just nod. Um, I am here. I'm Rhonda Schmidt, Employee Benefits Director, and I can um, take over for John on this item. All right, Rhonda. Uh, this item provides a response regarding compliance um, for the county's medical plan providers that provide benefits to the county employees and their compliance with the mental health parity laws. We inquired with the health plan providers and were assured they are indeed compliant with the laws, although at this time they are not able to provide the supporting data on that, and that will um, not be available to us until 2024. Thank you. We have Supervisor Chavez and Supervisor Ellenberg. Questions or comments? Yes, thank you very much. And um, the you know, and I, I heard what the staff uh, just said. Thank you, Rhonda, for jumping in there. Um, and I, I want to just say how much I appreciate um, Supervisor Simidian really drilling down on this in committee. I think it was very, very helpful. Um, I just want to acknowledge a couple of things that have happened since these referrals were submitted. The first is settling the Kaiser strike, which I think is good news. The second is the approval of the de delegation for outside EAP program for county employees. And I think that, um, I'm, I'm, I'm curious just on the EAP component, when is that resource gonna be available to our employees? We're currently targeting to implement that in December. So meaning that employees will have access to it in December or a contract Correct. back to us in December? Um, we are planning to implement that contract um, in probably December 1st is what we're targeting. So that will be available to employees in December. Okay. And then I want to just follow up on the question that Supervisor Simidian asked at the meeting, um, which is when our employees are not able to access services, what do we want them to do? And then what are we going to do about that? So if employees are having difficulty accessing services, um, there are a couple options that they can take. They can um, request to, uh, or they can submit a grievance with the health plan provider directly and uh, resolve the issue that way. Or they can also contact their department service center. Um, we have a, a several service centers throughout the county that are there to support county employees with their benefit plans, and they can um, provide a complaint to them. And then we will, uh, through our team, escalate that through our account management team that is available to us uh, with each of the benefit plan providers. So, um so a couple things that I, I would just ask us to consider, and, and I didn't realize that um, about these service teams. And so does that mean um, every employee, uh, because I don't know who my service team is, I would just call John directly, but does that, how do employees know who to call? We have uh, the contact information for each of the department service centers on our website. There are eight service centers um, throughout the county. Um, several of them handle the um, large departments directly. And then we have um, a service center uh, located at Ray Street that handles many of the smaller departments. Um, so one thing that I'm going to recommend is that um, as part of the servicing process we do for, um, for payroll, because even if you're checked gets directly um, deposited, you still get a little paper receipt. I don't know if everybody still gets one, but if that happens, whatever process we use, I, I would very much when EAP comes online, um, like to do an annual and start there with reminding people who they can call if they're having problems. Because, and then the second thing I wanna recommend um, is that I think that the complaints and the waits for time need to go directly to um, Supervisor Simidian's committee on a quarterly basis. And the reason is that 
I think the idea of somebody who's in crisis lodging a complaint is, um, I, I think for a lot of folks while they're in crisis, that's not their first thought is I'm gonna lodge a complaint. And the second thing I'll just say is that my experience with um, a couple of the, the providers that we're talking about, in fact, in particular Kaiser, is that even, you know, I, I just spoke to somebody who it took a year for them to get um, assigned a, um, a, 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 a counselor consistently one year. And so I think that um, since these are part of our contracts, the reason I would like to collect this data is I think both when we're negotiating contracts or we're determining how much we're paying for contracts, our lack of access, even the EAP contract that we're gonna expand at some level should be paid for by the providers who aren't providing our employees with the requisite mental health services. Like we're supplementing our, our health services, which I think we should do that, but um, but I do think there has to be a way that this is actually embedded in our contracts and that it's public. So uh, how would you do that? I'd have to look into that and get back to you. We'd have to uh, do some research and get you an off agenda memo because all three um, insurance products that we offer will have a different capacity to provide us information. So we'll have to get back to you. Can I request, and this um, Supervisor Simidian, since you're chair of this, this commit, the Health and Hospital Committee, um, I, I guess I would be just curious as to whether or not this is something you could um, continue to take up, because I, I do think we're, I think your respective of state law, and I think we just had this conversation with the two previous items, that what we're really looking at is access. And then the other thing is, frankly, I don't want to pay uh, insurance companies for not responsive to our employees. I just think that's, you know, it's bringing me back, honestly, to COVID, to be honest. So not to, not to put that um, in your head, but how would you feel about having this come back for discussion to the committee about how to track it and then what to do about it? Um, that's certainly, if I may, through the chair, yep. that's certainly something I uh, would support, Supervisor. I, um, I, I gather from your comments, uh, Supervisor Chavez, that you had the opportunity to uh, listen in to the Health and Hospital Committee, and, and I hope we did justice to your referral, because I, I really did want to make sure that um, we did do a, a bit of a drill down, and I take your point, which is, as I said on an earlier item, I think we're going to have to stay on these outfits if we expect them to deliver. I think the all the financial incentives are uh, in the other direction. And uh, so that was a long-winded yes, happy to do it. I really appreciate it. That I think that will get us where we need to get to. Thank you. Thank you, Vice President Ellenberg. Thank you. I, I would add a second to all that Supervisor uh, Chavez just asked for regarding a reporting uh, reporting this quarterly once we once we figure this out. And given that the parity question in the provider appointment availability survey and the related public reports to the Department of Managed Healthcare are going to be phased in over the next few years, I'd like to add some direction uh, to ESA as well that they report annually on the data reported on timely access for... Um, com uh, for what? You know... I'm going to pull that back because I think that's what we, I, I think that's what Supervisor Chavez just asked for. And okay. I was going somewhere slightly different. So I'm just going to support that. Thank you. And we have, we have a motion here to rise Smidian or do not. I, I, would be happy to defer to Supervisor Chavez. She's the one who really led on this item. And thank you, Supervisor. You make the motion. I'm happy to second it or defer thank to you. Else. So, yeah. for Supervisor Chavez, motion second by Submitian. Any further discussion or hands? I don't see any. No hands from the public. Roll call, please. Jess. Supervisor Lee? Aye. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Submitian? Aye. Vice President Ellenberg? Yes. President Wasserman? 
Yes. Thank you. Important stuff. Good details. We now move on to 26 under advisement from the August 30th, 22 meeting, which was item number 10. Receive a monthly report from administration relating to mental health and substance use as a public health crisis. And with that, I'm going to turn to our COO, Greta Hansen. Thank you, President Wasserman, and good afternoon, board members. Um, this is, as you know, our um, monthly report on all the activities and efforts that are underway to expand our systems of care and treatment for folks suffering from um, mental illness and substance use disorder. So let's go to the next slide. Um, as you know, we will be using these monthly reports to provide monthly updates on key projects that the board has identified as ones um, where they uh, want to be kept very closely updated on, on progress made. Um, and then also each month we'll plan to do a little bit um, deeper dive into an area of interest. This month um, we will be uh, focused on some of the issues under Cal AIM that were of particular interest in the board's um, referrals from August 30th and uh, also focusing on the managed care infrastructure expansion um, that was subject of referral last May. Next slide. Excuse me one minute, Greta. Supervisor Lee, your hand is raised. Did you have a question for Greta? Not right now, but I'll be able to ask the question after presentation. Sorry. Thank you. you. You got it. No problem. Go ahead, please. Um, we did just want to preview some of the areas that will be um, uh, areas of focus in future meetings, including just two weeks from today, um, some uh, further um, updates or progress reflected in the contract with the a contractor who will be building the Child and Adolescent Psychiatric and Behavioral Health Services Center, and also um, a treatment facilities high-level cost analysis and facilities dashboard. So we'll be doing that in between um, this monthly report and the next one, knowing that those are items the board wants brought back as quickly as possible. And then um, also had a preview of some of the areas that we intend to be the focus of our reports in December and January. And with that, I will turn it over to, I believe, Sherry Trapp. Thank you. Hello, Sherry. Hi. Good afternoon, uh, President Wasserman and members of the Board of Supervisors. Um, we are going to uh, next just share some updates related to increasing capacity at acute hospitals, lock treatment facilities, residential treatment facilities, and temporary and permanent housing. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the, we wanted to just share a couple of updates, and these are both related to acute care projects to expand the number of acute inpatient treatment beds. Uh, first, uh, the contract with San Jose Behavioral Health for eight dedicated beds for sole use by the county uh, is currently in process, and we will continue to update the board uh, related to the pro uh, progress related to that contract. Um, I'm now going to turn it over to um, Jeff Draper, who will provide an update on the Adolescent Psychiatric Facility and Behavioral Health Service Center. Just bring to your attention that we have um, the demolition project is still underway. Actually, we've knocked down those last few structures you see at the bottom of that particular slide. And work continues on that particular part of the project, which will include excavation of the new basement. We also have met with WebCore a couple of times already this uh, week, and work continues to we continue to work with them to uh, come up with our final, uh, not our final, but a, a budget and a schedule and a contract to present to the board by the middle of the month. Next. Great. Thank sure. you, Jeff. Um, the next update is related to subacute care. And um, the, we wanted to update the board that the contract uh, with Crestwood was actually executed yesterday. Um, so we're ahead of schedule, um, and this is to add 20 beds, allowing placements to start based on turnover. And this contract, again, will be further amended um, in July of 2023, which will add the remaining 25 beds and designating placements, again, based on turnover. Uh, we have also um, execute, executed the contract with ANA Healthcare, um, and that uh, went into effect on October 28th, uh, which also uh, adds 11 dedicated beds uh, for residential treatment. 
Um, and I'll go ahead and turn it back over to Jeff to provide an update on 650 South Pasco. Yeah, unfortunately, my news uh, right now is not as good as I'd hoped. This schedule has actually slipped about a month, according to our landlord and their, their delivery team. The reason is mentioned at the bottom bullet where we have the hazardous materials abatement re uh, requirement. So they're currently projecting a uh, finish more in the March, uh, late March timeframe. However, they've also represented to us that they are optimistic they can claw back some of that time. So they're working that out at this point. That's what I have. Thank you. Great, next slide please. Uh, this is an update related to um, social detox for adults. So uh, the Behavioral Health Service Department posted an electronic uh, request for statement of qualifications or an RFSQ on October 7th. Um, we provided courtesy notices to the current social detox providers uh, to uh, inform them of the RFSQ. Um, we have noticed that uh, providers may respond to the RFSQ at any time until the closing date, um, but we wanted to note that the county will review responses and negotiate agreements for services on a rolling basis such that we will not delay uh, you know, any services. And um, we, um, our deputy directors are currently meeting with uh, current and out of county providers to inform them of the RFSQ um, and to encourage them to respond. Next slide, please. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and now turn it over to Renee Santiago uh, for the next part of, present, part of the presentation, which is focused on CalAIM. Yes, uh, and uh, good afternoon again, Mr. President and Board of Supervisors. Um, you, you probably have been hearing from many stakeholders about concerns in terms of the enhanced care management and community uh, services, which is uh, one is a standardized benefit. The other is a voluntary benefit for new Medi-Cal enrollees here in the state of California. I'm going to give you an update related to that piece. Next slide. Just, just as a backdrop, uh, because sometimes this could be very confusing. It could be very confusing not only to beneficiaries, but also to providers in their community. Uh, CalAIM is fundamentally a 1915B waiver, which means that the federal government exempts the state of California from freedom of choice in exchange for mandatory enrollment into managed care with the promise that the managed care system will be a better system for beneficiaries. Uh, that's so important in terms of remembering this particular piece. Uh, under CalAIM now, uh, this is the proposal that was approved by the federal government. Uh, it, gi it gives these managed care plans an increased responsibility for both the quality improvement as well as what we call population health initiatives. Uh, and uh, we'll go into to a description of what those initiatives are here in terms of our county of Santa Clara. As you know, we're a two-plan county, which means we have a private option, Anthem Blue Cross, and then we have a public option, Santa Clara Family Health Plan. In this particular case, related to enhanced care management and community services, both of those two plans decided to uh, directly contract with providers. As you know, Valley Health Plan, our own county-operated plan, we have delegated lives in our relationships with Family Health Plan. However, for the enhanced care management, as well as for the community services, uh, Family Health Plan, as well as Anthem Blue Cross, wanted to contract directly with service providers. Uh, that means not only BMC and the hospital and the clinics, but also our community-based organizations, as well as our federally qualified health centers in the community. Uh, this is this is adds complexity, uh, as you can imagine, in terms of both ramping up ECM and community supports, uh, and as I indicated, is very confusing for both uh, beneficiaries and stakeholders. Next slide. Now, the good news is that uh, we we're one of 22 counties that actually had a whole person care pilot. In fact, uh, we were the ones that proposed both to the state of California as well as the federal government that we ought to have a whole person care initiative that address the holistic needs of not just Medi-Cal, but all populations. Um, the fact that we were one of the 22 counties that was directly operating this pilot project, and we did it successfully, we provided regular reports to uh, full board as well as a health and hospital committee, really gave us an advantage in terms of the implementation now under CalAIM. It may not feel like it, but it really did. Uh, if you could imagine the other uh, uh, 
counties that did not have a whole person care, in many cases, they still haven't even gotten started on some of these Calium initiatives. So we do have uh, some advantages in the fact that we've been collaborating and coordinating care with both plans. That has given us uh, some insights in terms of how we actually implement uh, the enhanced care management, as well as the community supports. Now, Calim is more than just those two services. It's also uh, all kinds of almost 70 different initiatives that the governor has uh, proposed to implement or has already started to implement. Some of them are related to homeless health care programs, uh, that navigation supports, a variety of different other initiatives, plus investments in building the behavioral health infrastructure. So those are the things that you might be hearing about in terms of your interactions with the community. Uh, ultimately, the vision of CalAIM is that we're gonna have full integration by 2027. Uh, full integration, of course, with a state that has uh, a leading legislation related to parity means that both the medical aspects of care as well as the behavioral health aspects of care are treated equally. So that's why for us, the full integration is so important to not only realize, but also to make sure that we have a plan in terms of parity, as well as improving the quality and driving our transformation. Now, I have with me Michelle De La Calle, who will answer some of the very specific uh, questions that you had related to the implementation of Calium in our county. Michelle De La Calle, Director of Austin. Hi, next slide, please. Great. In January of 2022, Enhanced Care Management, or ECM, became a benefit based on the learnings from the statewide whole person care um, demonstration. DHCS estimates that about 8 to 10 percent of the Medi-Cal managed care members will be eligible um, through a population of focus model. Currently, there are three populations of that are eligible, unhoused adults and families, high utilization, and serious mental illness and substance use disorder. In the next month to year, additional populations of focus will be added. ECM is a wraparound whole person and high touch, um, which includes face-to-face -face care coordination and navigation program. It's supposed to serve as a single point of care for the individual's needs, and those needs include the social drivers of health. In Santa Clara County, both managed care plans opted for the direct service model, and the county is a provider of ECM services for all populations of focus. We have a signed contract with Santa Clara Family Health Plan and pending no negotiations with Anthem. With that, the county has provided ECM services to over a thousand individuals to date. Currently, ECM um, county ECM care managers are located within Valley Health Care sites and associated primary care clinics. They work in collaboration with behavioral health and custody health services and teams. This month, a pilot ECM program will go live with behavioral health in the collaborative court setting. As of September 2022, the county has billed and received funding um, for ECM as noted, and we've demonstrated success, successful billing cycles as we continue to develop the required infrastructure with our managed care partners um, for a streamlined process. Next slide. In addition to ECM, DHCS approved 14 community supports that managed care plans can provide to eligible Medi-Cal members. Although not considered benefits, they are valuable and needed services in our community. Our local MCPs have all 14 services on their work plan with go live dates from January, this past January of 2022, going through July of next year. And the county is an approved provider with Santa Clara Family Health Plan and has served just under 400 individuals for housing navigation. We have solidified a referral approval and billing workflow for this service and have been successfully reimbursed as noted in this slide. In addition, the county has applied for and uh, for provider status of three additional services, which are in the process of contracting and workflows and um, are being finalized for the identification of eligible members, referral and billing of the services. The Anthem contract for all four services with the county is uh, are still in negotiation. For community supports that are not provided by the county, we are developing a referral hub for high volume areas of work and seeking additional information from our managed care plan partners to streamline the referral process and ensure eligible individuals are referred when seeking um, services in other county departments. 
Two additional slides are available with more specifics on ECM and community support from this deck at the end. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Edwin Kuhn, who will talk about um, the behavioral health infrastructure. Thank you, Michelle. Good afternoon, President Wasserman and Board of Supervisors. So I will be, good afternoon. So I will be providing an update on some of the activities related to the efforts the departments uh, have been doing to strengthen our managed care infrastructures as well as how it all connected to uh, some of the Calium initiatives that tied to behavioral health. Uh, next slide, please. So actually this slide um, uh, shows about county responsibilities about under the federal Medicaid program. I'm not gonna elaborate too much because uh, there's been a lot of conversations about the bifurcated systems that we have uh, here uh, in California is regarding the what, what uh, behavioral health services covered by the uh, managed care plan and then the county behavioral health. But I do want to highlight that uh, we also, County Behavioral Health, uh, put us put ourselves up as a managed care uh, entity because uh, the contract that we have with the state uh, for the mental health plan, which covers specialty mental health services, as well as the drug medical organized delivery system, which covers uh, substance use disorder services. Both of those contracts, both of those plans are operated under the managed care structure or managed care model. Uh, that's why we also call ourselves BHSD, the Behavioral Health Services Department Managed Care. And with that, we are also required to meet federal and state managed care rules and regulations. Uh, next slide, please. So this slide illustrate the BHSD managed care functions, which is actually very similar to what you would see for a, uh, in a uh, typical Medi-Cal managed care plans. Uh, some of the highlights of these functions include, uh, I'll start from the top, uh, claim processing, which essentially paying the bills, uh, paying for claims that are submitted by our contractor providers. Uh, we have a call center that provides customer services, referrals, support for our beneficiaries. Quality improvements really cover areas such as improving access, as well as uh, making sure that we provide quality of services, quality of care to our beneficiaries. Uh, provider network management, this is an area where uh, we have an active management or support with, uh, for our contracted providers to ensure that we have good network, network coverage, network adequacy. Oops, we lost. We lost the voice. Edwin is frozen. Edwin, are you there? Is it, um, can you hear me okay? Edwin, now we can hear you, yes. I apologize for that. No uh, so for grievance and appeals, it's ability for us to uh, receive and process complaints and appeals from the beneficiaries and then conduct utilizations renew for in inpatient and outpatient, that's utilization management, and then credentialing as well as care coordination. So those make up the core uh, managed care functions. Uh, next slide, please. So how does it really connect to CalAIM with all of these, uh, the managed care components? So while CalAIM is a broad initiative, as Renee has as stated, uh, there are several initiatives that focus specifically on behavioral health, particularly county behavioral health, behavioral health uh, including payment reform, uh, updating the criteria for access uh, to specialty mental health services, uh, uh, program improvement for DMCODS. Uh, the next two ones are really critical. Uh, they call one of them is called the standard screening and transition of care tools. The next one is no wrong door. Both of them really target the coordination between the two system, the Medi-Cal managed care, the mild to moderate benefits, as well as the specialty mental health services. So universal screening allow us to be able to really better coordinate care uh, to depending on where the, the beneficiaries uh, can, can receive service most appropriately. And the no wrong door is to make sure that beneficiaries who comes to the managed care plan or county are not gonna be turned away, that there is gonna be no wrong door between the two systems. And then the last two documentation redesign and administrative integrations, it's really gonna help county uh, behavioral health a great deal in terms of streamlining our administrative uh, burdens, uh, which, which we are very excited about. 
Uh, next slide, please. So uh, with all that as a backdrop, with Calname as a backdrop, uh, the BHSD actually started last year in the fall of developing and implementing a series of related projects and programs to improve both our quality of the services that we provide as well as the level of compliance. Actually, the next slide that we'll, you will see a little bit later uh, do document all the programs that or projects that we are currently active right now. But I wanted to mention that these projects are not necessarily kind of have a one-to-one -one alignment with the managed care function. Some of these projects are a little bit, uh, the scopes are actually fairly broad in a sense that it, it touch upon several of the different managed care functions. Some of them are more quality focused. Some of them are ensuring that we meet regulatory and statutory uh, requirements. There are 10 projects underway currently. Some of them have distinct completion dates, a start date and an anticipated end date. And others are actually, we consider them ongoing improvement process. And last but not least, we're actually working with consultant as well as the county executive office to identify um, areas where we need to prioritize as well as uh, making recommendations of uh, further improvements uh, to enhance our operations. Next slide, please. So here is the table that I just uh, talked about. Uh, I'm gonna run through the list very quickly for you. Uh, the first is the credentialing. Um, it is uh, actually a fairly standard, uh, straightforward uh, project that we have. Uh, we initiated that uh, last fall and uh, we have an, uh, signed an interagency agreement with uh, Valley Health Plan uh, for them to uh, take over our credentialing process. So that's um, that's been in place uh, since September of last year. Uh, contract flexibility is one of the things that we also started last year, late last year. The idea is that we wanted to uh, help our agencies to have a little bit more flexibility when it comes to serving our clients, serving beneficiaries, particularly beneficiaries that can stay within the same agency, but may be able to move from program to program depending on their needs. And that's also going to be ongoing um, uh, um, assessment that we will do. Uh, the next couple ones, I'm actually going to defer to the next few slides because I have a specific slide to talk about NetSmart. I also have a slide that specifically talk about uh, the BHQIP, the Behavioral Health Quality Improvement Program. So I'm going to defer that those two to the next uh, couple slides. Uh, the mental health uh, provider uh, rate adjustment, we completed that actually in March of this year. Um, that was mostly, if, if you may recall, that was mostly targeted to focus on uh, addressing um, uh, some of these difficult to fill positions for our CCPs. We know that uh, with the workforce retention is really important. Uh, being able to recruit is very important. So we work very closely with our CCP to adjust their current fiscal year rate so that they can be more competitive in the job market to recruit positions that we know are hard to fill and so that we can make sure that uh, we maintain or expand our capacity. And that's also a project that will be ongoing uh, uh, in the future. Uh, the next one is a peer certification program. This is actually a state uh, applied to CalAIM. Uh, we're happy to report that in July of this year, we did opt into the state uh, certification program and we're working with uh, CalMesa uh, to uh, start the certification program. So it's a, it's, a, it's a lengthy process, but we're excited that we're gonna be able to uh, implement uh, peer certifications for our county. Uh, the next item is the SUDS um, providers rate adjustment, and that's ongoing. Uh, RFSQ, I'm going to talk, I have another slide to talk about that. And then the last two uh, projects, one of them is related to the call center, which we focusing on looking at the gap analysis, which just completed last month. And also the timing of this is really important because um, in the last slide, I mentioned about the universal screening, and that's going to be implemented into our call center starting in January of 2023 as part of the CalAIM initiatives. So we're excited to that, that we'll, we'll be able to bring that component into our call center. Uh, so uh, hopefully we will be able to be more effective in screening uh, the callers and identifying the, the level of care. And then last but not least, again, is the managed care functional assessments that we're doing with consultant with the CEO office to identify priorities uh, for, our, for our managed care functions. Okay, next slide, please. So 
If can you hear me? Yes, we can, Edwin. Oh, there he is. Okay, great. So uh, the next slide is the um, is the Behavioral Health Quality Improvement Program, a BHQIP. Uh, we wanted to highlight this because this is a program that directly tied to CalAIM initiatives. It's actually an incentive payment program uh, that are uh, provided by DHCS from the state to support county behavioral health plan to implement CalAIM. So um, there are three key areas of focus for this incentive uh, in, the, in this improvement program, uh, payment reform, policy changes, and data exchange and that exchange between uh, the managed care plan and county behavioral health. Uh, the table that you're looking at is the schedule for the uh, payment. Uh, what I wanted to highlight is phase one. It's uh, we just uh, submitted our phase one report in September. And um, I'm happy to report to the board that we there are 10 deliverables uh, that we were able to submit all 10 deliverables on time to the state. So we're still waiting for state to come back and give us any feedback that they may have for us because uh, it's still pretty early, but we're very excited and pleased that we were able to meet those S lines. Uh, the next phase of reporting is March of next year. And then uh, the last phase is gonna be September uh, uh, of 2023. Altogether, the county will be able to potentially earn three point, about $3.5 million from the incentive program. Next slide. Uh, the next slide focuses on NetSmart. So that's another project I want to highlight. Uh, the NetSmart implementation uh, started uh, back in December of 2021. That was a pilot phase that we initiated with momentum. And then in March of this year is when we started the full implementation. I'm happy to report to the board that uh, currently we have already 36 contracted community providers that are uh, already uh, implemented um, the, the uh, NetSmart MSO. And uh, there are actually, they, they're broken down into four kind of bucket or four categories, uh, depending on the type of the, the model that they're using. But all four, four types or categories are essentially the same in the sense that they are able to now connect uh, the client information with our NetSmarts is also going to ease uh, the claim submission processes for these providers. So uh, we do have remaining six contract providers. Five of them are going to be slated for November, and then we have one more in December. So this project, we're uh, expected to complete the implementation by the end of the year. Uh, next slide. So this is my last slide. Um, it focuses on the RFSQ, um, the BHSD solicitation and the timeline. So in September, uh, the BHSD um, uh, have held a provider community convening meeting. So we invited not only providers that are currently contracted with BHSD, but also uh, potential providers who might be interested in contracted with us, contract with us to learn more about uh, our solicitation process and the change from uh, the, uh, the process of RFP to potentially RFSQ. Uh, we also, um, well, actually the county CEO office held also a meeting on October 5th uh, for the community-based initiative meetings uh, with Dr. Smith as well as Greta, and at that meeting also touch upon the BHSD uh, plan to uh, implement the RFSQ. Uh, what we're going to do in October between now essentially through May is to provide technical assistance and work groups as needed for providers uh, to prepare them uh, to uh, potentially uh, apply and 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 come, uh, the proposal and and manage these, uh, the new process of RFSQ. And in May, we're targeting to draft uh, that we will release the draft RFSQ. Uh, we're hoping that by July, uh, we're able to release the AOA, our adult and older adult RFSQ. Now the RFSQs are going to be related to mostly to service areas. So for non-treatment services, uh, we will be keeping our um, uh, current process, which is the RFP. And most, if not all of those non-treatment services were intended to release those RFPs uh, between September and November. All of those contracts will be executed and will be, uh, will be, uh, 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 
starting in the fiscal year 2024. That's our target date. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Edwin. All right, Supervisor Lee, do you still have a question, sir, or a comment? Yes, I certainly do. So first of all, thank you for the uh, <clears throat> very detailed uh, report. This is very, very helpful. And we're covering obviously many, many, many uh, issues that was raised on the memo uh, drafted by uh, uh, Supervisor Ellenberg that I co-sign on. Uh, and so thanks so much for these uh, update. This is certainly very helpful to see where things are moving. A uh, couple of items I just want to highlight there uh, that I really believe we could uh, uh, do better. Uh, first is regarding the 650 South Bastion Avenue project. Um, as this project is adding additional step down mental health beds, which is really addressing our highest level of needs right now in our county to allow more residents to get help at BAP and other facilities. The original deadline of February that we had uh, for 2023 is really too slow. Uh, and cer certainly the further one month delay would not be acceptable. Um, Swenson's a landlord for this facility that manages the portfolio through a company called MCM. Uh, and uh, last Tuesday, I had a positive meeting with MCM expressed, and they expressed actually very much a willingness to explore using overtime and the $100,000 contingency funds to help expedite the tenant improvements to shorten the timeline and opening of this facility. Uh, I expressed to them the urgent need um, and that how we really need to do this, not in a serial, but a parallel fashion. Uh, and any delay, for example, that they complain about, like the planning from City of San Jose, uh, I, I actually told them I would be happy to call Mayor Licardo of how important this is to try to get this expedited. Uh, and they appreciated that. So I would like to ask administration to go back with MCM immediately to provide an updated timeline for 650 South Bascom because they actually did say that some of their things they're doing like electrical or whatnot actually had come in ahead of schedule when I talked to them uh, last week. So it looks like some things are doing better than expected. Uh, and I think the date you have regarding one month delay was about maybe three weeks old. So if you could please go back with them and see where they're at right now, especially the fact that I told them, you know, over time something that is clearly something you need to think about because of the urgency of how high a need it is for our county. And I would like to see if you could come back to us by next board meeting, November 15th, and give us an update of uh, your conversation at MCM. Of course, Supervisor. Thank you. Second is on the social detox facilities. Um, we, uh, first of all, thanks so much for getting the, the bid out, our, our FSQL on October 7th. That's great. Um, now, recall we currently have one contractor that we have just added, I think was 3.2 FTE, uh, in order to, uh, to serve the current uh, 15 beds um, that's been contracted. So um, first question I have is, staff, do we know how many of those 3.2 FTE have been filled at, as of today? Oh, we haven't heard back from them, or from Pathway. Hi, Supervisor Lee. I can provide a quick update. Um, the last we heard is that um, Pathway was able to fill um, at least one of the FTE, of the 3.2 FTE. The one that we understood had filled is the intake uh, person because uh, that was identified as the most critical one because the intake persons uh, will be able to uh, support um, the uh, in, providers calling a uh, pathway to be able to handle the, the incoming requests for uh, admission. So uh, that was the latest that, that we have information we received. Good, but that's good news. Now, then the second thing is of the 15 contracted beds, when I was over there, they were less than half filled or barely half filled. Is there a way we could find out the bed occupancy for the past few weeks now that they have been able to fill that position? Were they able to fill more of those beds? Yes, we, uh, Supervisor Lee, so we do intend to I, I, um, to follow up with Pathway and to establish a more uh, ongoing process um, to track those beds. As you may recall, um, our uh, existing uh, process of, of referrals and utilizations uh, don't necessarily kind of track vacancy per se, because uh, we do allow provider, of course, again, directly refer to uh, pathways uh, for when they have uh, the needs to place someone's for a 3.2 withdrawal management. And only after that a patient is admitted that then, then uh, 
uh, there is a process for pathway to then contact our utilizations uh, management team to uh, review and approve the, the stay. So, uh, but I think um, we have heard uh, uh, the supervisor's interest in and wish to that we have more real time ability to track uh, the bed uh, vacancies. Uh, so we are we will be reporting back uh, to the board. Um, I think in the near future about withdrawal management, and at that time we will share with you uh, our mechanisms of, of tracking those beds. Exactly. I think we need to have the mechanism uh, established. Number one, number two, as I mentioned in previous meetings, that um, you know we really need to be able to have some visibility of the backlog of people who have been referred over there and what is the waiting list uh, of folks uh, trying to get into social detox beds. And that's something that a county should be able to track so that we don't lose folks and they fall through the crack when they are trying to seek detox services. So I just want to make sure that uh, we iterate that point. Is there any progress on that? You could uh, let us know. Um, we I, I don't have very specific um, kind of uh, detailed plan to report at this time, uh, Supervisor Lee. But uh, what again, we will be uh, presenting a, a more comprehensive sort of package uh, when we come back to the board uh, for the withdrawal management items, which I think last month that you requested us to uh, also provide some um, insights about the the referral process. So we intend to bring that to you as a full package. Okay, very good. Yeah, so I just want to make sure that we will be uh, uh, tracking these uh, information and tracking the, the, the individuals and also the wait time. All right, thank you. That's all I have. Thank you very much, Supervisor Lee. Vice President Allenberg, we do have one speaker. Do you wish to speak first or after the speaker? I'm happy to wait until after the speaker. Thank you. Jess, will you please allow our speaker to have two minutes? Thank you. Our speaker is Matthew Tinsley. I've unmuted you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. Timer will start when you begin speaking. Uh, dear President Wasserman, County Supervisors and Staff, the South Santa Clara County Office of Education and County Superintendent of Schools, Dr. Marianne Dewan, are proud to partner with you to address the mental health needs of children and youth. As the county considers its response to the mental health crisis, please consider that youth with behavioral health needs consistently say that they are uncomfortable in one-on-one -on -one cognitive behavioral therapy and instead ask for non-traditional services that are less stigmatizing, especially group-based therapies including yoga therapy, music therapy, and mindfulness. These services are often not covered by insurance. Equitable expansion of behavioral health services in Santa Clara County should support access to these requested therapies for all children and youth, regardless of their health insurance coverage. Thank you. Thank you. Vice President Ellenberg. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you to, to staff for the very, um, very detailed and, and complex report. It's, it's clear from the list of administrative processes and redesign efforts that were on slide 18, thank you for numbering them, uh, that there are quite a few uh, state mandated changes in addition to the direction from the board that you're all contending with. And I think that this is helpful for, helpful for all of us to keep in mind. And as future reports come back, um, this adding to this table, perhaps a column on expected implementation date could really help us uh, to stay grounded. I'd also like to highlight from this list the call center improvements item as a priority as we continue to talk about 988 implementation and improved access. I'd like to ask that staff conducting the gap analysis be sure to include providers that receive referrals for services through the call center and think about ways to incorporate caller feedback or grievances uh, into this process. Uh, with regard to Cal AIM, um, looking at Re uh, Renee and, and Michelle, thank you for your report. It recently came to my attention that people that are duly eligible for Medi-Cal and Medicare are not eligible for enhanced care management and community supports. And I would think that some of these duly eligible individuals are those with serious mental illnesses such that they're disabled and therefore eligible for, for Medicare. Do you know why this population has been uh, excluded from um, from ECM and community support? 
Uh, yes, uh, uh, Madam uh, Vice President uh, Allenberg and uh, Board of Supervisors, uh, Renee Santiago. Well, the duals, which are the Medicare and Medi-Cal, as you know, it's it's uh, it's mostly the seniors and disabled populations. And disabled is not just a physical disabled. There's also some mental health disabled uh, populations in that group. Uh, they 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 are not necessarily required under managed care. It's a voluntary managed care up until this point. Uh, Some are on the way. Uh, they will be required uh, according to the state plan to to uh, like the other Medi-Cal populations to enroll into managed care, but not yet. Mm. So what the categories they fit in, it will depend on the risk stratification that each of the plans implements. So in some cases, they're not automatically, like you said, uh, uh, qualify for, for the ECM benefit. Um, but if they face some uh, very specific risks related to unhoused, uh, related to other severe conditions, they may qualify, uh, but each plan, quite honestly, is is doing it a little bit differently. And I think that's some of the complexities that, that we're working through with both Family Health Plan as well as Anthem Blue Cross. Wow, that sounds like it's gonna be a delight to, to sort out, um, but clearly that's a population that that very, very much needs the, the access to these enhanced services. So uh, doing as much as we can, um, either through our advocacy uh, to the state or, or barring that, um, working with these indiv individual patients who are also likely less able to advocate for themselves, that, that we are able to stay connected with them until they do get all of the benefits that are possible. Uh, slide 26 shows the community supports offered and that the county will be a vendor for four of the services. What are the expectations on when contracts will be executed for the three services that are marked pending? Um, um, uh, <laughs> uh, Vice President Elberg, this is Michelle de Rakai. I can let you know that uh, currently we have um, an amendment in the signature process with Santa Clara Family Health Plan for two of those mm -hmm. um, services. And um, we are in ongoing negotiations with Anthem. We do anticipate both this month. This month? Uh, yeah, for two, two of the three. The medical respite may take a little bit longer. We have a couple of administrative items that we have to take care of that we did not identify prior to um, this month to take care of and get them on board to uh, be able to reimburse that, uh -huh. that program through this through community supports. Thanks, Michelle. What what do you think has been, or what do you know, has been the the source of delay for these services? Um, whereas uh, the housing housing navigation um, happily has been contracted for already. If you look at slide uh, at that same slide, you'll see that sobering and recu recuperative care um, uh -huh. came live in July of 2022 versus uh, the housing transition and navigation went live in January. So this was uh, newly uh, approved in July versus the others that were approved in January. Oh. So we had a six month lead time on the um, transition and navigation. For tenancy and sustaining services, there's some components that we need to hammer out in terms of the um, bundled, um, um, services it, within that um, community support, and we're having to build some infrastructure to be able to pass that through to get referral approval and billing streamlined. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. I've um, just one more uh, recommendation. The note on slide 11 about the enhanced care management pilot with the collaborative courts uh, is new information, new to me, and I'm glad to see it uh, developing. If Supervisor Chavez is, is supportive, I'd like to direct that a specific report on this pilot come to the December uh, reentry network meeting. She's nodding yes. Good idea. Great, thank you so much. Um, Sherry, let me turn to, to you, uh, please. I'm, I'm glad to see that the ANA contract for super board and care uh, beds was executed. And thank you very much for listing the items that were approved under the new delegation of authority in Appendix A. Uh, is this location um, 
will, will this location be added to the bed tracking dashboard? Uh, yes, we can certainly add that to the bed tracking dashboard. Thanks. And, and how will staff be evaluating utilization of these slots? And, and when do you think we can receive a recommendation on the potential for increasing the number of contracted beds for this facility if utilization and quality of service uh, warrant it? Yes, our team is already beginning to work on identifying uh, potential clients or patients who can utilize these beds. Um, so that discussion is underway. And we can certainly provide an update at um, one of our future monthly reports um, related to the utilization of those beds and the status of um, access to the to that resource. Okay. Do you think maybe two or three months it gives enough time to make that assessment? Yes, I think that sounds fair. Two to three months. Okay. Thanks. Uh, I I also appreciated the update on the Crestwood contract. This is fine as a short term option, but but certainly as I've expressed before, just obtaining the beds that were previously contracted by our neighboring counties doesn't resolve the overall capacity issue that we are that we're seeing across the the region. I see that slide three indicates information on a mental health uh, rehabilitation center strategy will be presented. And given the direction for this facility, this was uh, initially approved by the board on May 3rd and, uh, and affirmed with an allocation during the June budget. So I, I really would expect this to be a very well-developed plan with a specific location, timeline, and, and rough order of magnitude budget. Uh, Dr. Smith, can you comment on, on what we should expect to receive on December 6th? Doctor. Yes, we're working on it. Well, that's what we'll expect to uh, present to you um, in some detail. In lots of detail, please. Great. <laughs> as much that's as possible. There you go. Thank you, Dr. Smith. That's Thank all you. I have. Thank you, Vice President. Supervisor Chavez. Yeah, thank you very much. And um, and thank you for bringing the report to the full board. Uh, just an overall request. I I am very interested in us getting a, a consistent set of dashboard indices for the whole board to be able to look at to understand how we're moving forward in terms of coverage. And what I mean specifically by that is that you know I still don't know how long somebody is in EPS before they move to another location or a sobering station before they can get into uh, drug and alcohol counseling. And I still don't know what the backlog is by service. And I, I would really, I wanna just emphasize the importance of having a very consistent indicator so that we can look at, and this goes back to the point, Supervisor Allenberg, that you just raised, which is what are the new beds? What are the contracted beds? What's the waiting time? And, and how long is the wait list? And I think now that we have 988, I'm very interested in under, understanding as an example, how many people come in through 988. And so that's just, that's just one, right? But there are so many services that get provided by this department that you know really properly being able to um, assess coverage and availability and gaps is very difficult with the way this is presented. By the way, this is a this is the same. I, I've been making this request since I think since I got on reentry, and I and I remember the first time I had a presentation on this was when we had a subcommittee to reentry focused on behavioral health after the Blue Ribbon Commission. So I don't know what year that was, but um, this has been an ongoing uh, request. And I, I and I'll just stop and ask: Is there any feedback on that request? Um, I, I mean, I you know, I think we're we're attempting to bring forward the the data that we do have. Um, and I, I do hear, you know, your concern and uh, need for data to be reported a specific way. I think it's certainly something we're taking under in, in advisement and can come back and uh, you know iterate on the way in which we can provide that in a more helpful way. Greta, I saw that you, um, unmuted, so I wasn't sure if you had a comment to make as well. Oh, thank you, Sherry. I, I was just going to add that I think we can, um, can 
take a look at all the data that we have access to figure out how to best align the data that's currently being collected to the question that you're asking, which is, if, as I understand it, at, at sort of each level of service, how, what, to what extent are we meeting the need? And to the extent we're not meeting the need, what um, backlog or what's, what's the best way to reflect the backlog and delay? And I know that part of the complexity on this has been just that the pathways uh, downstream from certain acute settings are, are um, multifaceted. So figuring out sort of how to reflect that has been a challenge, but we will um, definitely get back to you and also talk with you perhaps um, offline to just make sure we fully understand what you're asking for and then can come back with the best that we've got. Supervisor Chavez, we can barely hear you. Thank you. At data in a way that helps you know, like how do you know how long the backlog is or where to invest money? What's the tool that the staff has, um, Dr. Toreo? Because you, you, you must have some mechanism that allows you to say, oh yeah, this is where we're going to invest or how we're going to grow and all that. Yeah, I think um, it's a bit complex because at times we're required to look at data that may in fact come through different systems. And so um, we're at times, uh, you know, in our own work, uh, looking to uh, combine, braid and bring together data sources um, that may not always be in one consistent system. So. Um, I think to Greta's point, it's, uh, you know, really critical that we look at all of the data that we have, the sources in which they come from, and uh, try to figure out how to best organize that in a way that um, is responsive clearly to your request, but also to the more broad statement that I think you're making, which is how does data inform the decisions that you're making related to service, related to access, and related to capacity and funding. So your point is well taken, Supervisor, and we'll certainly come back around and address your concerns. So um, I think that just to follow up on that, um, I think Gabby at, at our reentry committee really tried to do that. And so reentry's had a number of reports. I, I think what's challenging for me is that um, I think it's very difficult to track um, depending on what part of the system that you're looking at. And I do really think we have to take the amount of money we're investing, say clearly what we're using our general fund dollars for, what we're using MHS dollars for, how we're building out the system, and then how long are people waiting? What's the wait line look like? How many beds are available? You know, and, and for example, I, I, I don't know if I were to tell somebody how long on average it would take somebody to get al alcohol and drug treatment if they're ready to get into an alcohol treatment plan in their Medi-Cal or they're uninsured, how long would it take them to get in? So the, to me, the reason I'm, I'm pressing on this is that my fear has been all along that our inability to present this information means we're not using it to make decisions. And, and I'm worried about that. I'm worried about that as it relates to who's on the street. And I'm also worried about it because we can't say here's a pool of seriously mentally ill people that are in the community that um, you know, that, that may or may not have, well, frankly, that we're responsible for, and here's how we're treating them. Uh, so, and I, and, and to be honest with you, we've, we've taken board actions already to direct this. So it, as I hear under advisement, I feel like I don't know what else to do. And we, we can bring, you have had reports in the past. Um, I'll ask my office to collect them, show you the ones that were most easy to read and um but yeah i think this is this is a, such a significant issue i i um i don't want it to be misconstrued as just asking for more information it's more information that will help us make decisions and i hear what you you said dr trejo so i'm gonna i'm gonna say we've directed already and it would be great to have something in december even if it was the framework you're going to use would be huge um, go ahead. I'm sorry, Greta. Oh, I, sorry, no, it's okay. I, I was just going to say, I think we can both come back. So 
thank you in advance for the assistance from your staff of pulling together the reports that you have seen that have been in the format most aligned with what you're looking for here. We can definitely come back in December with what we think is our best attempt to capture um, what you're looking for. And also in addition, um, a little bit more um, exemplar information around where some of the challenges are, because I know just um, as one anecdote, there are certain instances where we have beds available of a particular bed type that a particular client needs to move downstream, but they, in addition to needing that service, have other complex behavioral or medical needs that then in combination with the service type they have, make it very difficult to place the client. So we have the bed type they need. They're just a really unique client. And so trying to figure out how to reflect a delay in placement um, or average out placement delays that are sort of um, unique to different clients. And then to come up with an aggregate way to present that information is an example of some of the challenges I think we face, but we can definitely come back with more um, information and do um, particularly appreciate the, the guidance on where you've seen um, information come back in more of the format you're looking for. You know, Greta, that's actually such a great point that that I, I think there is a mismatch between what our system does and what parts of the community need, period. And the fact that we would have a difficult time placing somebody is, is more a reflection on, on what systems we have in place. I think we're gonna, for example, I've shared this with my colleagues, I think we're gonna see a growing number of people who have meth addictions that are, um, and are using very, very serious drugs that I think are causing long-term more severe um, damage than maybe, you know, that we're, we're seeing on a trend. And I think, you know, so the question then is what's the appropriate service for them? And part of the reason I'm so interested in the weight is because if there's a trend that we're not seeing, I, I'm interested in understanding or not responding to, I'm interested in understanding what is the appropriate response and I, and who doesn't fit. And because from my, from where I sit, um, and again, I live in downtown San Jose, so I see people all the time that we don't, we can't place. So I don't know whose job it is to place them in appropriate, safe conditions. If it's not our job, whose job is it? And I, I genuinely, I think it is our job, and I think we have to figure that that out sooner and fast. <laughs> Um, you know, th which brings me to a, an issue um, that I want to make sure I understand. We talked about social detox. We have not talked about medical detox in a while. And I'm just, I'm just curious, are we pursuing medical detox for people to be able to get into one of our hospitals if they haven't, don't have a co-occurring car accident or something else? Edwin, can you go ahead and address that comment? Sure, I, I sure can. So um, yes, uh, Supervisor Chavez. So for medical detox, uh, we continue to uh, explore uh, both from a, a traditional acute, general acute hospital settings and their capability and ability to service those uh, medical detox needs, which I think in the last presentation, the last board meeting, um, that um, we shared with you that that's one of the kind of uh, scenarios that uh, general acute hospitals, not only just our own uh, BMC, uh, but also community hospitals should be able to uh, accept those uh, patients into their uh, uh, med surge units to be able to properly provide uh, medical detox services. Uh, we have also initiated some work a conversation with our managed care plan partners uh, to uh, explore about their ne network capabilities. So how do they handle uh, when they have received referrals uh, through their uh, system to uh, for medical detox? Because uh, that medical detox have also uh, historically 
uh, view that as a uh, as a physical health uh, benefit as well too. So we wanted to make sure that there is coordination with our managed care plan partners when it comes to medical detox, because one of the challenges potentially is that you know someone who completed medical detox may still be you know will probably still need to look for a social detox bed. So uh, we want to make sure that we are good partners with our hospital system throughout the county, uh, so that um, so that hospitals uh, not not just again our own county hospitals, but rather that uh, throughout the county, a hospital understands how to manage those uh, patients and how to uh, do care coordination. So there are, those are some of the efforts that we have. Uh, sorry. For our hospitals, how many beds are accessible now for people who need medical detox? That don't have a cur they weren't in a crack, so they they can just what's they call in 988. They say I need we determine they need medical detox. They go to which hospital? So for any individuals that are experiencing uh, physical, physiological symptoms that require uh, immediate medical attentions, um, you know, we, we do advise, generally speaking, that uh, they present, you know, to the nearest emergency department to be evaluated by a physician because it is really important that you know, uh, a medical services, a physician is properly evaluate a, a, an individual uh, for potentially benefit. Calls, just to cut the chase, if someone calls sure. them, they need medical, they need detox, we ask them a few questions, we would tell them to go to BMC's emergency room or yeah. where the hospital is. So yes, and 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 would be the nearest. I mean, it should be the nearest emergency department, not necessarily just our own, you know, um, uh, uh, BMC, but but rather that the nearest emergency department. That would be, I think, the general. Um, so if someone dials nine one one or they dial nine eight eight and they get screened, they are being asked to go to whatever the nearest hospital is. And I know sometimes people are asked because if they're a Kaiser patient, for example. So that's happening today. Yeah. So even for Kaiser patients, uh, Kaiser, you know, as you know, you may know that um, emergency department uh, under uh, regulations are not cannot turn away people. So even though people with Kaiser uh, for emergency services, they can still show up to the nearest emergency department, even though it's a non-Kaiser hospitals, uh, for them to receive care. So I think it is really important that if it's a medical emergency, particularly if someone is really experiencing physiological symptoms uh, that are putting them at risk and needs immediate medical attention, that is really the, the first step. Um, uh, of, the of, of, of the directions. So then to, to again, I'm, I'm sorry, Edwin, I'm just really trying to follow you there. Yeah. What you're saying is, is that any hospital in the county, anybody with an emergency room is required to accept somebody who's in withdrawals that may need medical attention as a, even as a component of that withdrawal. So that is medical detox is available. We think countywide, you're, you're assessing that and making sure that everybody's using the same protocols, including Valley Medical Center. And that will be shared with, can you give us a written update for the board meeting in December? Yeah, happy to do that, and I think that um, in the in the early slide uh, we did talk about that we will be coming to the board in December to update on the um, withdrawal management, and so that will be part of our updates. Yeah, I did. I, to be honest with you, Edmund, I didn't really understand the slide very well, it clearly, which is why I'm asking you about it. So I, I thought the emphasis there was on social detox, which is fine. I, I recognize they're attached to each other. Yeah. But, but what I want to make sure I can delineate is somebody who's in need, um, what they do, and, and yes. how we educate the public about that, that 988 and 911 and 311, well, I guess not 311, 988, okay. 211, and, and uh, 911 all have the same information and that our ambulance companies do as well. I, I have to say, I'm not 100% I'm not sure I understand the protocol that they use. I thought the point you just raised about what they're required to do was something I, I having been on ride-alongs, I had, I've seen them ask people where they want to go, so that's interesting too. Well, we'll be we'll definitely provide um, include uh, medical detox as part of our withdrawal management strategy update uh, in December. Thank you, and I I do have many more questions, but I'm gonna let let you go at that, um, and just say thank you to all the staff uh, for the work that was done both 
both in terms of the materials prepared, the work you're doing, and just, you know, I recognize that there's an awful lot of pressure on all of you to perform and appreciate the work you're doing very, very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Smith. I wanted to add uh, one comment is that, um, you know, the only group of individuals who can make the decision to admit someone to an acute care hospital is the medical staff, which boils down to physicians and nurse practitioners and clinical psychologists. So um, there's not going to be a, it requires a judgment call. So there's not going to be an immediate same answer for every patient who calls or shows up in the ER. I just wanted to make sure the board was aware of that. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. No more supervisors' hands raised or members of the public. So we'll consider 26 received with the various direction uh, given by various supervisors. 27 was deleted. 28 was handled on consent. I turn my calendar, my agenda over. I'm on 29, Jess, do you agree? I do. Thank you very much. All right, this one was also held in the October 18th meeting. It was item nine, number 99. We are to receive a report from the Office of the Sheriff related to staffing and recruitment efforts. And I see there's our assistant sheriff, David Sepulveda, I see, and some others wearing their masks. Please go right ahead. Uh, thank you, President Wasserman. Uh, Ken Bender here from the sheriff's office as well. And uh, it's our pleasure to present this to the board today. Um, and uh, just before we get started, just a congratulations and commendation to the board for a, an outstanding selection for the county's next uh, CEO. Uh, Mr. James Williams, we're ex excited about that and um, uh, a big position to fill uh, done quite extraordinarily, uh, extraordinarily by Dr. Uh, Jeff Smith uh, for the past 13 years. And so uh, we appreciate all the work he's done and we'll continue to appreciate the work he does throughout the next uh, rest of this fiscal year. And then we also want to welcome uh, Mr. James Williams. Um, as you mentioned, President, um, this item is a referral from the October 13th uh, Public Safety and Justice Committee. Um, yourself and Chair Ellenberg um, made the referral regarding uh, Sheriff's Office uh, vacancies and how our vacancy rate uh, compares with that of the local law enforcement agencies in our area, um, as well as how our staffing levels have affected um, uh, lower staffing levels of affected operations within the jail facilities. Mm -hmm. um, so we have today um, Captain Christopher Grumbos from our personnel division. Um, he's ready to present a, a brief presentation regarding the vacancy rate and our comparison uh, with uh, local agencies. And Assistant Sheriff David Sepulveda is here as well uh, to answer um, any questions the board might have regarding um, steps we've taken within the jail. And um, Everything is in the ledge file and attached PowerPoint presentation as well. So with that, I'll uh, turn it over to Captain Grumbos. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sheriff Acting, and good afternoon, President Wasserman and the board uh, members. Um, I'm Captain Christopher Grumbos. I oversee the Sheriff's Office Personnel and Recruitment Division. Um, I will be pro providing this report on staffing, recruitment, and retention. Uh, we're going to get the PowerPoint up. Uh, let us know when you see it, please. We see it. Excellent. And uh, as we're getting into this, I just want to acknowledge our background and recruiting team, as well as our HR team who work very hard day in and day out to recruit and hire talented men and women to join our, our team here at the Sheriff's Office. So on this slide, um, we're going to give an overview of the Sheriff's Office. Uh, we have approximately 1,000 132 sworn positions at the rank of deputy. The majority of our sworn positions are at the rank of deputy, correctional deputy, and the officer classification, uh, followed by the sergeant, correctional sergeant classification. And we're going to go ahead and examine the staffing in the Enforcement Bureau first. So as you can see on the slide, the Enforcement Bureau of the Sheriff's Office has 
325 coded enforcement deputy positions. Uh, there are currently 49 vacancies, which equates to about a 15.1% vacancy rate. There's also 82 coded enforcement sergeant positions, and currently we have five vacancies at that rank, which equates to about a 6% vacancy rate. Our present, we're not seeing the change on the um, slide slides. Decks. But the slides are not changing, I assume, oh. to correspond with what you're saying. There we go. Thank you, Supervisor Thank you. Lee. Yep. Can you see it now, uh, President? Yes. Yes. Now we have a slide. Is your slide numbered? Yes. Yeah, we should be on slide, slide number three, three of 11. Yep. Perfect. Sorry about that. No worries. So we surveyed other police departments and local sheriff's offices to determine how our staffing and our vacancy rate compares. The graph here depicts the results. So the numbers on the left uh, of the slide represent the total staffing. The green bar shows the approved staffing for each of the agencies. The numbers on the right represent the overall vacancy rate. And then the gold line depicts the vacancy rate of each agency. So in looking at the vacancy rate of the sheriff's office compared to other police departments within the county, you can see that the vacancy rate of the sheriff's office falls somewhere within the middle of other agencies. We're going to go to slide four. Just want to make sure we're still tracking. Yep, you are. Okay, thank you, sir. This graph is similar to the previous graph, except that it compares the total staffing and vacancy rate between the Santa Clara County Sheriff's Office and other sheriff's offices in the surrounding counties. And as you can see, the, the results are kind of similar. We're going to go to slide five. And now we're going to examine the Custody Bureau staffing data. So there are currently 100, 807. You did not switch. You're still on four. OK, sorry, Supervisor. Trying to work through this. I just want to stay on that. There you go. Nope. Yep. OK. It's just we're going to stay on this and, and sorry if we have extra stuff going around it. Um, so now we're going to examine the custody bureau. There are 807 coded correctional deputy slash officer positions, and there are 142 vacancies, which equates to about a 17.6% vacancy rate. There are also 50 correctional sergeant positions, which there are no vacancy rates for. 26. An investigation of the Custody Bureau staffing compared to other sheriff's offices demonstrated that the Santa Clara County Sheriff's Office has a higher vacancy rate than several other local sheriff's offices. And staff retention has been an issue for the sheriff's office. So over the last three years, the sheriff's office has had a total of 319 sworn staff separations, which does include retirements. There were 114 separations, resignations, or retirements in 2020. There were 106 in 2021. And there were, uh, in 2022, as of October 1st, there have been 99 separations. And this year, we've lost 16 deputies to other agencies. And if I may ask, those are all separations, resignations, and retirements. During that same period of time, how many new individuals did you add? So, um, graduated like, classes, academies. Correct. So, um, ACA 26 graduated October 13th with 13 deputies. Um, and I would have to, I don't have, I don't believe I added that into this presentation. Um, so, I can get you those numbers. Thank you. So, I apologize for not having that, and I should have forced, forecasted that. Thank you. Staff retention definitely has been an issue. Um, so these numbers don't take into consideration other leaves such as military vacation, medical leaves and other leaves that are also fluctuating. And that, that just goes into the day and day of um, operations and staffing. Uh, we're gonna go to slide eight now. We currently average about three custody academies and two enforcement academies per year. 
the number of cadets in each class have ranged between eight and 20, which is significantly smaller than pre-pandemic class sizes. And the recruitment challenges are not isolated to our agency alone. We are constantly struggling to hire staff in an extremely competitive job market. Current posts, currently there are approximately 677 law enforcement agencies in California, and 344 of them are actively trying to recruit qualified law enforcement applicants. This process is further exacerbated by the state required employment standards, the background and the background requirements. Additionally, there are post academy training requirements that do that new deputies must complete before they are fully onboarded into their new career. Recruiting new applicants to become deputy sheriff cadets and sheriff's correctional deputy cadets has proven difficult in recent times. After the hiring freeze was lifted in April of 2021, we began our recruitment process. Unfortunately, our previous pool of applicants have been completely depleted. We have discovered that agencies across the region and the country continue to struggle to hire qualified candidates. Years of a, a shrinking labor pool, resignations, retirements have all had a negative impact on law enforcement professions. A survey by two major law enforcement publications polled over 10,000 officers and found that only approximately 7% would recommend this profession to their children. The salaries, benefits, and incentives package offered by Santa Clara County has proven difficult to recruit staff. Some agencies, such as Santa Clara Police Department and Sunnyfield Department of Public Safety, are actively and personally recruiting deputies collateral to their respective departments with the promise of a higher pay, better work-life balance, and Santa Clara County Depart uh, Police Department is offering an approximate $40,000 a year increase at the officer level. Comparatively, this is more than lieutenants make with our agency. They offer wellness incentives such as working out on duty, classes on mental and physical well being, and they have a robust employee wellness program that is specific to first responders. Our agencies, other agencies in the surrounding area, are offering hiring incentives between $10,000 and $35,000. The California Highway Patrol started a campaign called Hire 1000, where they are recruiting 1,000 CHP officers statewide. Other agencies are providing retiree incentives for staff to prolong the retirement to help with staffing challenges, as well as retaining the institutional knowledge as they onboard new hires. Next slide. The ongoing need to recruit the next generation of sheriff's deputies who are diverse, representative of our community, and have the right mindset to uphold the laws with fairness and impartiality remains a priority for the county and the community we serve. Our background recruiting unit and our HR department have stepped up their efforts to recruit, hire, and onboard new staff. Like many agencies, our agency has to aggressively increase our marketing strategies. Prior to 2020, we relied on our applicant pool to fill academies. Now we are actively attending job fairs, colleges, and university recruitment events, sporting events, Spartan races, and local community events like the NAMI Walk, the National Night Out, and military-based recruitment events to recruit qualified applicants who may not have considered a career in law enforcement. To broaden our brand recognition, we have placed recruiting billboards in Stockton, Sacramento, and San Jose. Starting in November of 2022, the Sheriff's Office will partner with 24 Hour Fitness to run two minute recruitment ads every hour at three of the popular locations in San Jose. We also ran a half page recruitment ad in the Poor app, Police Officers Research Association of America magazine, highlighting our agency. Our recruitment team expanded the recruitment efforts to include recruiting ships, job fairs, and conferences, and law enforcement expos in New York, New Jersey, Philadelphia, Virginia, Connecticut, and Ohio. In addition, the recruitment team has actively recruited in Washington, Oregon, Nevada, Utah, and Arizona. As of October, as of October 17, 2022, 
The Sheriff's Office recruiting team has attended approximately 101 recruiting and community events. Another strategy in trying to hire qualified applicants is to rehire retired officers as extra health deputies to work the courts to help alleviate the need for mandatory overtime. It has been successful with some of our internal deputies, but one obstacle that we've experienced with this recruited strategy is that once the law enforcement officer is retired and no longer working, their post certificate expires after three years. Also, if the retired deputy or law enforcement officer is separated from their agency for more, for more than six months, they're required to complete a full background. In addition to attending a 160 hour requalification course at their cost, um, if their peace officer status has expired. Thank you, excuse me one minute. What is the post certificate? Post certificate is the peace officer certificate that allows that basically uh, in, make somebody a peace officer in the state of California. And it's only good for three years after retirement? That is correct. Thank you very much. Uh, we continue to work closely with DSA and have monthly strike team meetings to come up with ways to recruit countywide. Due to this partnership, we recently instituted a new recruiting campaign to help with the recruiting process called the Bring a Friend campaign. So just real quick on the Friday before the written or the agility test, one of our deputies on the recruiting team calls or texts the applicant to remind them of the date and time of the test. At that time, the deputy encourages the applicant to bring a friend with them to go through the testing process with them. So from June 11, 2022 until October 15, 2022, we've, we've tested approximately 20 additional applicants as a result of the campaign who may never have a ever have applied with us. And we're also working with ESA for online written, te written testing as well. Internally, we've implemented a new background software called ESOF. This software will greatly help with the background investigation process to help us be more efficient and timely in the backgrounds. We also looked at our internal process for ways to streamline and refine our engagement with applicants in order to make the hiring process a more inviting experience. We also continue to work on improving the culture of our office and are working on initiatives to help retain our employees. In September of 2022, the county executive approved a 10% differential for the deputy sheriffs and 11% differential for the sheriff's correctional deputies. This generous differential has enabled the sheriff's office to be more competitive in the salary market, which in turn increases morale and will hopefully increase retention by prolonging the retirement of many deputies. We continue to work with the county executive and ESA in hopes of being able to provide additional hiring and retention incentives. And overall, the law enforcement recruitment is down nationwide and it will continue um, to force agencies, including ours, to be creative in our recruitment efforts. And I'm available for any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for that comprehensive uh, report. I'm certainly a fan of rehiring retired officers, helping out in the courts. Um, they're, they're trained, they're a known entity. You don't do the academy part and it's a perfect way to fill that, that current gap. Supervisor Lee, your hand is up first and Vice President Ellenberg. Sorry, I didn't realize mine was faster, but uh, yeah, give me one second. Sorry about that. No worries, go right ahead. Thank you very much. So thanks very much, uh, 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 Deputy Chief uh, Sepulveda on the very comprehensive report. Uh, in terms of the vacancy, I was just looking at the different um, counties and cities. I noticed uh, that like, for example, Morgan Hill has no vacancy and that um, Merced, I guess, has like less than 1% vacancy, right? Like one vacancy out of one point. So I guess, is there any lesson learned we could get from those other agencies of what they've done well that we can learn from? Officer, you're, you're muted. Sheriffs, thank you. Sorry about that, President. Uh, thank you for the question, Supervisor Lee. Um, we're in constant communication with our, with our partners in law enforcement to try to find out what they're doing and their best uh, practices. 
Um, sometimes it just comes down to a smaller agency that um, it's easier to fill those positions. Um, but, but when you're looking at these agencies, a lot of things come into place. Um, cost of living, what they're paying, um, and in just the, you know, way uh, uh, the commute all plays into these things. Um, so that's just some of, the, some of the reasons why you're seeing those numbers go. Mm -hmm. Because at the same time, the, you know, back on the report in 2022, right, we have 16 of our deputies and correctional uh, deputies that left us to work with another law enforcement agency. Um, and do we have the data as to where they went? Yes, sir. So uh, out of that group, we had uh, we had deputies leave us for Santa Clara PD, mm -hmm. uh, Los Altos, Alameda County DA's office, Roseville PD, uh, El Dorado County Sheriff's office, Sunnyvale Police Department, uh, the Santa Clara County DA's office, and Morgan Hill PD. And, and those and those reasons again, it it has to do with with pay, uh, quality of life, commute. Um, you know, when you're looking at a DA's office, they're going to become investigators, and they they won't be working patrol anymore. Uh, so there's there's a myriad of reasons, and and those are some of the high high level ones. Right, and I'm I'm hoping that through the. Um... Uh, exit interviews, we're able to gather some of the reasons so that we could uh, use that to help improve our system, correct? Yeah, absolutely. I interview every deputy that's willing to sit down for an exit interview, and those are those are the reasons that I'm given. Okay, very good. Um, the report also talks about the Sheriff's Office having implemented a different service model that would help ease some of the current staffing challenges in the courts specifically. Um, can you talk a little bit about what model we're talking about? How does this work with the courts staffing? Thanks for the question, Supervisor Lee. I'm gonna defer that question to Assistant Sheriff or, or Acting Sheriff Ken Bender. Sure, uh, thank you, Captain. Just uh, very briefly, the I really wanna commend our um, DSA union um, on this effort to and the model that we're doing right now with the courts is we're actually uh, bringing in some um, temporarily some security personnel to staff um, lower level metal, uh, metal detector positions um, to free up deputies to work into the courtrooms as well. And it is a um, it's a temporary measure uh, with a one year contract um, while we continue to work on getting our deputy numbers up and we'll do an assessment in about nine months to see where we're at um, and work with the union and the county uh, executive's office who is also instrumental um, in coordinating um, the contract for this in order to get those um, personnel into the courthouse. So, uh, uh, Sheriff Bender, this is the question, uh, this is the stop get measure, the one year contract, because uh, early a couple months ago, I, I heard that uh, some of the courtroom were told to uh, to uh, to potentially have to close down or, or some of the hours, right? This is our way to get around to satisfy that uh, security requirement. Am I correct? Um, this is helping um, the overall staffing crisis. We're not uh, completely there. Um, we're not out of the woods yet, um, but it's uh, it's bridging the gap. And while we um, continue to hire and recruit, there are still some. Uh, courtrooms um, that are working remotely uh, through video conference um, due to the overall staffing levels, but we've been able to improve our uh, opening up, uh, providing security so that more courtrooms could be opened up overall, including North and South County um, courthouses. Great. Um, the other issue is regarding recruitment. Uh, we have discussed earlier regard, well, first, um, uh, thanks for all the different uh, innovative ways to outreach to different populations and uh, civilian communities to try to get them interested to join our uh, uh, sheriff's department. Um, I guess one one extra thing I was going to ask is, uh, since I do know a lot of folks who are trained uh, uh, in the military, I'm, uh, myself included, uh, 
would be certainly good candidates, not not including me, <laughs> to be working for the, the sheriff's department. Uh, I'm wondering whether do we have any type of uh, uh, ads that we place in locations where we have lots of military personnel living, like say in San Diego uh, or Fairfield, where you know we have a, a large military basis in California, for example, that we might be able to uh, get the word out. Well, we we have done recruiting efforts down in San Diego mm -hmm. and at um, various um, mil military career type fairs, mm -hmm. um, and right now. Uh, you know, the military candidate is a, a potentially attractive candidate. We still have um, the education requirements uh, for hiring. And so we, we don't want to compromise on our standard uh, there. And so um, what we're finding is that some of the military personnel um, have the experience and the education and they make uh, great candidates. And some still are working on the education piece. Uh, which is uh, delaying their entry into the potential law enforcement uh, career field as well. But uh, we're also, in terms of advertising and, and high uh, population areas, uh, we've got a large billboard on Highway 5, and we have uh, where there's a lot of traffic uh, close enough uh, for the local residents to still make the commute um, into this county. Um, and we have some other locations as well. And, and just... Uh, while I have the mic for a moment, I really want to emphasize and reiterate and thank the Board of Supervisors uh, for the differential um, to our deputies that you approved earlier this year, because it is making a difference uh, in terms of attracting potential new candidates, and um, we believe it's going to make a difference in helping to retain some of our current can um, staff as well, and, and we are continuing to work with um, the county administration behind the scenes for some other uh, incentives to attract laterals, which is really going to be the key um, to getting our vacancy rate down in a hurry. Right. And when you talk about lateral, it reminded me of the discussion earlier uh, on providing some type of a financial incentive uh, like other agencies have. Uh, when would that report be coming back to us? Uh, we're working with ESA and County Council behind the scenes, and uh, we're getting late in the year. We're hopeful to have it to you this, this year within the next month or two um, so that there can be something before um, the board to consider and vote on. Great. Thank you. I think that would be the fastest way to get somebody on without having to send them through the academy. and They could uh, immediately uh, be incorporated to our uh, shifts and workforce much quicker. Um, last questions I have actually with the County Exec. Uh, it, the report talks about county exec is going to submit a recommendation to address the current security staffing um, issue in the hospital system. Um, so I'm going to ask, uh, I guess, Dr. Smith or, or someone uh, from that side, uh, do we know when the this recommendation will come back to the board? Yeah, let me explain a little bit about that. Um, we currently have uh, PSOs doing security. The PSOs are lay people who um, um, do not have peace officer status, so they have limited capacity to intervene in crimes or potential crimes, and that puts them at risk plus the community at risk because they have limited ability to stop a criminal action. So we've been negotiating with uh, SEIU create a new classification that would be um, a sheriff's security officer, which would give them limited peace officer status and allow them to be um, able to intervene more accurately and also give them better training and supervision from police staff. Um, we envision this as being an opportunity for the current um, incumbents to increase their training, increase their experience, increase their wages. Um, but we do not envision forcing anybody to become a sheriff's peace officer or security officer. And we do not envision, you know, terminating anybody who does not wish to be qualified as a sheriff's uh, security officer. So um, we 
think that we have general agreement from the union. Um, we're still working out some details. There's a lot of concern from a few individuals in the unit. Um, we're trying to alleviate their concerns. And so we'll get the issue to the board as soon as we feel like we have uh, agreement from the union that will be uh, adequate. The um, concerns are a balancing act. Um, as you know, um, the hospital staff, nurses, doctors, um, all the staff have been increasingly concerned about security and we feel that a actual individual with peace officer limited peace officer status would be the best uh, response to that um, need so we're trying to push as far as fast as we can but we can't do it without our labor partners right thank you dr smith on that um, Thank you. And uh, one last thing I was going to ask is, um, we know we have been trying to reduce the uh, population uh, in custody. Um, what have we done internally to realign the efforts to uh, try to connect our goals to reduce the population and the staffing uh, classifications um, to make them realign? Maybe I can start out with that. We're taking a multifactorial approach. Um, currently, we're in the process of doing what's called a stress test with um, a consultant and the appeals court judge, um, where we go through the process of incarceration and release step by step. We have the DA. Um, representative from the courts, the public defender, um, and the county executive's office, in addition to the um, consultant and appeals court judge, justice. Um, and what they're working on is sort of standard state-of-the-art uh, evaluation for um, jails in the community. Um, we know to a great extent what the result will come out to be. Um, the cooperation of the three branches is critical. Um, currently, our time from arrest to adjudication is significantly higher than other similar counties. Um, if we reduce that by just a few days, it reduces the census dramatically by 100, 200 people because um, the time for adjudication has ripple effects on the ability to get people out of jail or to keep them out of jail. Um, so it's going to require cooperation from those three entities to try to move as fast as we can through the adjudication process so that we have um, more like a six month to four month turnaround time rather than nine months. Um, but as is often the case, you know, there are competing priorities. We see it from the county perspective as a very high priority to get people out of jail, to prevent them from going into jail. Um, others um, see it differently and don't have any feeling of needing to rush through the process. Um, so the stress test is the opportunity to try to deal with that. And then in terms of what we've done in the jail to change around the um, acuity system and to change the staffing, I'll go back to um, Sheriff Bender or um, Assistant uh, Sepulveda, whoever wants to take that. Sure. I'll, I'll just uh, jump in very briefly at a very high level overview. Um, and the, the sheriff 
uh, sheriff's office is always um, balancing the concern of uh, public safety uh, with also the need to reduce uh, the population in the jail and um, a, a large um, a large factor in the jail population really has to do with um, court set, court sentencing and the processing of cases and um, and that sort of a thing. So what the sheriff's office is doing internally is we're making sure that we evaluate our programs and maximize um, out of custody programs that are applicable um, based on charges and um, severity of uh, the charges. So we have our uh, EMP program uh, with the ankle monitors and our COSU program um, as well, which we um, are making sure we um, we use as much as possible to uh, assist with the uh, population. And I'll pass it off to Assistant Sheriff Sepulveda if there's um, anything else he thinks it would be good to add. I think you hit, hit it perfectly, sir. Thank you. I have nothing else to add. All right. And my last question is regarding the um, video arraignment positions. Uh, I don't believe they were funded uh, uh, as a part of pilot program. So uh, so when the pilot is complete, does that mean that those positions will go away or we're going to find a way to keep those video arraignment positions? Good afternoon, uh, President Wasserman, Vice President Allenberg and the board. Um, Supervisor Lee, thank you for the question. You, you're correct. We don't have funding for those positions right now. We've had to reallocate staff from other places to fill those positions in. Um, I think what we anticipate is um, because it, it is working well, we anticipate going back to the board at some point and asking for those positions to be funded. However, um, as you know, it, you know, with the difficulty in um, uh, recruiting, um, you know, it's, it's difficult to, to ask for more positions if we have vacancies already in place. Um, so we're going to weigh out those options as, as they come. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. And that's all I have. Thank you. And, uh, and good answer there. I appreciate that. Vice President Ellenberg. Thank you very much, uh, Sheriff Binder and, and Assistant Sheriff Sepulveda for the report. The, the PowerPoint, which was, was very helpful, wasn't provided to us prior to the meeting. So the board and the public were, were seeing this for, for the first time. I'm, I'm sure it won't surprise you to hear my request that information come to us earlier so that there's more time to digest and really um, think about we, we know, of course, that, that understaffing in the sheriff's office has been a, a longstanding issue. I know it, it well predates my time on the board. I believe that most, if not all, of my colleagues have attempted to address this um, in, in some fashion. At, at some point, I think right when I joined the board, there was a staffing study that was supposed to come to FGOC. I'm not entirely sure what happened there. Uh, Supervisor Wasserman and I have heard, you know, recently in in PSJC, the context of the impacts that that understaffing has had on other county departments operations, and I appreciated that your report uh, really fleshed that out. I wanted to bring this specifically to the full board so that we could really unify these conversations um, and and see if any any of our other colleagues had had thoughts on this. Um, I'm also looking to respond to high acuity concerns that my office has received from jails and courts in the hospital system um, who have felt that their safety and, and well-being have been at risk uh, due to the lack of deputies. And looking at the vacancy rate that's that's provided in the report, thank you for that. Um, as we might have uh, suspected, the, the national shortage of of staffing, particularly in law enforcement and corrections, doesn't necessarily fully explain our own um, county shortages. I, I think as, as Supervisor Lee touched on the Sheriff's Office, uh, reported on the second and third slides that we fall about in the middle of law enforcement agencies uh, in terms of vacancy rates, but I see that out of nine in the area, we have the third uh, highest rate. Um, your, your office emphasized Looks like we have some painters. Mike, you're on, you're not on mute. Uh, 
um, further also that, that you know you, your report emphasized the retention issues with with large numbers of deputies leaving every year which of course you know makes me concerned about um, what may be unique about our office our sheriff's office that has rendered it a less appealing uh, place to work uh, I, I again appreciate hearing the extensive efforts that you highlighted in the presentation I'm certainly uh, hopeful that they will be successful and if if we could receive a report back on staffing levels in six months um, to so that you can show us the the impact of these efforts that would be very much uh, appreciated sheriff did that work in about six we would months? be happy to do that um, Thank you. I, I'd also like to see some more information on the operational areas that are the most impacted by the shortages and how we might be tailoring specific solutions for those areas that, that present the greatest safety risk. Um, and wondering if, if you want to speak to that now or, or provide it along with the report back on the hospital system. Um, I think it would be better to do a report back so we can make sure we give you a more thorough answer. Okay. Thanks, Sheriff. And that would be helpful because, you know, um, I, I imagine you may be hearing the same things, but my office has been hearing downstream from impacted of ind individuals how the problems are presenting. And, and I'm concerned that there may be areas beyond the, the courts and the hospital system uh, about which we haven't yet received complaints, but would like to make sure that we are addressing uh, head on. I, I very much appreciate your, your statement about the the need to balance um, always pub public safety with with this um, with keeping our people within our own system safe uh, safe as well. I realize it's absolutely not in your control how quickly uh, people meet move through. Uh, and Dr. Smith, I appreciated your your sharing with the board uh, the stress test, which I uh, have been looking forward to seeing the. The results of that and I think that with a you know a very united and collaborative effort whether through the whole board or PSJC or the alternatives to incarceration work groups we can we can work through this together so again thank you thank you vice president my apologies there was someone at the door and I hit video instead of audio so that's when I said there's the painters <laughs> so uh thank thank you for that um I'll close by saying in my 12 years here, I have never seen an effort such as what is happening now to recruit and retain deputies and, and officers. I think what, what your team is doing, Sheriff Finder, is incredible. The outreach, you talk about going to San Diego, you talk about bringing people back, you talk about incentives for people to stay. You know, we've got 2 million people in this county, bigger than 14 states. You've got 1,300 square miles of, of a county as compared to little San Mateos or Santa Cruz's or, or whatever. Um, and then you've got the very high cost of living to, to live here. So I understand the challenge and I'm glad to see you attacking it head on. And if people choose to live somewhere else, quality of life, commutes, all the reasons that you mentioned, there's nothing we can do about that. But I think what you're offering now and what you're doing now is the best I have ever seen. And I think you're all doing a fabulous job. Um, the economy, there's all kinds of variables out of your control, but you're, you're going after it and I really appreciate it. Thank you, Supervisor. And we can only do it with the support of the board and the county administration and we'll continue um, to work with you on, on thank you i think it's obvious that you have the support of the administration and the board and uh, anything else you can come up with best practices anywhere else stealing anybody else from anywhere else keeping the people we have and uh, bringing back the people that have left those are all good things to, to do all right with that i will turn to supervisor simidian thank you uh mr chair and uh i just wanted to express uh continuing interest slash concern that the department take great care in its hiring efforts involving what I believe was referred to earlier as lateral hires, meaning hiring folks out of other departments. I understand that that's an obvious 
uh, an attractive source for uh, experienced uh, deputies. But I also understand from some of our work over the last 10 years that that is sometimes uh, problematic if the care and rigor in the screening and analysis of who we're hiring isn't uh, pretty robust. Um, you know, in the um, circles I travel in, uh, sometimes folks talk about this as uh, the turkey trot or the dance of the lemons. Uh, meaning that folks who are not performing well in one department or agency or have uh, a history of complaints, which may or may not have been uh, upheld, uh, find that it's easier for them to just move along to another department and somebody else's problem becomes our problem. So um, I just want to say that's an area that I'll be asking our county uh, folks, including the Oakland folks, to be uh, monitoring carefully. Uh, and again, I understand why it can make all the sense in the world to use that process to attract people, but it's also a risky proposition if we don't do our due diligence in a serious way. And I wanted to raise that concern today from day one uh, as uh, we go forward. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Supervisor. And if if it's okay to briefly respond, I just want to say that message uh, received and heard. And in fact, I'm happy to report to the entire board that um, due to the police reform efforts um, initially um, proposed by Supervisor Samadian and supported by the rest of the board uh, over the last two years, um, that uh, lateral hires is um, uh, making sure that any lateral hires we make uh, meet our standards, and that's why we have updated our policies, um, as talked about in previous board meetings, uh, mm -hmm. to ensure that we don't take someone else's problem child, if you will, uh, anyone with use of force complaints or excessive complaints or um, uh, other concerning behaviors. So, uh, like I mentioned, with the uh, regard to the education requirements, we're not going to compromise on our uh, even more importantly, integrity and character standard requirements as well. So uh, message re received, and we will be mindful of that as we continue to make efforts to hire lateral um, transfers as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. And, Chair. Yep, and it's a rare meeting when I don't learn, learn a new term from Supervisor Simidian, so I can now add dance of the lemons. All right, with that, I'm, oops, Supervisor Lee, we have additional. Yes, sir. Just a very uh, uh, last question. Thank you for uh, regarding recruitment. Uh, uh, Sheriff Bender, what type of efforts are we doing to outreach to uh, ethnic minority um, candidates that have language skills and also for uh, women, um, uh, female uh, deputies as well? Yes, thank you. And that, that is part of our um, efforts. Um, to uh, in recruiting and part of what we've done is our uh, recruitment team is very diverse, um, so uh, so that team is focused on um, all segments of society um, within our community uh, to make sure that everyone is um, getting the message that we're hiring, um, getting the support through the application process um, and hiring process um, to make sure that um, everyone has a uh, a chance to come be part of our team because we are a diverse organization um, and we want to continue to hire um, a diverse workforce. So one of the recommendations I have is maybe going to some um, uh, religious organization as well. Like I went to the uh, uh, South Bay Islamic Association, you know, dinner this past weekend. Uh, I think there are many, many uh, occasions like that where we could uh, reach out to different uh, religious groups and different ethnic groups that uh, would bring in the strength of diversity that we're currently lacking, frankly, in our force. And I think that would be a, a huge uh, force multiply in the long run. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. With that, oh, I see two hands raised, the Sheriff's Office and Supervisor Lee. Now it's only the Sheriff's Office. Do you wish to add additional comments? President, yeah, I just wanted to get back to uh, answer your question about how many we've, we've onboarded. Uh, oh, so since you. yes, sir. So uh, since 2019 to present, uh, we onboarded 152 correctional deputies during that time. 
and during that same time, 78 uh, enforcement deputies. Super, thank you. I appreciate that uh, quick response. Thank you very much. All right, with that, I'm gonna try and get us to move on. No motion necessary on this one, which was 29. Item 30, and Jess, please stick with me on this one. We were holding the taser portion of item 30 to February of 2023. And we are hearing the rest of item 30 on November 15th, 2022. Supervisor Simidian, go right ahead, please. You're muted, sir. But I know it's something, go right ahead. Thank you. I, uh, I just wanted to say, just to clarify, Mr. Chair, and I think the clerk will uh, verify this, the motion actually was to uh, hold off on tasers until February at the earliest. Uh, February at the earliest, got it. We'll have a new sheriff. Got it. And uh, the new sheriff will make his own judgments about how he wants to proceed uh, and yep. when he wants to proceed. And yes. you know, if the new sheriff says uh, February, so be it. Uh, he can come make the case. If the new sheriff says March or April, that would be permitted under the motion. What okay. I was trying to do was make sure that the piece on uh, body cams uh, was not unnecessarily delayed. If staff wants to bring it back uh, just as body cams uh, for uh, action at November 15th, fine. That was authorized by the motion. If they said we want to wait, uh, that again wouldn't wouldn't trouble me, but I didn't want to unnecessarily delay that. And that's why I was trying to separate out the tasers uh, from the body camps. And the last thing, uh, Supervisor Wasserman, is I, I know that the department um, thought that there was a certain administrative convenience to hearing these items together, given the fact that a contract was up. But what I want to say to the folks in the department is um, administrative convenience can't trump accountability. And, um, you know, I was sitting here saying, if there's a problem six months from now, how do we hold the new sheriff accountable when the new sheriff's going to say correctly, that wasn't my decision, that wasn't my proposal, that was a decision that was made before I got here, and uh, if anybody has to own it, supervisors, it's you. So okay. I want to make sure that uh, whatever assurances we need, if we are going to move in this direction, and I genuinely have not come to any conclusion, uh, but I, I want to make sure that we have assurances from the new sheriff, clarity about a policy that will be in place before the purchases, uh, greater understanding of whether or not there are some surveillance ordinance implications, which I believe there may be. Uh, and most importantly, I want to be able to know that we can hold the new sheriff accountable for whatever uh, decisions are made uh, based on their proposal. Thank you. Thank you. No trumping. I got that. Sheriff Binder, additional comments? No. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes just makes uh, it makes perfect sense, and we really appreciate um, Supervisor Simidian's comments uh, just now. And uh, so we'll work with uh, procurement. Um, if uh, the board doesn't have a preference uh, to potentially keep the item as a package um, at the earliest in February, and simply because uh, there are financial ramifications. Uh, uh, for bundling it together, um, and certainly the effort um, to meet now is um, is it, there's no attempt to skirt uh, accountability. Uh, but um, the supervisor is correct that the new sheriff needs to stand before uh, the entire board uh, to be accountable and to um, uh, to have buy-in on the policy. And so um, I just wanted uh, the board to understand um, some of that. Uh, financial portion uh, behind. So, Sheriff Finder, yeah. before I go to Supervisor Submitting, you're saying you're okay with the whole package being moved to February at the earliest? Sir, is that what you said? Mr. Chairman, while uh, Sheriff Binder is uh, waiting or thinking this through, we have made a motion and passed it. And uh, that's a judgment that I don't think we have to press the department on today, if I may say so, through the chair. Okay. I, would, I would just add, if I may, um, that if the sheriff's department makes the judgment that they would like to bring a package back again that combines the two items, 
<laughs> I would strongly encourage them to give an option to the board that involves only the body worn cameras and the tasers separately as well, because I don't want to be sitting in a meeting and being told, well, no, they're all still bundled together. And if you don't act on this, we can't move forward with the body cams. Uh, that I would consider being jammed by the department and I would not um, want to be in that position. I have felt <laughs> candidly like that's uh, an experience we've had in the past and I'm hoping we don't have it in the future. And I'm optimistic about that, so thank you. Thank you. So for the record, currently what was voted on this morning is to hold the tasers to February of 2023 at the earliest and to hear the rest November 15th, 22. That's how things stand as now, correct, Supervisor Smidian? That is correct. And if the thank department you. said in November uh, 15th, thank you, but we'd like to delay that for a bit, yes. I would not have any objection at that time, just to be Un clear. Understood. Thank you. All right. So we just got through item 30 again. We now move on to item 31 under advisor from the October 1822 meeting, which was item number 11. We're now going to receive the report from the Office of the Sheriff relating to implementation of the recommendation set forth in the October 22nd Office of Correction and Law Enforcement Monitoring final report on the Andrew Hogan incident while in custody on August 25th. And before I turn this over to our acting sheriff, Jess, will you please confirm this is the final item for today? That is what I have. Thank you very much. Sheriff. Thank you, President. Um, just very briefly um, on this item, um, thank you to um, the board and to OIR uh, for looking into this matter. Um, the current command staff and our rank and file, um, as painful as it was uh, and difficult to see the item um, at the last board meeting, we all understand that it was necessary. Um, we wanted to see it um, come out. Um, so that uh, some the decisions uh, that were made by those uh, back in 2018 are uh, going to be called to account for. Um, I would like uh, the board to hear the message that um, uh, we received the port report. Um, we agree with o um, Oakland's recommendations. Uh, we have been working really hard over the last couple of weeks, and I really want to commend um, our custody bureau staff, um, Assistant Sheriff Sepulveda, Captain Duran, um, who worked at lightning speed um, to get all of the updates that you see in the ledge file um, before you. So um, we've implemented, uh, worked really hard to implement the recommendations, and we will continue to be open moving forward. And really, we are hoping to turn a corner and to start rebuilding um, trust and confidence with our board, with our public, and even with our internal staff. Thank you. And the item does read, receive report from the Office of the Sheriff, which is what that just was. We don't have any of the members of the public wishing to speak, and there is no action required here. Supervisor Lee. Well, first of all, thank you so much for this report. I'm happy to see that the implementation of Oakland's recommendation have been adopted. So um, quickly after our last uh, board supervisor meeting, and I did have a couple of follow up questions. Um, as far as the number of these self help harm incidents during transport, how often do they occur, say, on a monthly basis? And I'll pass it out to Assistant Sheriff Sepulveda. Thank you, Supervisor Lee, for the question. So we went back and took a look at our reports regarding um, transports, and we actually haven't had any since this event um, that, that triggered these changes. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is whenever a person is um, giving any indication that they might be self-harming, if we're going to transport, we use one of our options that's in our policy, which is to transport via ambulance so that they're safely Restraint and there's medical personnel available in the ambulance along with our deputy to transport the person um, to the psychiatric unit at the uh, main jail. So um, we've been using that practice consistently, and therefore we ha haven't had any uh, any more self-harm events during transport. Well, that's certainly positive news to uh, report. Thank you. 
Uh, and uh, the other thing is regarding these transports, um, have there been any uh, efforts to put together or obtaining a centralized database to track these transports instead of just a little piece of paper here and there? Yes, Supervisor Lee, um, part of our IFR DNA tracking system will track our transports. Mm -hmm. uh, we will work with the vendor to um, see if we can add a component to um, add information about that transport. In the interim, um, um, as it was, was submitted with this report, um, we created a form that we're going to be using in the interim, but we're going to be working with the vendor to see if we can capture that same data on the electronic system. Um, with that, also, our uh, future JMS system will provide the ability to track that kind of information as well. Right, so the, the automated system will be far more uh, better accountability, and in case you need to pull, you know, for reports purposes, it will be far easier than yes, the sir. So I think that would be great. All right, and that's all the questions I have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Supervisor Smidian? Thank you. Uh, could I ask, is uh, our Oakland representative uh, with us? Either yes, he is. Uh, Mr. Janako or somebody? There we are. Thank you. Yep. Mr. Janako, um, presumably you uh, think the report is good news. I don't want to put words in your mouth, so I'm going to ask you. Um, Supervisor Smidian, I don't think the report is good news. I think the report is great news. Yep. All right. And, and then uh, my next question is, how do we make sure that the reforms that have been agreed to uh, remain in place and that they don't disappear three months, six months, or a year from now? I really think, Supervisor Smitty, and through the chair, that um, um, there's a number of ways. One is, um, obviously, it's on the sheriffs uh, to implement, um, to ensure that there's enforcement of the policies and expectations that are set out in writing. But it's also our responsibility. So I would, you know, think that Oakland would be going back six months and a year and checking in and taking a look at those transport logs to see what, what's there and seeing whether or not they're being recorded. Um, take a look at any closed investigations to see if they are uh, based in fact or, re or based on rational reasons. And so that is something we'll, we will certainly have our antennas up for. Uh, Mr. Janako, does that, does that mean that, uh, you think it might be helpful if we gave formal direction for OCLEM to report back on the status of these reforms, uh, both six months and 12 months from now? I don't think that could hurt. It would uh, help me make sure I, I keep that on the uh, on the front burner. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, let me ask uh, Sheriff Bender, uh, Acting Sheriff Bender, Under Sheriff Bender, whichever title we're using today. Thank you for uh, 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 sharing all this with us, uh, Mr. Bender, and um, any reason that that would be problematic from your standpoint? None at all, Supervisor. We're um, happy to be transparent and accountable. All right. Well, then I am uh, prepared uh, to uh, offer a formal motion yep. that we receive the report, uh, but that we ask OCLAM to uh, direct OCLAM to report back to our board six months and 12 months hence with a uh, an update slash status report on the uh, continued um, use of these protocols and adherence to them uh, in operations. I think that's a little jumbled, but clear. It's clear. Uh, Supervisor uh, Simidian, I'm, I'm through the chair. Uh, happy to second with the question when you're finished. I am finished. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Vice President Ellenberg. Thank you. Um, I, I was thinking of a motion that, that was a little bit stronger um, and more prescriptive. Um, I'm just going to run it by, happy to talk it through for a moment, and then, and then go in either direction. Uh, I was actually pretty concerned that the recommended uh, and proposed process for terminating an internal affairs investigation didn't provide um, any kind of external check or balance um, on the uh, on the integrity of the justification that's reported by uh, the investigator. Um, if it's only reviewed by the sheriff, that's that kind of takes us, unfortunately, to exactly where we were uh, with the Hogan case. So what I had been thinking of was, in addition to the process outlined under recommendation number five, 
uh, that the policy that the policy be drafted to require uh, at least for the first couple of years to require that OCLAM approve the findings or termination of all internal investigations before they are closed. So interested to hear if, if you'd like to take it further or why you might want to stay where you are now and happy yeah. also to hear from Michael. I, I am before uh, I see that uh, both the uh, the acting sheriff and uh, our county council want to weigh in uh, through the chair. I am uh, I am sympathetic to the desire you've just articulated to have a more um, robust and rigorous uh, set of procedures in place in terms of ensuring the legitimacy of any um, uh, abandonment on an IA matter. Uh, I'm guessing that we'll hear some concerns from the undersheriff, perhaps not. Uh, and uh, I am, don't know what Mr. Williams will say. So why don't I stop talking and hear what they have to say? All right, let's go to Mr. Williams first and we'll come to the sheriff. There, there are some um, significant state law challenges associated with these processes. And uh, as part of the items that the board requested at the last meeting related to this, we are preparing some memoranda uh, outlining some of that. So the board will receive some further information, but there are some constraints on how um, IA process and other peace officer discipline processes operate because of state law uh, and that that makes um, this type of approach um, just a little more uh, challenging and um, and so my recommendation is that the board wait for that analysis before proceeding uh, in that vein. Through, through the chair if I may Mr. Williams and um, uh, through the chair uh, any reason that I could not um, with the consent of the seconder, uh, add, however, a further direction to uh, our OCLAM folks that they should uh, negotiate to the greatest degree possible information sharing, which will allow them to assess the validity uh, or the soundness of any decision to terminate, uh, understanding that that's a direction to negotiate rather than uh, at this time. And then let's see what we get with the new sheriff, whoever he may be. Yes, that would be totally fine. Uh, then, then with the consent of the seconder, I'm happy to incorporate that. And again, we haven't heard from uh, the acting sheriff, under sheriff yet, but I, I do think um, I'm glad, Supervisor Ellenberg, that you, uh, one more thing to me uh, and, uh, and remind me, because I think, I think your point is spot on, which is uh, we don't want to have the the same circumstance arise yet again because there isn't some transparency about the basis for a decision of such consequence. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Submitting. I, I and James, I appreciate the the complexity, and I'm I'm happy to um, uh, limit direction right now to Supervisor Submitting's revised motion. Thank you, Sheriff Binder. Uh, thank you, uh, President. I just wanted to remind the board that. Um, uh, Oakland, um, for our current information sharing agreement, is getting access to our internal affairs cases. So they're going to know if there's a case um, that was started and then closed. And they're um, currently, without any new motions, um, are going to have the ability to weigh in in their annual report uh, whether they agreed with the language uh, and um, reasoning for any, any um any terminated or uh, prematurely terminated investigation. So I want the board to rest assured that that's already currently in place. And then I also just wanted to briefly touch on the just the checks and balances of uh, and the purpose. We appreciate um, Oakland um, as a check and balance and transparency and a, and a third person uh, point of view um, to, to weigh into the board. And then the sheriff's command, uh, the newly elected sheriff, when that happens, and the command uh, command staff's role in actually managing the department. So, in terms of asking for uh, permission uh, from Oakland, Oakland, I don't think that would be appropriate. But it would be appropriate for them to review 
um, the sheriff's decision and reasoning and then weigh in objectively on what they think about it. So that's um, uh, the only thing I wanted to add to the discussion. Thank you. Supervisor Smitty, in your hand. Just to say that uh, I think I'll leave the language in the motion, even if it turns out to be duplicative so that it's of record. And I wanted to explain that so folks in the Sheriff's Department understood uh, why I was leaving it there. And I think that gives Mr. Janako direction in the unlikely, we hope, and unfortunate for sure event that there's some change in the information sharing agreement uh, that currently exists, okay? Thank you. We have a motion. We have a second. Vice President Ellenberg, your hand is still raised. Now it's down. Supervisor Smitty, yours is down. No members of the public. Jess, hit it. Supervisor Lee? Aye. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Smitian? Aye. Vice President Ellenberg? Yes. President Wasserman? Aye. Thank you. Fellow board members, that brings us to item 33. There were no items that were removed that we haven't already handled, bringing us to item 34, which is adjournment. I don't see any objection to that. I'm certainly in favor. Meeting adjourned. See you. See you uh, when are we going to see each other next? November 15th. Just Thank you. November 15th. Mr. President, just a quick note, uh, public uh, service announcement. Uh, I just want to remind everybody to check the mailbox that the ballot should have been received and make sure they do return it before next Tuesday, November the 8th. I voted already. All right, everybody. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a good evening. Recording stopped. This meeting has now ended.